Lord of the Mysteries 2, Audiobook, Part 24 Chapter 576, Palace Having transformed into Simon through a Seer Pathways sealed artifact, Lado Giaro observed the illusory starlight surrounding them, akin to seawater caught in a vortex. It cascaded down, forming a massive funnel. The origin of this vortex was the humanoid sealed artifact they had abducted from the Eternal Blazing Sun Church. After the exposure of the curly haired baboon's research society's internal affairs and the consecutive deaths of Loki and I Know Someone, one resurrected at the cost of a precious opportunity, while the other met a permanent end. They adjusted their initial sea sacrifice plan and activated a backup strategy to counter potential interference from the research society. According to the revived Loki's warning, Hela, the society's vice president, had likely ascended to Sequence 4, reaching demigod status, and switched from the Death Pathway to the Evernight Pathway. Depending solely on Ultraman, Bard, and Mad Lady, their intricate plans would crumble before absolute strength. Of course, they were confident if it were just Hela alone. Confidence wavered when considering President Gandalf, an enigma, and the other vice presidents, alongside the troublesome society members. Dealing with them now seemed an insurmountable challenge. Starlight surged, revealing a sorrowful woman in black nun's attire to everyone on the ship. Her presence felt magnetic, as if attempting to absorb everything around her. It was akin to an unusually heavy iron ball falling from the center of a taut fishing net, dragging objects down and pulling the surrounding net with it. In these circumstances, previously still items naturally slipped away. The most impacted was Juan Oro, with a potent sea bloodline and formidable sea power. Resisting the sea's fury, he felt a spatial inversion, as if his front and back had switched to up and down. Like a lost person above an abyss, he involuntarily fell to the bottom at an accelerated speed, where the woman in black nun's attire awaited. The deputy hosts, apart from Lumian, felt an unseen force tugging at them. Struggling, they staggered towards the humanoid-sealed artifact. The sea's power within them wavered, propelling them to the surface, revealing sparkling starry scales that hinted at losing control. The maidens of the sea and the sailors on the ship struggled against the terrifying suction force, swaying on the spot. Some experienced their skin smoothing, others felt scales emerging in their flesh, and a few shifted their feet intermittently. Lumian, though relatively unscathed, exerted considerable strength to resist the relentless pull. As an ascetic, he vaguely sensed the river of fate for everyone present surging toward the humanoid-sealed artifact. Future tributaries narrowed and converged, leading inevitably to one possibility, death. In that moment, Lumian grasped why the humanoid-sealed artifact could use words to curse someone to death. Lado Giaro reached out, gripping the shipboard to resist the invisible pull from the woman. His gaze scanned the people on the ship, then returned to the sea's depths. The ship descended, surrounded by a translucent wall of azure seawater. Sea creatures swam within, seemingly oblivious to the anomaly. In the distance, the spindle-shaped silver-gray object at the sea bottom, its tip embedded in rocks, came into view. Lado Giaro suppressed any sign of a smile. He was nearing his destination. The fools from the Fisheries Guild and the oblivious Earth Mother Church might never comprehend what lay sealed at the bottom of the sea here. It wasn't a so-called palace but a spaceship a spacecraft that infiltrated during the fourth epoch. It boasted a sci-fi dimension, housing advanced technology entwined with mystical beyonder elements, forming the core of the entire spaceship. A locator, a petri dish, a breeding box, a key component of a stargate, a place where a beyonder object slumbered. The Ring of the Sea Queen, crafted by the sea spawn, served as the spacecraft's key. Only when the external seal weakened annually could it activate the spacecraft's internal power, merging the two to crack the core seal. Lado Giaro's gaze grew greedier as he stared at the faintly discernible silver-gray behemoth. His aim extended beyond temporary authority, to become the true governor of the sea and the spaceship's owner. This would grant him immense power and the ability to accomplish unimaginable feats using the spaceship. The Azure Sea tinged with a hint of green, encircled the ship as if respectfully escorting them into the palace of the sea. 
seeing the sea's fury interrupted by the woman's sudden appearance, making her the most perilous element, Juan Oro wasted no time deepening his connection with the sea. At that moment, he temporarily became the governor of the sea. He resisted the terrifying suction force. Abruptly, the humanoid sealed artifact departed from the ship, entering in empty darkness. Resplendent stars flickered above, below, and to her left. Ahead stood Juan Oro, covered in starlight scales, deep eyed, and with completely white hair. Juan Oro raised his right hand, swiping his finger. The stars plummeted with fiery tails, stirring up waves. On the betrothal ship, everyone lost the momentum to rush to the same place. However, the power they used to resist the pull couldn't be withdrawn, causing them to fall in the opposite direction. Lado Giaro feigned a similar state, crashing into the bow of the ship. Seeing the silver-gray behemoth approaching, his heart leaped with joy. He was about to recite a phrase he didn't comprehend but understood its purpose. It was a coded order to completely open the spaceship's door and establish an energy passageway, allowing him to enter under protection. April Fools had been established for several years. Lado Giaro's decision to target the sea prayer ritual last year was influenced by the resolution of other voices from the Governor of the Sea, Maidens of the Sea, and certain sea spawn. This allowed them to understand the significance of the three crucial passages. I espouse thee, O sea, was one of the passages, its true meaning being to inject energy into the created key and enter a password. Lado Giaro was about to recite the second paragraph, which served as an order to initiate the spaceship. Initially, he and Bard planned to deceive the foolish Nolfi, tricking her into reciting the words to avoid danger. Once the spaceship activated and left these waters, the sea prayer ritual would naturally conclude. There wouldn't be any follow-up. Whether it involved self-destruction or not, it wasn't a concern for her, she had achieved her essential goal. However, the situation changed drastically, especially when the curly-haired baboons research society learned about the sea prayer ritual. Ultraman and Bard modified their plans, roping in external aid and reducing Nolfi's role. Eventually, she became bait to lead troublemakers, represented by Lumian Lee and Hidden Blade. Lado Giaro opened his mouth and muttered the words. As he finished speaking, he looked expectantly at the spaceship at the sea bottom. But nothing happened. How is this possible? Lado Giaro's heart tightened, feeling a sudden sense of danger. With a jolt, he saw everything disintegrate like a soap bubble, vanishing. Lumian, transformed into Brian, had arrived near him at some point. A dream. He had been dreaming since Juan Oro pulled the humanoid sealed artifact into the cosmic void. Hila. This name flashed through Lado Giaro's mind. He had paid attention to whether there were other ships lurking around. As these thoughts raced through his mind, formless hands appeared around Lado Giaro, pushing Lumian away. Then, he saw a sailboat, clearly abandoned by time, outlined in the cavity surrounded by seawater beside the betrothal ship. Shadows clung to its canvas, and corpses stood on the observatory. The deck was littered with decaying or boneless undead creatures. At the bow of the ship, a woman dressed as a black widow stood silently. Hila. Less than four hours ago, Franca, posing as Charname, signaled Nolfi and Batna to wait for further arrangements. Returning to the cabin, she entered the captain's cabin and addressed Hila, standing by the window. I've roughly guessed who Ultraman is, but I can't be sure. I guessed as much, Hila replied, having overheard Franca and Nolfi's conversation. Franca gritted her teeth and said, if it's really Lado Giaro, there will definitely be variables on the ship. I have to quickly summon Lumian's messenger and inform him of our guess. Let's wait a little longer and time it well. We'll send the message when the deputy hosts leave the governor of the sea's residence but prior to boarding the ship, Hila advised. Franca confirmed succinctly, got it. She observed Hila, with her light blonde hair naturally cascading over her shoulders, and her dark eyes seemingly darker as she meticulously engraved patterns and arranged items on the captain's cabin desk. With curiosity, she promptly inquired, what's this for? setting up a ritual to completely conceal the entire ship, preventing anyone from discovering it. 
It's impossible for me to do this on my own. I can only achieve it through a deity's help. And she should be very willing to help. Without hesitation, Hila took off the pure silver ring embedded with a black diamond from her right hand and placed it in the center of the altar. On the betrothal ship, Lumian scrutinized Lado Gyaro, his body quivering with excitement. He couldn't comprehend how the other party had thwarted the sea prayer ritual once again. After all, he had been vigilantly observing this old friend of his and hadn't witnessed any ring switching. Nonetheless, it didn't matter. A well-devised plan was not a fragile creation that crumbled with the slightest mistake. It had to allow for enough margin for error. Similarly, Lado Gyaro couldn't fathom how Hila and the ship had approached without triggering his detection. But it didn't matter. If they hadn't prepared for the interference of the curly-haired baboons research society and Hila, they wouldn't have taken action this time. Lado Gyaro's eyes suddenly darkened, and specks of starlight illuminated. The surrounding azure seawater froze once more. Here, he surpassed the old-timer, Juan Oro. He had long amassed the power to temporarily become the governor of the sea. In the upcoming period, he would ascend to become the god of these waters. Chapter 577 Same Thoughts On the flower ship, Lado Gyaro extended his arms, and sunlight erupted from his body. The sky dimmed, and the sea approached nothingness. Illusory stars emerged among them, expanding like distant suns. In the next moment, Lado Gyaro swiftly spoke a few words in ancient Hermes with a grave expression, God says entering dreams is ineffective. With the reinforcement of the sea's power, he neared the status of a Sequence IV demigod. This allowed him to employ the notary's God says ability more precisely, diminishing Hela's capacity to compel people into entering dreams. Without this intervention, if Hela used her ability to forcefully restrain him without guiding him into an easily interruptible dream to gather information, breaking free from such a demigod's dream would prove challenging in a short time. He would become like a feral dog under anesthesia, at Lumian Lee's mercy. The choice of entering dreams is ineffective over sleeping is ineffective was deliberate. The former was more specific and avoided potential ambiguity related to various abilities. Additionally, the Evernight Pathways induced slumber originated from being forcefully drawn into a dream, not the other way around. Essentially, it was a dream, not sleep. As Lado Gyaro pronounced the ancient Hermes phrase entering dreams is ineffective, his body still felt as weighty as the humanoid sealed artifact, though not as exaggerated. This stirred massive waves in the surrounding seawater, attempting to fill the void. The sailboat manipulated by the undead creatures visibly swayed, nearly capsizing, severely impeding Hela's further movements. Immediately after, Lado Gyaro reclined even further. A miniature, bright sun manifested in his eyes. Simultaneously, the ethereal sky and the stars emerging from the sea emitted light of varying intensities. They interweaved crafting a splendid and pure blazing pillar of light. The majestic pillar of light descended, enveloping the front half of the sailboat, where Hela stood. It melted the undead creatures there as if they had evaporated, leaving no trace of darkness. Hela became engulfed by the pillar of light. This was the light of holiness, an ability of a sequence five, priest of the light of the sun pathway. Despite not consuming a corresponding sequence for potion and lacking demigod-level abilities after becoming the temporary governor of the sea, Lado Gyaro could elevate his acquired abilities to near sequence four. Moreover, the light of holiness had undergone a mutation. It no longer emanated from a single sun. All the stars in the cosmic void contributed to its power. Coupled with the uniqueness of these waters, while not as potent as the sequence four flaring sun of this pathway in purifying and destroying impure entities, its attack range and area of influence had significantly expanded. Having transmigrated into a child of the sea and possessing substantial boons, Lado Gyaro had carefully considered the sun pathway potion, believing it posed no risks and might integrate with his bloodline and original abilities, bringing about remarkable changes. The outcome aligned with his expectations. Suddenly, Lado Gyaro pivoted. In the space behind him, Lumian's figure swiftly materialized. 
he intended to exploit Lado Giaro's engagement with Gila to teleport closer, followed by a spell of harumph. Gone from his eyes was any suppressed violence or madness. There was no fear whatsoever, as if he didn't concern himself with the consequences of failing to assail the governor of the sea at close range. In Lado Giaro's dark and profound eyes, resplendent stars reflected. Before Lumian could utter the harumph, he plunged into the void, disappearing beneath the vast and distant cosmos. Lado Giaro withdrew his gaze and focused on the sailboat illuminated by the residual light. He found an adversary like Lumian Lee repulsive. It wasn't that he couldn't be forcibly eliminated, but doing so might only exacerbate matters. He could potentially incur the indiscriminate wrath of a high-ranking individual. His decision was to leverage the authority of the governor of the sea to banish his foe into a self-created cosmic void, leaving him disoriented and unable to find an exit for the time being. Once he assumed control of the spaceship and became the true governor of the sea, he planned to return and calmly resolve the issue. At that precise moment, Juan Oro, entangled in a battle with the humanoid sealed artifact in his cosmic void, suddenly detected an anomaly. His strength rapidly waned, and his dominion over the sea gradually diminished. It seemed like his temporary authority as governor of the sea was being usurped. In the blink of an eye, the tidal wave capable of shattering ships vanished from the cosmic void, followed by the illusory cosmos itself. Juan Oro reappeared on the ship once more and saw the azure sea around him, towering like a mountain peak. He saw Simon Giaro, closely linked to the sea. It's you! His roar coincided with an involuntary bend, as if an invisible force pressed him down to the floor. The humanoid sealed artifact had also returned, reinstating a formidable weight. Lado Giaro gazed at her, his face covered in scales tinged with starlight. Then, he pointed at Gila's ship and spoke in a fluent language, yen percent dot and asterisk he didn't comprehend the exact meaning of the sentence, but he understood that it could prompt the other party to attack a designated target. Although he harbored no fear of Gila in these waters, he remained vigilant of Gandalf and others who might be on the ship. Therefore, he had to give his utmost effort. The humanoid sealed artifact's sorrow dissipated slightly, and it nodded blankly. Her body pivoted towards the sailboat, which bobbed in the underwater waves. In an instant, Lado Giaro bent down and grasped his throat. Wah! He ejected a slender, sticky blob of flesh. The flesh contorted and writhed, swiftly taking on a human form. Lado Giaro promptly straightened up and seized the moment to command, Mad Lady, open the passageway to the spaceship. He wasn't concerned that Mad Lady might usurp the position of the governor of the sea and become the owner of the spaceship because she lacked the sea bloodline. In the cosmic void crafted by Lado Giaro, Lumian showed no urgency to find an exit or ascertain his coordinates. He simply teleported out. He clasped his throat. Wah! He ejected a slender, sticky blob of flesh. The flesh contorted and writhed, swiftly taking on a human form. Solemn Motel, adjacent to Lumian's suite. Recalling that invisibility and shadow concealment were futile against marionettists, Jenna pondered ways to locate Loki's true form. Drawing on information from the major arcana card holders, she knew a marionettist had to be within five meters of a target to transform individuals into marionettes. In other words, Loki was undoubtedly within a five meter radius of Lugano. Damn it, it's all walls. My sight is blocked. Otherwise, spotting Loki would be easier. At this hour, most guests are away, celebrating the sea prayer ritual. Walls. If there are no walls. An idea struck Jenna. She glanced at Anthony and blurted out, Did you bring enough money? What money? In a rare instance, Anthony couldn't decipher Jenna's true thoughts. Only then did Jenna realize her words had been too abrupt money to compensate the motel owner. I plan to blow up the opposite side, diagonally opposite, in the rooms below. We confirm they're empty. If anyone's there, it's Loki or his marionette. I'll place the detonators here. They affect rooms within a seven-meter radius. Lugano will likely be injured, but with the lady as a shield and being a doctor, he can handle it. 
Right, the explosion will attract the Fertility Order's combat nuns. Jenna's train of thought gradually flowed smoothly as she spoke. Are you a hunter or a demoness? Have you been influenced by Lumian? Anthony mused inwardly. Do it. Time is running out. Lumian will cover the compensation, he's loaded. Jenna hurriedly searched her backpack for detonators. Simultaneously, she noticed Anthony setting up a simple altar. Her heart stirred as she asked, Do you wish to contact Madam Justice, Madam Judgment, or Madam Magician? Either one works, Anthony said seriously as he prepared for the ritual. Although Madam Magician won't appear until the end to prevent Loki and his backer from noticing, she mentioned that at least two major arcana cards will arrive early and provide assistance at critical moments. Got it. Jenna had been uncertain about when to reach out for help and inform their major arcana cardholders, so she had been contemplating handling it herself. Given Anthony's readiness to risk the disapproval of the major arcana cardholders, Jenna was naturally inclined to opt for the safest choice. As Jenna stacked the detonators and other explosives near the adjacent door, Anthony Reed erected a spiritual barrier and summoned Madam Magician's messenger, briefing her on Loki's appearance. Then, he swiftly took cover in the bathroom attached to the master bedroom, about six to seven meters away from the impending explosion. Boom! A fierce explosion tore through the fifth floor of Sauron Motel. Glass shattered, debris scattered, and crimson flames engulfed the surroundings. Chapter 578, Marionettes Amidst the thunderous explosion, the partition separating the two suites and the one facing the corridor crumbled simultaneously, wreaking havoc on nearby furniture, the ceiling above, the floor beneath their feet, and the rooms opposite, swiftly enveloping them in a surging inferno. Jenna hadn't utilized all the explosives, otherwise, the entire fifth and fourth floors of Salo Motel would have collapsed in unison. Nevertheless, a section of the roof gave way, and the floor was strewn in chaos. The epicenter of the blast unveiled the room below. As the walls of the adjacent rooms succumbed to the onslaught, the bricks and wood propelled by the shockwave slammed into Georgia, causing her back to buckle and her head to split open, unleashing a flow of vivid red blood. Lugano snapped out of his intermittent thoughts and bodily stiffness, regaining his composure. Subsequently, he experienced searing pain as the violent shockwave, mixed with flames and debris, hurled him through the air. Had it not been for Georgia shielding him and with his robust planter's physique, he likely would have faced severe injuries, teetering on the brink of death. Limbs could have been severed, or vital points struck. Despite this, he ended up a battered mess, with a few bones broken, nearly succumbing to unconsciousness. Ludwig had sought refuge under the dining table at some point, along with his food. With the advantage of distance and the makeshift shield, he only bore the impact of the collapsed table. Simultaneously, Jenna and Anthony burst out of the master bedroom washroom in their suite, their gazes fixed on the adjacent rooms where walls had crumbled, filling the air with swirling dust. They vaguely discerned a figure. The figure, bearing a striking resemblance to Rubio Paco, stood beside the upturned recliner. Loki! Jenna wasted no time. She condensed a dark, illusory flame and sent it hurtling towards her target. Behind her, Anthony Reed's eyes took on a golden tint, pupils dilating. He was poised to lock onto Loki, ready to unleash frenzy, a technique that would plunge Loki into an emotionally and psychologically triggered state rendering him incapable of rational thought and effective response. Just as Anthony and Jenna prepared to strike, their vision darkened, and Loki vanished. They found themselves in a void, no blue sky or white clouds above, no solid ground below, just darkness embellished with a myriad of stars. Cosmic Void This semi-real, semi-false illusion was a creation achievable by a child of the sea at a certain level. In the void, Jenna and Anthony beheld a widowed woman in a black bonnet with subtle wrinkles in front of them. Martha! The Paco family's matriarch, now a marionette under Loki's control, was hidden in the room where Loki manipulated the spirit body threads. With sufficient preparation time, how could Loki not perform with his marionettes? He had two puppets with beyonder powers, and this was one of them. 
Another remained concealed, with the last slot reserved for specific situations, adaptable at will. It could be switched once an enemy was under control. When Loki posed as Ruby Opaco, bringing Madame Martha to meet the governor of the sea, the family's matriarch was already a marionette. Thus, he had to ensure she stayed within his control range. Lugano discerned Madame Martha's severe injuries primarily because a marionette was essentially comparable to a lifeless entity. A marionettist's manipulation of her spirit body threads allowed her to execute various actions, mimicking living characteristics. To a Sequence 8 doctor, this appeared as grave injuries. Had Lumian not infrequently observed others' luck without forming a habit, he would have realized that Madame Martha's fate was off. It was eerily still, resembling death. Martha, a subtle smile on her face, lifted her right hand, a spectral green light coalescing at her fingertips. The radiance morphed into a beam that streaked towards Jenna. Having heard Lumian explain the Sea Bloodline's abilities, Jenna, at the sight of the spectral green light, rolled out of the cosmic void. Anthony followed suit. He refrained from using frenzy on Martha since a marionette, essentially dead, wouldn't succumb to frenzy. In the next moment, they both felt a weightiness, plummeting swiftly through the empty cosmos. They experienced the weightlessness Franca occasionally mentioned. In the blink of an eye, Jenna and Anthony landed on the ground and steadied themselves, yet Martha was nowhere to be seen. The empty cosmos was shattering inch by inch. They were still in Solemn Hotel, but they had descended from the fifth floor to the fourth. This was because the mid to low level cosmic void resembled more of an illusion. There would be a barrier akin to a wall of spirituality around them. After falling into it, their bodies remained in reality. As they rolled and dodged, Martha nudged them forcefully with her formless power, causing them to plunge into the floor cavity created by the explosives. Jenna didn't hesitate. She sprinted up the wall, seized a crack, and flipped back to the fifth floor where the explosion had occurred. She saw Lugano tending to his injuries, and Loki and Madame Martha were absent from the room diagonally opposite. Ludwig, who had hidden under the dining table, had vanished as well. On Aquina Street, amid a lively folk celebration, Loki, having transformed into an inconspicuous passerby, carried Ludwig, who had fallen asleep, through the crowd. His other marionette, a soul assure of the Evernight pathway, stayed concealed on the opposite side of Lumian's suite, ready to exert influence on the target. Initially, Loki had dispatched his temporary marionette, Georgia, to handle Lugano. He had manipulated the doctor's spirit body threads but refrained from deploying his more potent marionettes. It wasn't due to fear of alerting Ludwig, but rather a concern that an unseen adversary might be lurking in the shadows. After all, several lodgers in the motel hadn't left for the sea prayer ritual celebrations. A couple had returned before lunchtime next door, almost synchronizing with the target. Moreover, a marionettist's advancement ritual demanded a grand performance, a splendid and profound drama. Silent, unnoticed assassinations lacking a sufficient audience failed to meet the requirements. Therefore, Loki intentionally singled out Lugano first. If there were no other foes lurking, it was akin to switching marionettes. If there were, he could draw them all to him and clandestinely manipulate the target with the other marionette nearby. Aware that it was a sealed demigod, Loki knew its strength might be limited, but its essence remained unchanged. It was impervious to many influences. However, he believed the Evernight Pathway's forced sleep would still be effective. Since this sealed demigod could experience exhaustion, hunger, and the need for rest, food, and sleep like a true child, it implied that the seal had impacted corresponding characteristics, making him akin to an ordinary person in those aspects. At most, he would awaken faster and require less rest time. A few seconds would be ample time for Loki to relocate and conceal himself with the target before attempting to manipulate the other party's spirit body threads. His two marionettes would act independently, confusing both enemies and the Earth Mother Church clergymen rushing over. They would lead them on a chase spanning about 100 to 200 meters, completing the corresponding performance. As the time approached, the enemies would pinpoint his hiding spot through the marionette's trajectory, joyfully anticipating an encounter. 
However, what awaited them would be a demigod-level marionette, leading to a terrifying and grim outcome. Under the watchful eyes of the surrounding citizens, the magnificent play would conclude. Loki could consume the potion and ascend a sequence for, becoming a bizarro sorcerer. On the betrothal ship, within Lado Giaro's cosmic void. This was fundamentally different from lower middle level abilities. It was both an illusory realm and an alternate space that could cause people to lose themselves and become abnormally fragile. It was akin to the bottle of fiction augmented with hallucinations. The sticky blob of flesh Lumian had expelled squirmed rapidly, stretching and expanding into a discernible figure. Cloaked in blood red fabric with a matching hood obscuring its face in shadows, the figure revealed itself as none other than Mr. K of the Aurora Order. To counter April Fool's machinations, Lumian had chosen the strategy of overwhelming force. He accomplished this with overt and imposing power, complemented by meticulous arrangements. This plan allowed for a fair margin of error. Even if Lumian made a miscalculation, as long as April Fools didn't have angel-level helpers or three or more saints, he could salvage the situation by retaining at least one or two key members. To enhance their odds, Franca extended invitations to Gila and Gandalf. The Fertility Order also notified the higher-ups, ensuring the presence of a saint overseeing Port Santa during the Sea Prayer Ritual. The Tarot Club had two major Arcana card holders positioned nearby. When April Fool's key members felt secure, Madam Magician, the Angel of Stars, would cross a long distance and descend as they prepared to depart. For extra precaution, Lumian utilized Mr. K's finger to get him to Port Santa. Morphing with the Rose Bishop's power, he turned into a fleshy blob and was concealed in Lumian's stomach to infiltrate the betrothal ship. Mr. K glanced up, his eyes taking on an otherworldly illusion, as if concealing hidden doors. Swiftly scanning the cosmic void, he identified an escape route. Follow me, he said to Lumian in a hoarse voice. Nodding, Lumian reached into the traveler's bag, extracting the flawed boxing gloves and preparing to don them. If you guys still have a backup plan or if a few powerhouses don't appear in time, I'll draw the attention of the evil gods and create chaos. We'll all face the danger together. Early exits? Forget about it. Chapter 579, Energy Passage On the betrothal boat, the humanoid sealed artifact ascended, her form suspended in the air. Striding through the atmosphere, she advanced toward the sailboat. With the weight akin to a massive stone sphere, she manipulated the surrounding space, causing the target ship to shift automatically. The two factions drew near. Concurrently, the vacant eyes of the humanoid sealed artifact, adorned in a black nun's attire, suddenly sparked with madness and chaos. Minute blood vessels protruded from the whites of its eyes, swiftly converging. Accompanying her affliction, the maidens of the sea, deputy hosts, and sailors on the betrothal ship, unaware of what transpired, stood motionless. Their expressions blank, eyes vacant, they succumbed to the same state as the humanoid sealed artifact. In that moment, within the lingering light of holiness on the sailboat, which had traversed the void and approached the origin of derangement, a light abruptly vanished, swallowed by the profound darkness. In the darkness, a tranquil voice resonated, as if reciting a beautiful poem. The expression of the humanoid sealed artifact softened significantly. The chaos and madness in her eyes dissipated, and her steps slowed. The other individuals on the betrothal ship also entered a state of tranquility and drowsiness. Juan Oro felt the intangible force suppressing his body instantly dissipate. Straightening up abruptly, he glared angrily at Simon Giaro, positioned at the bow of the ship. The president of the Fisheries Guild had a rough idea of the other party's identity. After all, not many comprehended the entire sea prayer ritual and knew the intricacies of the Ring of the Sea Queen. Combined with the fact that he hailed from the same family as Simon Giaro, there was only one answer, Lado Giaro. You traitor. Even the distant chanting from the darkness couldn't pacify Juan Oro's anger. Although no longer the temporary governor of the sea, he still possessed considerable strength and could be deemed formidable at sea. Splash. The seawater at the bottom of the betrothal ship surged, part of it threatening to hurl everyone back to the surface, 
while others formed into towering peaks and crashed down on Lado Giaro, masquerading as Simon Giaro. Lado abruptly pivoted, fixing his gaze on Juan Oro. The azure peak poised to strike him froze in midair, its descent arrested. The water's attempt to push the betrothal ship out of this area also ceased its endeavors. Reflected in Lado Giaro's eyes was the figure of Juan Oro. The corners of his mouth curled up slightly as he stated a fact in a composed tone, I am now the governor of the sea. Your abilities, especially those affecting these waters, are completely suppressed by me. They are useless. The incantation from the darkness targeted the humanoid sealed artifact. Everything else was secondary. As the interim governor of the sea, Lado Giaro couldn't help but be affected. However, thanks to the feedback from the sea and the sharing of the burden, it didn't reach a profound level. He only became more tranquil, devoid of the desire for intense combat and direct killing. Compared to Juan Oro, he was more concerned about whether Gandalf was on the sailboat besides Gila. He was more concerned about whether Mad Lady had opened the spaceship's passageway in time. Juan Oro's heart sank as he witnessed the azure waves suspended in Madeira and Lado Giaro, seemingly indifferent to him. At that moment, Lado turned to Mad Lady, who had reverted to her human form, and addressed his companion, clad in an unusually flamboyant blood-colored dress, hurry up. Mad Lady wasn't particularly tall, standing at over 1.6 meters. Her dark blonde hair was disheveled, influenced by the heaviness effect. None of it fluttered wantonly, pointing towards the seabed. Her face concealed by pure flesh, making it challenging to discern her original appearance. She wore a ring on each hand. On her left hand, there was a rose gold ring embedded with a gem resembling crimson blood, and on her right, a simple, pure silver ring. Mad Lady responded to Lado Giaro with a smile, so there are times when you're anxious. Only then did she cast her gaze at the silver gray behemoth embedded in the seabed not far away. This lunatic. Lado Giaro cursed inwardly. I know someone had an extremely nasty personality and subsequently succumbed to mental illness due to other reasons and was admitted to an asylum, but in contrast, Mad Lady had displayed an abnormal state of mind from the very beginning. In the past, she relied on I know someone's regular treatment to barely maintain her rationality, but now, she was becoming more and more insane. Lado Giaro took a deep breath, focusing on the peculiar sounds emanating from within the spaceship, resisting the distant chants echoing in the darkness. Swiftly regaining his will to fight, he redirected his gaze to the sailboat, raising his right arm. Upon witnessing this, Juan Oro's sense of despair deepened. The white-haired old man clenched his fist, slamming it against his chest. With a snap, his sternum broke, and his flesh tore open, releasing a torrent of blood that painted his body and the betrothal ship's deck red. As life ebbed away, Juan Oro's white hair defied the heaviness effect, floating upwards. His steps grew burdensome, each movement pressing down like a mountain on the ground. Just as Lado Giaro was poised to unleash the surrounding seawater, submerging the sailboat, he suddenly realized that the sea wasn't as obedient as before. His governor of the sea position teetered on the brink of collapse. Lado Giaro turned his head once more, narrowing his eyes at Juan Oro, now covered in blood. Traitor, the sea will punish you. Juan Oro's dark green eyes focused, emitting a beam of blue light. Accompanying this attack, he also intensified Lado Giaro's heaviness, rendering him unable to move normally. Two beams struck Lado Giaro simultaneously, penetrating him and sinking into the sea. Lado Giaro's aura weakened slightly, but he wasn't as severely injured as Juan Oro believed. Sunlight burst forth from the April Fool key member who used Ultraman as his codename, eradicating the residual corrosive powers and altering his body structure. He lifted his chin slightly and uttered three words with strange pronunciations. Percent percent end, this was also the language employed to activate the spaceship. The implication was likely akin to granting access, equivalent to obtaining a certain amount of governor of the sea power without melding with the sea after opening a crack in the seal. Lado Giaro's usage now was to help him seize all authority back from Juan Oro. Mph, foolish fellow, a group of fools. They hadn't studied the sounds heard during every sea sacrifice after so many years. They guarded the treasure but failed to excavate it. 
sacrificing your life, sacrificing yourself, it's meaningless. Brains and strength are the foundation. Juan Oro, still bleeding from his chest, was surprised to discover that the authority of the governor of the sea had shifted again. He stared at Lado Biaro in confusion and horror, as if looking at a true devil. Why? Why does the sea favor him more? Why does the sea favor this traitor more? At that moment, Mad Lady, on the other side of the bow, completed reciting the incoherent order. The silver-gray behemoth at the bottom of the sea trembled slightly, increasing in magnitude, causing the entire seabed and all the seawater to quake. Inside, beams of pure light converged and shot out from the open entrance, landing at the edge of the betrothal ship, forming a transparent tunnel-like energy passageway. Mad Lady didn't immediately leap into the pure light. She understood that as the spaceship opened and activated further, the power accumulated in the depths of the seal would erupt. Everyone present, except the governor of the sea, would be torn apart. But it didn't matter. She had a solution. The plain silver ring on her right hand, a gift from Bard, held the boon from honoring the ancestors. It could steal that power and distribute it, sharing the burden with all the children of the sea in Port Santa. Of course, those present would receive more. Whether they could endure it or not depended on fate. When the moment arrived, the Fisheries Guild members would believe the sea prayer ritual had succeeded, celebrating with joy. Little did they know that their sea had been stolen. The irony delighted Mad Lady. Just as she was about to use the ring, a strong sense of danger premonition hit her. In a flash, her figure vanished, reappearing a few steps away. A shadow rose from the deck where she had stood, but it failed to envelop her. Mad Lady then spotted Mr. K, draped in a blood-colored cloak and hood, and Lumian Lee, wearing the lie earring but yet to revert to his original appearance. Port Santa, Governor of the Sea's Residence. Bard stood by the window, gazing at the weeds outside. Silently calculating the time, he waited for the sea prayer ritual to progress. If the sea's boon arrived with a delay and cheers erupted from Milo Village, he would openly leave this place, abandoning those who had been deceived. When the moment arrived, anyone attempting to stop him would be torn apart by the power of the sea. In the absence of a delayed collective boon, but with the sky and sea undergoing ominous changes, as if a catastrophe had struck, Bard could wait for the spaceship or Mad Lady to pick him up. Of course, he wouldn't wait indefinitely. If there were no further developments from the sea prayer ritual within ten minutes, he would use his abilities to forcefully exit, shift positions, and conceal himself. The early stage abilities of the Marauder Pathway weren't formidable. Bard had developed the habit of remaining vigilant as he advanced step by step. As the weeds swayed in the bright sunlight and mild wind, Bard suddenly heard faint footsteps. The sound emanated from the corridor outside, so subtle that it seemed almost like an illusion. Chapter 580 Theft Bard pivoted on his heels, fixing his eyes on the door. A moment lingered in silence, but no one rapped against the wooden barrier. The once present soft footsteps in the corridor had now faded into nothingness. As a seasoned beyonder, Bard dismissed the notion of hallucination. Returning to the servant's bed, he grabbed the backpack containing the spoils of the year, feigning an escape from the governor of the sea's residence before confirming the outcome of the sea prayer ritual. Such precautions were only sensible. Not everyone placed full trust in Juan Oro's promises. Bard slung the backpack over his shoulder and slyly opened the window, aiming to slip into the weeds below. Suddenly, a figure, standing over a meter tall, emerged from the shadows in the corner. Its disproportionately large head and wrinkled face identified it as one of the little devils from the sea spawn. The little devil gestured for Bard to close the glass window. Just a bunch of creatures with low IQs, Bard thought, mocking them inwardly. Despite generations, they have yet to master Highlander and can only barely communicate like dogs. Maintaining a timid expression, Bard closed the window. Having tested the waters, he had a rough idea of where the sea spawn responsible for monitoring him were hiding. None of them appeared to have any connection to the soft footsteps echoing in the corridor, nor did they seem aware of them. 
On the betrothal boat, Mad Lady, draped in a blood-colored dress with a portion of her face showing pure flesh and blood, instantly vanished upon spotting Mr. K and Lumian. She swiftly changed her position. Simultaneously, a figure materialized behind and to her side, Lumian and Mr. K. Employing their teleportation abilities, they blocked Mad Lady. After Mad Lady shifted to the opposite side of the deck, the corners of her mouth, made of pure flesh and blood, curled up. Her grayish-green eyes gleamed with anticipation and excitement. Come and attack me. Chase me. This way, no one will use the item that honored the ancestors to steal the deep power about to erupt. Let's see who reacts the fastest and teleports out of these waters when the time comes. For those unable to escape in time, they would undoubtedly be torn to pieces by the violent power, much like the fate that befell others on the ship. As these thoughts raced through her mind, Mad Lady swiftly turned transparent, evading Lumian's crimson near-white fireballs and Mr. K's light green wind blades. Amidst the rumbling explosion, Ultraman Lado Gyaro was equally infuriated by Mad Lady's actions. If he were still the temporary and complete governor of the sea, he wouldn't fear the impact of the potent power in the spaceship. He hadn't intended to release Mad Lady and use Bard's silver ring. However, the situation had changed. Juan Oro, burning his life and sacrificing flesh and blood, had contested him for the authority of the governor of the sea. In this state, Ultraman couldn't be certain if he was fully protected or if he would suffer some level of damage. Furthermore, not being a true demigod, he wasn't sure if he could withstand such a blow, one that left him only injured. He couldn't help but urge Mad Lady with his eyes, but his companion was teleporting and didn't have time to meet his gaze. The humanoid sealed artifact remained immersed in distant chanting in the darkness, oblivious to the impending sea's fury. In the blink of an eye, corporeal starlight surged from the silver gray behemoth at the bottom of the sea. It followed the condensed energy passageway and struck the betrothal ship with a tsunami like sound, aiming to devour everything around it. Here it comes! Mad Lady eagerly prepared for her extreme escape. Confronted with the immense wave of starlight, Lumian's initial reaction was, why is there another sea's fury? Relying on his combat instincts, he immediately extended his spirituality to the lie earring on his left ear, activating the high-level stealing power attached to the mystical item. The starlight in his eyes took on a more tangible form, as if it had materialized. Lumian's raised left hand subtly twisted his wrist. The starlight surging from the silver-gray behemoth changed its course, rushing towards Lumian in waves, engulfing the sky and the sea. This was even more terrifying than the previous sea's rage. At that moment, Lumian felt as if an apocalypse had descended. He knew very well that he couldn't absorb all the stolen power himself. Doing so would render him unable to endure, crushed into rotten meat on the spot, indirectly aiding Termoboros in escaping his predicament. Fortunately, the stolen power link to honoring the ancestors had the ability to disperse the boon obtained and share it with everyone present and all those with the sea bloodlines in Port Santa, similar to every successful sea prayer ritual. Though a bit greedy and reluctant, Lumian restrained himself. Without hesitation, he opened his left hand, seemingly grasping something, and twisted his wrist in the opposite direction. Suddenly, the starlight that had darkened the sky and sea seemed to explode from within, scattering radiant starlight in every direction. The stars are raining. Franca, concealed in the cabin on the sailboat, lamented. She tightly clutched the major arcana card belonging to Judgment in her hand. This wasn't a plea for Madame Judgment to descend directly. After all, this wasn't within her jurisdiction. It was to signal the location for the major arcana card holders who had already gathered nearby. The beams of starlight left dazzling trails as they penetrated the bodies of those nearby and soared towards the bloodline connections farther away. Lumian couldn't control this process, so he could only sense a portion of the starlight landing on him, causing his left chest to burn and corrode his flesh. Simultaneously, he witnessed a significant amount of starlight being drawn towards the potent sea bloodline and the authority of the governor of the sea, surging towards Ultraman and Juan Oro. Undoubtedly, the humanoid sealed artifact received the most boons. Like the eye of a vortex, she incessantly absorbed the surrounding starlight. 
even the starlight heading towards Hela's sailboat diminished noticeably. Ultraman experienced a replenishment, breaking free from his weakened state after Juan Oro's two beams, swiftly reclaiming the authority of the governor of the sea. In his moment of elation, Ultraman Lado Gyaro felt intense surprise and confusion. Why can Lumian Lee also steal the spacecraft's power? That requires a high-level stealing ability. Hasn't Bard's ring already been placed on the altar to honor the ancestors? And we've confirmed its corresponding effects. Isn't the enchantment only possible once a year? Amidst the echoing shock, Lado Gyaro couldn't be bothered to ponder the answer. His instinctive reaction was to swiftly crush Juan Oro. Otherwise, who knew what he, now strengthened, would do? At that moment, Juan Oro felt a surge of regained strength. He observed his cracked chest and hazy flesh, now covered in starlight scales, with blood flowing out dyed in a resplendent color. Gazing at Lado Gyaro, he suddenly smiled, a smile of relief, yearning, and evident anger. His body underwent a rapid transformation, eyes turning vertical, scales growing, and limbs thickening. In the span of a breath, he morphed into a humanoid lizard. During this process, Lado Gyaro condensed a dark green light that descended on Juan Oro in a series of rays. Juan Oro made no attempt to dodge, he endured it. His aura rapidly weakened, precisely as he desired. His lizard-like form faded, growing increasingly translucent, as if condensed from starlight. Then, Juan Oro merged into the void representing the sea and spoke to Lado Gyaro with a complex expression, I've returned to the sea. Come quickly too. At the last few words, Juan Oro gnashed his teeth, not concealing his deep-seated hatred. Every child of the sea was prepared to return to the sea, and Juan Oro was no exception. However, he hadn't anticipated doing so in this manner. His sole desire now was for Lado Gyaro to join him. Juan Oro's figure dissipated, becoming entirely a part of the sea. Ultraman Lado Gyaro immediately sensed a growing animosity between his title as governor of the sea and the waters. The harmony that once existed had given way to a resistance emanating from the power of the sea. This indicated that the governor of the sea authority he had acquired wouldn't be complete for some time. Damned old fellow! Lado Gyaro cursed inwardly, but he remained composed. He had realized that Hila was the sole demigod on the sailboat. The humanoid sealed artifact, having received a boon from the sea and escaped the influence of the chanting, was sufficient to hold off the opposition for a while. Though uncertain why Gandalf and the others hadn't arrived, Ultraman Lado Gyaro welcomed this turn of events. It allowed him to focus on dealing with Lumian Lee and his ally. Despite being an incomplete governor of the sea, he possessed enough strength to control adversaries below the demigod level briefly and gain entry to the spaceship first. Moreover, Mad Lady's assistance added to his advantage. Having received the sea's boon, Lumian contemplated his newfound capabilities. Now, I seem qualified to contend for the authority of the governor of the sea. Although I can't be considered to possess the sea bloodline and only wield some power of the sea lasting a week, far inferior to Ultraman, my fake level is high enough. I'm at the angel level. Just as Ultraman Lado Gyaro and Lumian responded swiftly, the gray sky suddenly brightened. Thick bluish-green vines descended, shrouding the two ships and the surrounding area in torrential rain. Soon, they intertwined into a giant-like forest growing above the sea. Chapter 581, Gap Upon witnessing the descent of the thick bluish-green vines, Lumian marveled as if a real carriage could traverse their expanse. It felt like a journey back to a scene from a few years ago when he would listen to his sister's nighttime fairy tales. The dazzling, dreamlike scene and boundless imagination seemed to materialize in reality at that very moment. Ultraman Lado Gyaro sensed imminent danger. The individual capable of such an effect couldn't be a low or mid-sequence beyond her, they had to be a saint who had unlocked the door to godhood. Perhaps even beyond sequence four. Another formidable demigod had entered the scene. Who could it be? Where had they emerged from? This certainly wasn't Gandalf. While others might be unaware, Loki had thoroughly investigated the president of the curly-haired baboon's research society 
discovering he was a beyonder of the warrior pathway, a warrior who had a penchant for research and mysticism. In the blink of an eye, Lado Giaro spotted a black shadow racing down the thick green vines. It was an enormous pumpkin drawn by numerous gray mice. A hole atop the orange pumpkin resembled a coach. Within, a vaguely discernible woman sat, adorned in a purple robe, with crystalline heels adorning her feet. A pumpkin coach, mice-drawn carriage, crystal heels, what the fuck is that? Who could it be? Lado Giaro's pupils dilated, and he couldn't help but inwardly curse with the same words he used most frequently before transmigration. Isn't that Cinderella? Did Roselle actually pen this fairy tale? Why hadn't it gained traction, remaining unknown to most? For a fleeting moment, Lado Giaro grappled with uncertainty, unable to discern whether the newcomer was a demigod aligned with another faction or a concealed powerhouse within the curly-haired baboon's research society. Regaining his composure, he cursed his ill fortune and prepared himself for a confrontation with the enigmatic demigod. Luckily, being the governor of the sea, he could at least temporarily impede the other party in these aquatic surroundings. Prior to the impending clash, Ultraman Lado Giaro turned his gaze towards Mad Lady. He didn't have time to speak, but his eyes expressed the unspoken message, hurry up. No time for games. Mad Lady swiftly grasped Ultraman's urgency and, with a blink, positioned herself at the entrance of the energy passageway. However, instead of materializing precisely there, she outlined her presence. This decision was prompted by the sudden appearance of Mr. K and Lumian, seemingly having teleported nearby, with their sights set on the energy passageway's entrance. Splash! Whether from the imposing weight of the humanoid sealed artifact or Lado Giaro raising his right arm, conjuring a mountainous azure wave, the water around the cave visibly swayed, teetering on the brink of collapse. In that critical moment, Cinderella, seated in the pumpkin carriage, pushed open the door and rose to her feet. She extended her arms, and a massive iron black cross materialized behind her. The weight of the cross proved challenging for Cinderella to bear, as though it carried the concentrated sins of the entire world. A cross? Ultraman Lado Giaro was caught off guard as an empty room materialized before him. Within the room, candlelight flickered, revealing a long table adorned with flesh and blood. On either side of the table, three obscure figures hunched over, gnawing and feasting on a gruesome banquet. Abruptly, the three figures turned their heads, fixing their gaze upon Lado Giaro. He stood frozen, as if their gazes had penetrated his deepest secrets, dismantling them into the essential components of spirit and flesh. A chilling sensation surged from the depths of Lado Giaro's heart, immediately alerting him to an intense and terrifying malice. However, the source of this malevolence wasn't the newly arrived demigod but the silver-gray behemoth trapped at the sea's bottom, the very spaceship Lado Giaro sought to obtain harbored ill intentions towards him. In the blink of an eye, the silver-gray behemoth retracted its authority. Lado Giaro's status as the governor of the sea plummeted. Despite gaining a new boon, he couldn't ascend to the demigod level. The spaceship had betrayed him. This treachery was a result of the spell Cinderella had just unleashed, the Feast of Betrayal. Its purpose was to temporarily awaken or bestow intelligence on a target item, compelling it to commit an act of betrayal. Lado Giaro had seamlessly melded with the surrounding waters, harnessing the authority of the governor of the sea on a temporary basis. The spaceship now stood as an entity he had yet to fully master. Objects beyond his full control were prime candidates for betrayal. Cinderella astutely sensed this vulnerability, initiating the feast of betrayal from the outset. Simultaneously, the sealed environment provided the perfect conditions for her to unleash this magic, an act she might not dare attempt elsewhere. In that moment, surprise and fear flooded Lado Giaro. It felt as though a frigid cascade had drenched him, sending shivers through his entire being. Since merging with the sea and gaining the governor of the sea's authority, Lado Giaro had believed that ordinary Sequence Four or even Sequence Three demigods, commonly referred to as saints, couldn't swiftly overpower him in this realm. This belief created a sense of parity, but it hinged on him remaining within the waters to fully unleash his strength. 
Yet, Cinderella's mere magic stripped him of the governor of the sea's authority, relegating him to sequence five. Without godhood, mastery over the sea slipped from his grasp. Despite being a dual sequence five of a potion and boon system with numerous unique abilities, Lado Gyaro harbored doubts about facing a genuine demigod. A demigod temporarily shaped from an item proves fragile in the face of a true demigod. So brittle that, once targeted, they wouldn't endure even a breath. Lado Gyaro grappled with the stark realization of the fragility of a true demigod and sank into deep regret and despair. At that moment, the silver-gray behemoth trembled violently, causing the energy passageway at the entrance to flicker and cast its luminance upon Lado Gyaro. With a whoosh, Lado Gyaro found himself hurtling uncontrollably into the spaceship through the pure energy conduit. This was a facet of the spaceship's calculated betrayal, aiming to turn the recent authority holder into a mere nutritive substrate within a petri dish. Lado Gyaro was initially startled, but soon a wave of joy washed over him. An opportunity had presented itself. It allowed him to infiltrate the spaceship, wrest control, and set it in motion, a chance to escape. His misfortune and despair had suddenly transformed into this golden opportunity. Observing the unfolding scene, Lumian wasted no time. He employed Spirit World Traversal once more, reaching the entrance of the energy passageway. Stepping in, he soared into the silver-gray behemoth. Mad Lady trailed closely behind, and Mr. K didn't intervene, instead, he followed suit. Milo Village, Governor of the Sea's Residence Bard, strategizing an escape plan, was abruptly interrupted by cheers. Cheers. Bard's heart stirred, prompting him to dash out of the servant's room towards the nearest glass window overlooking the dock. There, he observed the gathered villagers. Not a single sea spawn hindered the former governor of the sea during this process. Many villagers raised their hands, seemingly welcoming the waves. As they praised the sea, an almost invisible glow descended, dispersing like water to different individuals. The nearby children joyfully shouted, The sea prayer ritual has succeeded. The sea prayer ritual has succeeded. That's right, it has succeeded. Bard smiled. From the looks of it, Ultraman and Mad Lady have succeeded. The April Fool's key member adjusted the collar of his crisp white shirt and hoisted a brown backpack onto his shoulders. With an unabashed smile, he strolled into the Grand Hall of the Governor of the Sea's residence, smoothly making his way out. This time, he encountered no resistance. The guards stationed at the entrance knelt on the ground, expressing gratitude to the sea for its boon. Bard took a detour to the docks, reveling in the genuine joy and praise for the sea. Every time he heard the townsfolk praising the sea and witnessed genuine smiles, his spirits lifted. These fools! They are treating a catastrophe as a cause for celebration. This is a prank, a prank on everyone in Port Santa. Bard closed his eyes in satisfaction and weaved through the crowd, heading deeper into Milo Village. His ultimate destination, the peaks of the Pyrees mountain range. As a former swindler, Bard orchestrated the sea prayer ritual operation, serving as its main planner. The plan's success naturally brought him satisfaction. Crucially, despite taking the most pivotal step in the entire operation, he assumed the least risk and exposure, avoiding direct confrontations. Navigating through the mix of ancient and modern structures in Milo Village, Bard's brow furrowed slightly. A sense of unease settled upon him. Per the initial plan, Ultraman, unhindered by strong opposition, was supposed to use the second command to open the energy passageway. Relying on his temporary authority as the governor of the sea, he aimed to secure safety for himself and Mad Lady within him. Seizing the opportunity, he planned to eliminate all present and inflict severe injuries on potential demigod adversaries. If powerhouses like Gila emerged and proved resistant to the humanoid-sealed artifact, Ultraman, the interim governor of the sea, would leap into action, confronting the formidable foes head-on. Mad Lady, wielding her enchanted ring, would harness the potent energy emanating from the spaceship, transforming it into a boon for everyone present, extending its reach to all the children of the sea in Port Santa's vicinity. This strategic move not only allowed them to sidestep danger but also granted them access to the spaceship, enabling them to activate it. 
Despite the fact that the people had already received the sea's boon and a few minutes had elapsed, the spaceship remained dormant and the sky showed no signs of change. What had transpired during this interval? With this lingering question, Bard hastened his steps. Tap, tap, tap. Behind him, the faint sound of light footsteps echoed once again. Chapter 582, Efficient Person Locator Port Santa, in the city. Loki and the unconscious Ludwig had already sought refuge in an apartment that Loki had rented many days earlier. He began manipulating the sealed demigod's spirit body threads. As for his two marionettes, they lurked within a radius of 100 to 200 meters, with Loki as the center, blending in with the various celebrating and passing crowds. They waited to be discovered by Lumi and Lee's teammates and the clergymen of the Church of Earth Mother. This was unavoidable. A marionettist couldn't allow a marionette to wield their faceless powers. As for the mystical item of the seer pathway, it was in the possession of either Bard or Mad Lady. In the partially destroyed suite of Solo Motel, Jenna and Anthony encountered Noelia, the combat nun, and her teammates, who had hurried over. Before this, Lumian had covertly introduced the disguised Jenna and Anthony to Noelia. Hence, the nuns didn't unnecessarily question or apprehend them, they only carefully confirmed each other's identities. Ruby Opaco is a fake. He's disguised by a marionettist. He has captured Lewis Berry's godson. He possesses two marionettes. One is Madame Martha, the Paco family's matriarch. The other's identity and abilities are unknown, Jenna recounted the recent events. She assumed that the fertility order was familiar with the term marionettist and didn't delve into unnecessary explanations. Their primary duty was to guard against the Intus Republic to the north, and many official beyonders of Bureau 8 in the Intus Republic belonged to the Seer Pathway. The two sides must have had considerable interactions. Marionettist. Indeed, upon hearing the sequence name, Noelia frowned slightly. Is Intus sending spies to disrupt the Sea Prayer ritual? That's a traitor from Intus's Bureau 8, Jenna explained, her allegiance to Intus stronger than Lumian's. Noelia understood that time was of the essence and she couldn't discuss unrelated matters. She asked the key question, why sees Lewis Berry's godson? Is he held as a hostage, or does he possess some extraordinary significance? Jenna thought for a moment and revealed the limited information she had just learned. It's a sealed demigod, a creature. Loki will need substantial time to transform him into a marionette, not just a matter of minutes. A demigod? A sealed demigod? That child with the insatiable appetite is a sealed demigod? Noelia's mouth hung open in surprise and astonishment. She almost questioned the reliability of her own ears. The supposed godson of the adventurer Lewis Berry is, in fact, a sealed demigod creature? What's his backstory? Why is he wandering around with a sealed demigod creature? Moreover, there's talk of a humanoid sealed artifact, rumored to be at Grade 1, that recently surfaced in Port Santa. It's on par with a sealed demigod creature. Despite extensive searching, no one has been able to locate it. If not for the disparities in appearance, gender, and age, Noelia might have suspected Ludwig to be the humanoid sealed artifact that the Eternal Blazing Sun Church had misplaced. Now, an absurd idea echoed in her mind. Is it the current trend to stroll around with sealed demigod creatures? Regaining her composure, Noelia promptly addressed her team members, Semele, quickly returned to the order and informed the dean. Ask her to deploy all available personnel to the city. Locate them as soon as possible. Yes, Madame Martha or Lewis Berry's godson, Ludwig. After finding them, unless the situation is exceptionally urgent, refrain from acting recklessly. Report first and await assistance. Considering that the marionettist had likely altered his appearance and height, and the identity and appearance of his other marionette were unknown, Noelia concentrated her search on Madame Martha, who had become a marionette, and Ludwig, who had been abducted. Yes, Captain. In a bid to save time, the brown-haired Semele darted through the shattered glass window. Utilizing the stone bricks and wood protruding from the outer wall, she leaped from the fifth floor to the street. 
the Dean Noelia referred to as the head of the local cloister, the clergyman overseeing the fertility order in Port Santa, the fertility order's headquarters in Torres, the capital of Gaia province. Just as Semele took a few steps and was about to explore the nearby streets, Jenna, Anthony, Noelia, and the others witnessed a massive bird soaring through the air. The bird's body was grayish-black, its feathers were tough and lacked softness. Its eyes appeared to be adorned with two rubies. The grayish-black bird flapped its wings and glided to the collapsed fifth-floor outer wall of Salo Motel. Only then did Jenna and Anthony realize that the grayish-black bird was sculpted from stone. It was weighty, substantial, and unyielding, yet it emanated a vibrant vitality. Perched on the back of the lifelike grayish-black bird was a woman in a brown clergyman's robe. She wore a nun's wimple with wheat patterns and seemed to be in her thirties, but she exuded a maternal aura, as if she had nurtured many children. The brown-haired, brown-eyed, mature, and stunning clergyman turned her gaze to Noelia and succinctly stated, details. Noelia swiftly echoed Jenna's words. She positioned herself with a slight spread of her legs and raised her hands. Praise the earth, praise the mother of all things. The clergyman was none other than the Archbishop of the Church of Earth Mother's Gaia Diocese, Agrippina. Agrippina nodded gently and uttered, I know Martha from the Paco family. I didn't expect her to meet such a fate. Sigh, may the Earth Mother embrace her soul, and may the flower symbolizing her bloom again next spring. The Archbishop delicately shifted her right foot, conveying a signal to the massive bird sculpted from grayish black stone. The stone bird, pulsating with vitality, flapped its wings and ascended dozens of meters into the air. Agrippina extended her right hand and scattered a handful of dark black seeds the size of rice grains. With a flutter, the port's white-headed seabirds flocked in, covering the sky. Each one gripped a seed in its beak and circled around. They formed a circle within a 300-meter radius. Observing this spectacle, the jubilant citizens of Port Santa, assuming that the seabirds had joined in the celebration of the successful sea prayer ritual, erupted in cheers of delight. After two to three minutes, a solitary combat nun spotted Madame Martha. The marionette was concealed on the other side of Aquinas Street. Upon receiving the information, Agrippina turned her head and fixed her gaze into the air. Soon, the white-headed seabirds released the rice-sized seeds from their beaks. Agrippina withdrew her gaze and folded her arms across her chest. Each seed that touched the ground instantly sprouted and grew rapidly, morphing into thick dark green vines. Simultaneously, Jenna, Anthony, Noelia, and the others, who were scouring the street for Ludwig and Loki, witnessed the sky darken, as if night had prematurely descended or a colossal creature had eclipsed the sunlight. Vaguely, they sensed the presence of a massive pitch-black wing covered in a membrane, casting an illusory aura. In the next moment, a crimson full moon ascended from the night, hanging high in the sky. It seemed as though a tall, slender figure was slowly advancing. Crimson moonlight bathed the area surrounded by the dark green vines, captivating all the citizens like statues. Nourished by the moonlight, the dark green vines swiftly expanded, swiftly encasing the streets around Aquina Street in a forest. Dark red flowers blossomed in the forest, densely clustered and ubiquitous. The flowers emitted a faint, sweet fragrance that intermingled, gradually intensifying the scent. Upon inhaling this fragrance, the residents of Port Santa, as well as the rats and bedbugs in the corresponding area, entered a stupor, swaying and collapsing to the ground. Damn it! Jenna understood that Archbishop Agrippina of the Church of Earth Mother was employing indiscriminate tactics to influence the area, aiming to locate and control Loki, but she still cursed internally. This gaseous anesthetic jogged unpleasant memories. In the past, she had nearly fallen victim to a similar gas used by that Bliss Society pervert. Yet now, in the diffusing gas with a noticeable difference in smell but a similar effect, her head started to spin, and her body felt uneasy. The same was true for Anthony and Noelia. One bore dragon-like scales on his skin, while the other held her breath. At that moment, three white-headed seabirds descended from the sky, each clutching a metallic bottle, circling Jenna and the others. Noelia glanced at Archbishop Agrippina 
who was hovering in midair, and received a nod. Without hesitation, she took the bottle from a white-headed seabird's claw and gulped it down. She swiftly regained consciousness, no longer affected by the gaseous anesthetic. Observing this, Jenna and Anthony accepted the metal bottles and consumed the sour agent. They no longer felt dizzy and weak. The three white-headed seabirds weakly ascended again, landing by the roadside one after another, and dozed off. In the area surrounded by the dark green vine forest, only a marionette remained standing at that moment, impervious to the gaseous anesthetic. Its presence was immediately exposed. In the apartment he had pre-rented, Loki was taken aback to discover that controlling the sealed demigod's spirit body threads was much more challenging than he had anticipated. This wasn't a problem that could be resolved in ten minutes. According to his initial estimate, it would take at least an hour. Given the time, the Church of Earth Mother could turn these streets upside down. As the gaseous anesthetic created by the dark green vines and dark red flowers permeated the room, Loki's initial impulse was to craft an air straw nearly 30 meters long and extend it high into the air to breathe fresh air. However, he quickly dismissed the idea. Perhaps the demigod of the Church of Earth Mother was waiting to detect similar traces to pinpoint his location. Moreover, Loki had realized that there was more than one demigod in the sky. If there was only one, he could rely on sealed artifacts, bestowments, and other means to concentrate. He could conceal himself in the shadows and contend with them to see if he could endure until the marionette-making process was completed. However, there were at least two demigods observing. More importantly, he could endure for about ten minutes, but an hour was out of the question. After weighing the pros and cons, Loki abandoned his original plan to conduct the ritual today and advance to sequence for Bizarro Sorcerer. In any case, as long as he could restrain the sealed demigod, he could find another opportunity in the future. There was no need for him to perform today. Why would it take an hour or more? Is this a demigod's spirit body threads? Amidst Loki's confusion, he didn't intend to recall the two marionettes. He planned on using the mystical item to teleport away. From his pocket, he retrieved a bracelet made of different colored gems. Just as Loki was about to activate a diamond, he heard the sound of swallowing. Loki instinctively lowered his head and looked into his arms, realizing that Ludwig had awakened at some point. With a sincere expression, the boy spoke with a hint of eagerness, I'm hungry. Chapter 583, Celestial Worthy's Revelation Around the betrothal ship and sailboat, thick turquoise vines cascaded from the sky. They entwined, creating a road leading to various destinations. Cinderella returned to the orange-yellow pumpkin coach, pulled by gray mice swiftly descending through the vines. They approached the energy passageway formed by pure light, as if about to enter the silver-gray behemoth embedded in the seabed. Abruptly, the mischief of gray mice came to a halt. Cinderella, adorned in a purple robe, wore a solemn expression, purple spots dancing in her pupils. Cinderella sensed an unusually perilous presence deep within the silver-gray behemoth. It remained motionless, as if in a deep slumber or long dead. However, in either case, her intuition warned her not to approach, lest she suffer severe corruption or similar effects. Staring at the energy passageway where Lumian and company had vanished, she deliberated for a few seconds before shifting her focus to the sailboat. With Mr. Fool's seal on the Seven of Wands and the sealed evil god's angel, he didn't have to worry about the problem that even she had to be wary of, as long as he didn't directly see those things, hear its voice, or enter the core area. As for the other one, he seemed to be a shepherd, so he didn't mind being even crazier. Cinderella observed the mast and shipboard of the sailboat cracking under the terrifying suction of the humanoid sealed artifact's heaviness characteristic. She was ready to make her move when she retrieved a Roselle chess piece from her dark purple coin bag and hurled it at the target in the black nun's attire. Amidst the howling wind, the queen chess piece soared towards the humanoid sealed artifact, accompanied by various miscellaneous items. As it descended, the humanoid sealed artifact's steps towards the sailboat slowed, as if time itself was warping around her. This was one of the spells of Cinderella, the chessboard of ages. 
It had the power to decelerate the target as if they had entered an area where time moved at a different speed. Seizing the opportunity presented by the sluggish movement, Cinderella closed her eyes and transformed into a humanoid phantom, collapsing into the invisible coffin. The eyelids of the humanoid sealed artifact drooped, as if she might succumb to sleep at any moment. Sleeping Beauty Magic Witnessing this, Gila, aboard the sailboat, once again activated the Evernight Pathway's ability to forcibly drag people into a dream. Although the notarization wouldn't immediately expire with Ultraman Lado Gyaro's loss of the Governor of the Sea Authority, it would still last until the end. However, the ability to be invalidated by notarization wasn't entirely ineffective. It would only be weakened, and its effects would be significantly reduced. Now, the humanoid sealed artifact was already fatigued, swaying, and on the verge of falling asleep. In this state, entering a dream was undoubtedly much easier. The humanoid sealed artifact, donned in a black nun's attire, finally closed her eyes and plunged into a deep slumber. She entered a somewhat sorrowful dream, causing her face to contort slightly as she frowned. On the sailboat, a dense darkness surged once more, enveloping the humanoid sealed artifact, resonating with a distant voice that brought peace and tranquility. It was akin to a mother reciting a poem to lull her child to sleep, fostering a serene slumber. The humanoid sealed artifact, still in her black nun's attire, hovered in midair with her eyes tightly shut. She descended slowly, landing gracefully on the deck of the sailboat. Her brows gradually relaxed, her face softened, and crystalline water droplets formed at the corners of her eyes. The maidens of the sea, deputy hosts, and sailors, blessed by the sea and adorned with starlight scales, swiftly settled in the darkness, succumbing to sleep amidst the enchanting chanting. Franca, within the sail cabin, was taken aback by the unfolding battle. Is, isn't that Cinderella? Is, isn't that Jack and the Beanstalk? What manner of magic is this? Is, isn't that Sleeping Beauty? Who is this? Have I arrived in a fairyland? I have to admit, it's truly dreamlike. Two demigods working together are undoubtedly formidable. They swiftly subdued the humanoid sealed artifact. I also wish to become a demigod. A demonist demigod would do too. Regaining her senses, Franca concealed herself and sprinted out of the sailboat. Utilizing her run-up and an assassin's feather fall, she elegantly leaped onto the betrothal ship, intending to approach the energy passageway at the bow. Within the silver-gray behemoth. After Lumian traversed the energy passageway, he found himself not in the metal beehive he had seen before. Walking on the silvery-white metal floor, he noticed a hall dozens of meters long and twenty to thirty meters wide ahead. In the middle of the hall, Ultraman Lado Giaro stood, donning Simon Giaro's face, and shouted in delight, asterisk, dot yen hashtag, this represented the first half of the command to activate the spaceship by entering the password and gaining access. However, there was no response from the spaceship. Crap. It still holds ill intentions towards me and isn't willing to grant access. This malice stems from that demigod's ability. It shouldn't last long. As long as I can stall for time, I should be able to regain control. Can the humanoid sealed artifact hold back two demigods? Or can I rely on the spaceship's internal layout to play hide and seek? A series of thoughts raced through Ultraman's anxious mind. At that moment, through the translucent metal wall to the side of the hall, he saw Cinderella and the pumpkin coach come to a halt near the energy passageway, seemingly apprehensive about something. As expected, she doesn't dare to enter. Exhilaration surged from Ultraman Lado Giaro's heart. Before the mission kicked off, Loki had set up an altar and sought guidance from Celestial Worthy through divination. The response he got was, contains a high risk from high-ranking individuals. Avoidable by entering the spaceship. Loki decoded this as a warning about Gila and Gandalf from the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society, as well as the saint from the Church of Earth Mother overlooking Port Santa. These high-ranking figures were the primary threats. However, if he could take the reins of the mystical sci-fi spaceship first, he believed he could outmaneuver these formidable opponents. Now, Lado Giaro noticed that even without absolute control of the spaceship, the new demigod hesitated, 
as if haunted by an unseen fear. Facing something capable of unsettling a demigod left Lado Gyaro uneasy. However, armed with the spaceship's command and password, he could soon turn potential threats to his advantage. There was no need for fear. As Lumian was on the brink of teleporting behind Ultraman Lado Gyaro, they both heard a metallic clang. A silver metal door descended, sealing off the hall's entrance and exit completely. The walls, ceiling, and floor transformed as metal surfaces shifted and revealed dark pipe openings. Out gushed cerulean blue gas. Poison gas. Lado Gyaro's heart raced as he grasped the situation. The spaceship, still imbued with malice, not only resisted control but also emanated lethal intent, seeking to eliminate him before its animosity subsided. The magic of the demigod outside is malicious indeed. Lumian perceived this as an instinctive strike from the silver-gray behemoth against intruders. Swiftly, he tapped into the power of the sea, aiming to invoke the temporary authority of the governor of the sea to counter the threat. He could sense that Ultraman had lost the governor of the sea's position after the attack from the Cinderella demigod, with no immediate prospect of reclaiming it. With no contenders for the authority, Lumian anticipated an easy acquisition. Yet, the waters resisted, refusing Lumian the temporary position of governor of the sea. Its malice seemed directed at anyone attempting control. Undeterred, Lumian shifted his focus back to Ultraman Lado Gyaro, a crucial member of April Fools. Lado Gyaro's heart stirred as he shouted, Do you want to fight here? If we don't break out and waste no time, we'll all die. In this dire moment, a plan to escape the hall and relocate became paramount. The malice wouldn't linger for long. Seek vengeance in a safe space. If we perish here, who will assist in eliminating the others? Lumian nonchalantly flexed his wrists, donning the flawed boxing gloves, and grinned, stating, I don't care about my own death. All that matters now is one thing, ending you. As the words left his lips, crimson flames, bordering on white, erupted from his entire being, as if he were cloaked in a fiery shroud. Not far from Lumian and Lado Gyaro, Mad Lady and Mr. K found themselves in the beehive-like metal room, unable to enter the hall ahead. Surveying the surroundings, Mr. K's gaze swept across the incubating baiting's black insect, little devils, and other creatures. He nodded in satisfaction. It's indeed the power of an evil god, spawn of an evil god. Well done, Lumian. Well done. This is all part of God's arrangement. Amidst the hoarse voice, the Aurora Order Oracle turned his gaze back to Mad Lady. Mad Lady wasn't intimidated. Instead, she applauded in agreement with Mr. K. She spoke as if they were on different frequencies. That's right, it's cool, right? This is a spaceship. In the next moment, Mad Lady and Mr. K vanished simultaneously and reappeared behind where the other party had been standing, as if they had negotiated a position switch beforehand. Chapter 584 Helper Inside the underwater spaceship, in the Silvery Hall. Lumian, enveloped by crimson, nearly white flames, transformed into a fireball and hurtled towards Ultraman Lado Gyaro. The key April Fool's member remained composed. Holding his breath, he thrust forward with his left palm. Lumian instantly sensed an invisible force resisting him, causing the blazing crimson fireball to decelerate abruptly, akin to a trapped insect in transparent amber. Seizing the moment, Lado Gyaro raised his right hand, clenching it into a fist. A ball of blazing white pure sunlight condensed and compressed, swiftly morphing into a thick, formidable laser aimed at Lumian, fused with the crimson near-white fireball. This ability resulted from merging the sun pathway and the sea boon, utilizing the power of the sun pathway to propel the sea boon's weakening ray. Though it no longer altered the target's body gradually, causing various negative symptoms, its penetration and melting effects were significantly enhanced, capable of directly injuring or even killing the target. In the enclosed, poisonous gas-filled environment with the constant threat of malice, Lado Gyaro sought to conclude the battle swiftly rather than wait for Lumian Li to weaken gradually. Thus, he opted for Sun Ray instead of weakening Ray. 
At laser speed, sun rays struck the crimson fireball, melting a substantial hole into it. The fireball lost its structural integrity and exploded, scattering like rain. Yet, Lumian was nowhere among the remnants. He seemed to have vanished into thin air. Simultaneously, behind Ultraman Lado Biaro, Lumian's figure, adorned with the lie earring, swiftly materialized. Initially, Lumian transformed into a fireball and soared towards Lado Biaro, intending to force him into using Beyonder powers and counterattack. This allowed him to fix his original location, not shifting prematurely, creating an opportunity to teleport behind the target in the fireball state for a surprise attack. Having faced Bestowed of the Sea before, Lumian was aware of Lado Biaro's ability to manipulate the weight or flotation of objects using the power of the land and stars altering their speed. To successfully use Spirit World Traversal in his fireball form, Lumian borrowed Lai's flame controlling ability. As his figure materialized, he promptly opened his mouth and hissed at Ultraman Lado Biaro, less than two meters away. Ha! A pale yellow beam, resembling gas, shot towards the April Fool's key member. Lado Biaro didn't have time to turn around, sensing the impending danger through his fate perception a skill obtained from deciphering the language of the stars beyond their powers. Specks of starlight emerged in his eyes. He identified several passages in the silver hall suffused with cerulean blue gases, imperceptible to ordinary humans. Hastily choosing one, he pounced over, a navigating ability bestowed by the sea. Simultaneously, uncertain of evading the attack from behind, Lado Giaro infused the surroundings with layers of golden light. This was the purification halo of a Sequence 5, Priest of Light of the Sun Pathway. Amidst the harumph, the pale yellow beam swept past Lado Biaro's back, hidden somewhere in the void. The key member of April Fools, codename Ultraman, fainted, but his momentum remained. He continued into the illusory passageway, hidden from ordinary eyes, traversing space and dimensions. Lumian, within two meters, couldn't teleport away in time and was enveloped by the purification halo. His heart ached, as if something sought to tear his body apart and crawl out. Faintly, he heard the illusory ravings of the entity known as Inevitability, Mr. Fool, or both. Unclear but unsettling, they made Lumian's brain feel pulled out of his skull by an invisible hand. Despite an ascetic's endurance, Lumian couldn't help but groan in pain. Collapsing to the ground, he curled up. A similar experience occurred in his quarter dream, a reaction after being sprinkled by Valentine's holy water. Lado Giaro's purification halo, an advanced sun halo, had evolved from harmless to a partial sun holy water effect. It could exorcise evil spirits and purify the evil power within a target's body. As Lado Giaro lay unconscious, the purification halo vanished in a flash, only partially dispelling the poisonous gas. Similarly, the unconscious Lado Giaro couldn't progress through the illusory passageway, breaking free and falling three to four meters in front of Lumian. The impact left him in pain, slowly regaining consciousness. At that moment, Lumian slowly recovered from the intense pain induced by the purification halo. Lado Giaro, just waking up and still uncertain of the situation, instinctively re entered the illusory passageway to increase the distance between himself and Lumian Lee. This move aimed to avoid another strike from Lumian's psychic piercing like ability or any other unforeseen attacks. Upon crawling back to the hall through the exit of the illusory passageway, Lumian had already raised his head and regained his composure, though his forehead was soaked in cold sweat. Observing this, Lado Giaro felt neither pity, disappointment, nor regret. Instead, he was pleasantly surprised. It's effective. Purification Halo is effective against Lumian Lee. After confirming that the adventurer Louis Berry was indeed Lumian Lee, Lado Giaro contemplated how to strategize if he were to engage in a battle with him. It was simple with the authority of the Governor of the Sea. He could repeatedly cast the other party into the cosmic void, making him lose himself over and over. Without the Governor of the Sea's authority, he had to consider how to exploit Lumian Lee's vulnerabilities. Lumian Li's unique characteristics were clear, possessing a sealing power of the same origin as the Celestial Worthy, with a high-ranking creature sealed within him. 
Beyonders in this state often had false high-level statuses and enjoyed numerous conveniences, but they were susceptible to the Sun Pathways abilities. Lado Gyaro wasn't certain about the effectiveness of the Sun Halo, Cleave of Purification, and other abilities, nor was he sure of the Purification Halo's potency. The only certainty lay in the effectiveness of the Sun Holy Water he could create. Therefore, if the Purification Halo proved ineffective against Lumian Li, he would swiftly produce Sun Holy Water and sprinkle it on him. Looking at Lumian, Lado Gyaro smiled, once again dyeing the surroundings golden as layer after layer spread out. This sealed environment was ideal for employing the Purification Halo. It denied Lumian Li a chance to distance himself or teleport closer. The entire hall was essentially enveloped by the Purification Halo. Furthermore, in the spaceship, there was no fear of Lumian Li losing control and transforming into a monster, unleashing the high-level creature within his body. An intruder at this level would inevitably trigger the spaceship's automatic defense system targeting him. Lado Gyaro might then seize control of the spaceship. Didn't your sister tell you something Emperor Roselle once said? If you rely on something to obtain specialness and become stronger, you will definitely be punished because of it. Upon seeing the surging layers of golden light, Lumian raised his right hand and vanished. Where is he teleporting to this time? As long as he's in the hall, he can't avoid the purification halo. Lado Gyaro watched the other party struggle with certainty and a smile. Unless Lumian Li chose to leave the hall, it was impossible for him not to be affected by the purification halo. With the spaceship's barrier raised, the door closed, and the place sealed and using the unique power of the sea, if he wanted to teleport out, he had to first destroy the surrounding walls or metal doors to create an exit. This was also advantageous for Lado Gyaro. No one knew what the spaceship would unleash in this hall next. Layer after layer of purification halos rapidly drowned Lumian's original location, but nothing happened. Lumian's figure was nowhere to be seen in the silver-white hall. W.H. Lado Gyaro's pupils constricted. Where did Lumian Li go? Is his teleportation ability unaffected by the sealed interior of the spaceship? Or has he gone into hiding? Lado Gyaro's heart skipped a beat, he extended his right hand and pulled. The void in the hall stirred, unveiling an abnormal area nestled between two walls, flanked by dark holes emitting cerulean blue gas. Creating an unstable space and hiding inside to avoid the purification halo? That's true. The purification halo's purpose is to exorcise, purify, warm, and provide courage. Without substantial offensive power, it can't destroy the structure of that space. Lumian Li actually possesses such an ability. Lado Gyaro quickly saw through Lumian's trick. Calmly raising his right hand, he condensed a penetrating dark green ray. Simultaneously, he harnessed his basic control over gravity to pull at the fabricated space. The dark green ray struck the spot where it had been pulled, instantly penetrating and obliterating the structure. Silently shattered, the dark green ray continued forward, hitting a silver-white full-body armor with its back turned to Lado Gyaro. The dark green ray, now weakened to a certain extent, faded away. The silver-white full-body armor suddenly pivoted, and two pairs of eyes appeared to lock onto Lado Gyaro from within the vacant helmet. In the next moment, it charged toward the April Fool's key member, forming a broadsword of light in its hand. As the silver-white full-body armor rushed out, Lumian's figure emerged in the corner. He had utilized the terrain there to arrange a simple bottle of fiction, using the large hole that emitted poisonous gas as a symbolic window. His goal was twofold, first, to evade the influence of the purification halo, and second, to position the pride armor with its back facing Lado Gyaro. Yes, this cursed armor might only target someone standing a certain distance behind it, but it might not. What if that person not only stood more than 10 meters behind it but also attempted to attack it by stabbing it in the back? The answer was clear. Now, Lumian had a capable helper unafraid of the purification halo. Chapter 585 Repeated Betrayal at a distance of just over 10 meters, the pride armor covered the ground in two powerful strides, positioning itself in front of Ultraman Lado Gyaro. 
a broadsword, condensed from radiant light, slashed down with deadly precision. Lado Giaro had a momentary opportunity to utilize his navigator ability, escape through hidden passageways in the void and dimensions, and evade the impending attack. However, the sight of the silver-white full-body armor caught him off guard, he hadn't anticipated an aggressive move before Lumian Li could even don the armor. This momentary hesitation cost him. The silver-white full-body armor, resembling a relentless steam locomotive, collided with him before he could vanish into the hidden tunnel. By then, it was too late, and the looming threat of being cleaved apart became imminent, a grim fate of upper and lower halves separated. In this dire circumstance, he was no earthworm with regenerative abilities, his fate seemed sealed. Facing the approaching silver-white armor and its raised broadsword of light, scales formed from starlight protruded from various parts of Lado Giaro's body. The air quivered around him, as if an invisible tide were roaring, amplifying the tension. As per the intel gathered on April Fools, the power derived from the sea without the governor of the sea's authority corresponded to a sequence five at most, known as Tidal Scholar, the current state of Lado Giaro. Enveloped by an ethereal tide, Lado Giaro swung his fist, resembling a colossal wave crashing down. Thud! His formidable punch collided with the side of the broadsword of light, forcefully diverting its trajectory. Simultaneously, Lumian materialized behind him, left hand raised. Indeed. I knew you'd seize this chance to teleport behind me and launch a sneak attack. Lado Giaro was ready. Evading the silver-white full-body armor's second strike, he imbued the surroundings in a warm golden hue. Purification Halo As layers of golden light surged towards Lumian, he deftly twisted his left wrist. Even before that, the silver-white lie earring on his left earlobe emitted a subtle glow, revealing various blobs of light and colors on Ultraman's body. Among them, a golden ball emitted a warm glow, the representation of the purification halo ability. With a flick of his wrist, the golden ball detached from Ultraman's body and swiftly flew to Lumian. Steel Lumian successfully stole Ultraman's purification halo. The number of times the Ring of the Sea Queen could steal after the standard process remained unknown to Lumian. However, he was certain that Lai's stealing effect persisted for half a month, unaffected by his stealing of the sea's power. After Lai's transformation on the ancestral altar in Milo Village, Lumian diligently experimented with steel, honing his proficiency to ensure he could deploy it effectively in critical moments. Thus, he had become relatively adept at stealing and dispersing the power of the sea. Simultaneously, Ultraman's Beyonder powers of the Sun Pathway were well documented by the Tarot Club's information, making Lumian fully aware of what he aimed to steal this time. With a solid foundation in mysticism knowledge, he felt prepared. However, the challenge lay in his lack of experience stealing a Priest of Light's abilities. He feared that locating the corresponding symbols for purification halo and holy water creation might take too long, leaving him vulnerable to Lado Giaro's attacks. Anticipating the Pride Armor's frontal assault, Lumian strategically teleported four to five meters behind Lado Giaro, enticing him to use purification halo. The distinction between the abilities Lumian used and those he refrained from was clear, providing him with instant recognition. Before initiating the teleport, he activated the lie earring and raised his left hand, ensuring he didn't linger in the dangerous area for a moment longer. The purification halo, despite being stolen, persisted and continued to surge, enveloping Lumian. However, it didn't reach its intended target. A formidable formless force emanated from Lumian's body, acting as a barrier that thwarted the encroaching halo. The power of the sea. You have the power of the sea, and so do I. During the steel process, Lumian had reserved a portion of the sea's power for himself. Although not on par with Ultraman's, it proved sufficient to repel the purification halo for a brief moment. Calmly activating the black mark on his right shoulder, Lumian vanished from the warm golden area, teleporting to the farthest corner from Lado Giaro. The purification halo pursued relentlessly, but it reached its limit, visibly weakening. Reacting swiftly, Lumian harnessed the power of the sea once more, watching as the warm golden barrier rapidly dissipated. Meanwhile, Lado Giaro's heart skipped a beat. 
Intuitively, he sensed the loss of his purification halo ability, suspecting it had been stolen. Lumian Lee's item with the steel effect is still operational? Lado Gyaro couldn't dwell on it. Dodging the pride armor's heavy slashes, he fell to the ground, rolling to evade the attacks. Facing the sky, he raised his right hand, clenching it. Pure and blazing sunlight condensed rapidly, forming a thick ray that struck the silver-white armor's chest. It paused momentarily, unable to penetrate, only burning and dissolving into tottering black marks. Witnessing this and recognizing Lumian Lee as his adversary, Ultraman Lado Gyaro entertained the idea of fleeing. He decided to disengage, cease the confrontation, and seek an escape route. At that critical moment, instead of launching a barrage of attacks, the pride armor shifted its focus toward Lumian. Lumian, who had previously utilized Spirit World Traversal on the betrothal ship and within the hall, found himself affected once again by the purification halo. His spirituality teetered on the brink of depletion, leaving him visibly fatigued and weakened. Any ordinary human in such a state near the pride armor would face indiscriminate attacks. W.H. Lado Gyaro keenly perceived the shift in dynamics. Though unaware of the specifics, he sensed an advantage. Rising abruptly, he directed his attention to Lumian. In the next instant, the pride armor raised its radiant broadsword and charged towards Lumian. Ha! Ah, your sealed artifact has betrayed you. Lado Gyaro mocked internally as he closed in, intending to exploit the silver white full body armor's attack to create sun holy water and sprinkle it on Lumian Lee. Undeterred, Lumian took a resolute step forward. Tapping into his ascetic powers, the accumulated strength and spirituality within his body surged, replenishing his drained spirit. His body underwent a sudden transformation growing by seven to eight centimeters and bulking up by two sizes, causing his loosely fitting deputy host's robe to strain. The advancing pride armor abruptly halted, pivoting to face Lado Gyaro, who had followed closely. Lado Gyaro's pupils contracted, and an instant heaviness enveloped his body, bringing him to a natural halt. Simultaneously, his gaze locked onto the unusually tall figure of Lumian Lee. The enemy teleported right in front of him, mere inches away. Their eyes locked, reflecting each other in an intense confrontation. With a swift whoosh, Lumian swung his right hand, adorned with the flawed boxing gloves, through the air. Lado Gyaro's heavy state naturally exerted a suction force on his surroundings, a downgraded version of the humanoid sealed artifact's characteristic. Lumian's punch encountered no repulsion, instead, it accelerated towards its target. Unperturbed by the close-range attacks, Lado Gyaro harbored concerns about Lumian's psychic piercing ability. Unable to dodge or employ other abilities in time, he unleashed a retaliatory fist resembling a thousand tons of seawater, causing the sound of surging tides to echo. Bang! Lado Gyaro blocked Lumian's attack and swiftly rolled to the side, evading a surprise assault from the pride armor. At that moment, a strong sense of greed surged within him, overshadowing his initial plan to escape. Seizing the opportunity, Lumian retreated and retrieved a black bone flute with red holes from his traveler's bag. Symphony of Hatred While Lado Gyaro resisted the pride armor, Lumian brought the flute to his mouth and played a sharp, intense melody. Lado Gyaro's mind buzzed, freezing him in place. Bright blood oozed from the cracks in the starlight scales on his body. Emotional detonation. Pfft. The pride armor struck Lado Gyaro's shoulder, splintering scales, bone, and flesh. Closing the distance with two brisk strides, Lumian approached the nearly collapsed Lado Gyaro, his face twisted in pain. He raised the black bone flute in his hand. In the moment that Lado Gyaro used the pain from the pride armor strike to break free from the detonated emotions, he witnessed Lumian Lee thrusting the bone flute toward him with a fierce expression. Pfft. The bone flute effortlessly pierced Lado Gyaro's left eye, akin to cutting through butter. The eyeball of April Fool's key member exploded, and a gruesome mix of blood and other fluids streamed out through the gaps in the black bone flute. Even if the symphony of hatred only struck an ordinary part, it was tantamount to hitting a vital point. Striking a true vital point meant either instant death or a prolonged period of social death. 
In this case, Lado Giaro's left eye and brain were undeniably vital points. His remaining eye widened and protruded, life force rapidly draining as he slumped to the ground. Lumian seized Ultraman's neck, lifting him up. Releasing his right hand, which held the black bone flute, he delivered a heavy slap to Lado Giaro's face. With a fierce expression, he growled an intision, Did you go to Kordu village to confirm the situation? Chapter 586, Gnawing Ultraman Lado Giaro, his life rapidly slipping away, fell into a daze. Even his thoughts of self-preservation became blurred. In the haze, he vaguely saw Juan Oro, the wrinkled old man, standing in the middle of the sea, waving with a mix of joy and mockery. At that moment, Lumian's voice resonated from the horizon, faint, ethereal, and elusive. Did you go to Korda Village to confirm the situation? Korda Village? The Time Mad Lady and I visited Nolfi, and went there just out of convenience. Lado Giaro lost focus, and Lumian's figure reflected in his closed eye. With the intent to annoy, he spoke his last words in Highlander. I've been there. With Mad Lady. It was. Simply for fun. But Loki. Seemed to. Have ulterior. Don't you want to know what happened back then? Sure, I'll speak in Highlander. It's your problem if you don't understand. Your fault for not taking this language seriously in the past. Lado Giaro knew his actions wouldn't practically affect Lumian Lee. This was because Lumian Lee could find someone to perform dream divination, hypnosis, or undergo a real dream when he returned. From there, he could memorize the Highlander he spoke and find a way to translate it into Intision or Ancient Faceac. Still, he just wanted to annoy the other party. About to die, he couldn't care less about future developments. Motives Lado Giaro uttered his last word as his life extinguished. In that final moment, he seemed to hear Lumian Lee speaking to him in Highlander, Thank you. The thank you flowed naturally, carrying a strong sense of mockery. Ultraman Lado Giaro's intact eye bulged even more, his expression freezing on his face, his breath coming to a complete halt. Lumian's right hand gripped the symphony of hatred once more. Simultaneously, he released his left hand, watching Ultraman's key member's head rapidly detach from the black bone flute with red holes, revealing a sinister and deep blood red hole. Thud! Ultraman collapsed to the ground. The sticky blood on the black bone flute coalesced and dripped onto his body. After the person who had backstabbed it suffered a fatal wound, pride armor stopped moving and stood nearby, resembling an ordinary silver-white full-body armor without any special characteristics. Loki had ulterior motives? A motive other than helping the sinners and pulling a prank? As Lumian recalled Ultraman's confession before his death, he bent down to check what items this April Fool's key member had. Of course, he didn't hold much hope. Ultraman Lado Giaro had disguised himself as the incoming governor of the sea, Simon Giaro, to board the betrothal ship. Carrying no items, his belongings should have been handed over to Mad Lady, allowing her to conceal them using flesh and blood magic in his stomach. However, Mad Lady clearly didn't have the time or opportunity to return the items to Ultraman. This was one of the reasons why Lumian could eliminate Ultraman, a powerful dual pathway beyond her, in such a short period. If Juan Oro hadn't tipped off the sea spawn on the bridal boat beforehand, Lumian would have been forced to stash his traveler's bag temporarily with Mr. K. At that moment, Lumian observed a strange transformation in the corpse of Ultraman Lado Giaro. It swiftly faded, morphing into a semi-translucent, semi-flesh state. Then, like it was being disintegrated by countless tiny creatures, it oozed into the silver metal floor and gradually vanished. Soon, the remnants of flesh, starlight, and sun-like fragments left by Lado Giaro were absorbed by the silver metallic floor, leaving behind only a sea governor ceremonial robe, shrouded in a faint grayish-white fog. In the blink of an eye, the grayish-white fog got absorbed by the silver metallic floor and the mysterious structure. Lumian attempted unsuccessfully to reclaim something. Is this what it means to return to the sea? But why did this peculiar structure absorb the Priest of Lights beyond her characteristic? 
Just as Lung Mian pondered, the sound of metal grinding surrounded him. The pitch black holes in the surrounding walls, ceiling, and floor once again got concealed by rotating, protruding metal. No more cerulean blue poisonous gas spewed out, saving Lumian the energy to engulf his body in a layer of crimson, almost white flames. Amidst the clanking sounds, two metallic doors ascended, revealing two tunnels leading to different destinations. With the target of the betrayal now gone, the silver gray behemoth reverted to its normal state. Lumian peered into the depths of the tunnel ahead, his heart involuntarily racing. Ba dump! Ba dump! He felt inexplicably nervous and uneasy. In Port Santa, the apartment Loki was hiding. The moment Ludwig declared, I'm hungry, he swiftly bowed his head and sank his teeth into Loki's hand, gripping the gemstone bracelet as if devouring the marrow from a chicken wing. An intense wave of pain surged through Loki's mind. His immediate instinct was to deploy paper figurine substitutes, a desperate attempt to break free from the current situation. Yet, he hesitated, fearing that such a move might create an insurmountable distance between him and the sealed demigod, eliminating any chance of regaining control. Amidst the gruesome symphony of bones crunching and flesh tearing, Loki snatched the falling gemstone bracelet with his free hand and forcibly pried open his mouth. Bang! A rush of air slammed into Ludwig's head, akin to a bullet fired from the latest steam rifle, ripping through flesh and hair to reveal a ghastly white skull. However, Ludwig remained unfazed. Gnawing on Loki's left hand, he had already severed five fingers and devoured half of the palm. Bang! 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 Air bullets relentlessly pounded the boy, leaving him mangled and disfigured. Yet, Ludwig persisted in his attentive nibbling on Loki. Crack! Crack! He had already crunched down on the other party's wrist bone, a crisp sound echoing through their intertwined flesh. As Loki nearly blacked out from the pain, he roughly grasped what was happening. The sealed demigod possessed incredible vitality. Ordinary attacks and beyonder powers couldn't cause significant harm. In simpler terms, he could put him to sleep or manipulate his spirit body threads to knock him out, but killing him with regular means proved challenging. It couldn't even seriously injure him. In such circumstances, even if the sealed demigod couldn't utilize any abilities, lacking sufficient strength and speed, merely devouring the other party's flesh and bones with all his might posed an abnormal challenge for many mid-sequence beyonders. Loki abandoned the idea of retrieving other mystical items and substituted himself with a paper figurine. Swoosh! 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 Ludwig, his head covered in signs of air bullet destruction and almost devoid of human form, raised his head. Beside his bloodstained mouth was a piece of white paper that quickly swept into his mouth alongside the blood-colored flesh. Ludwig's eyes reflected Loki's outline in the corner of the room. Something beneath his torn skin and flesh seemed to squirm slowly, attempting to break free, but to no avail. Loki assessed the situation and the items on him. With the soul assurer marionette unable to return in time, he sensibly chose not to confront the sealed demigod creature. He would flee first before considering the future. At that moment, a crimson moonlight streamed through the window. The moonlight bathed the apartment, wrapping around Loki. Loki heard a fleeting voice. A strong smell of blood. As the moonlight faded, a grayish-white and pitch-black paper figurine appeared on the ground. Loki's figure materialized a few hundred meters away, outside a vine forest. It was a boon bestowed by the Celestial Worthy during a prayer some weeks before this operation. It had been attached to a pre-prepared paper figurine, forming such a potent substitute that bordered on godhood. Drip, drip. Blood still dripped from Loki's bitten left wrist. He activated the diamond on the bracelet and swiftly faded away, preparing to teleport. Port Santa, Milo Village. Tap, tap, tap. The soft patter of footsteps reverberated in Bard's ears, causing him to tense. Bard surveyed his surroundings, finding nothing amiss. He sprinted, weaving through several buildings, yet the rhythmic tapping of footsteps persisted behind him. Attempting to force open a door and seek refuge in a villager's house in Milo Village, Bard was met with an unexpected sight. 
instead of the familiar kitchen, tables, chairs, and household items, his eyes beheld a decrepit stone platform enveloped in darkness. The stone platform. Bard's pupils widened, as if he had entered an unreal illusion. He found himself back at the residence of the governor of the sea and the altar where Milo Village's inhabitants paid homage to their ancestor. Something crawled out from a crack in the worn stone platform. A translucent worm, adorned with multiple rings, swiftly expanded, transforming into a young man donned in the attire of a sea prayer ritual's deputy host, monocle in place. Seated on the weathered stone platform, the man grinned at Bard. Do you comprehend? Bard suddenly grasped the meaning behind the question. Swallowing hard, he replied, understood. Since the altar had an owner and beyond her creatures residing there, the so-called rule that it could only be enchanted once a year for the Ring of the Sea Queen clearly didn't hold true. The other party could have fixed the power as many times as desired. The young man, clad in a dark blue deputy host's sacrificial robe, toyed with the monocle in his right eye and smirked. Over a millennium, I've molded the rule that the steel ability can only be conferred once a year. Little did I expect to deceive you all in the end. Chapter 587 Deceived Upon hearing the young man's words, Bard felt his blood rush to his head. Crafting a seemingly valid rule over a millennium to deceive others? What kind of lame antique swindler is this? Bard blurted out, the patterns on the altar and the surrounding arrangements are also fake? The young man in the dark blue deputy host robe chuckled. If it wasn't real, would you have been deceived? Furthermore, I occasionally venture out. When I do, it grants steel powers on my behalf. Of course, with the spirituality produced by the surrounding worshippers, it can indeed only bestow once a year. As the young man spoke, the smile on his face widened. Bard's forehead throbbed as he listened, feeling like he had been mocked. According to the other party's claim that the steel powers could be bestowed at will, the Ring of the Sea Queen should have been complete and equipped with all its functions. So, why did the success of the Sea Prayer ritual experience such a significant delay? Unable to comprehend the situation, Bard turned around and sprinted towards the exit. It wasn't that he hadn't considered begging for mercy and surrendering on the spot, but these things could be done later. For now, he wanted to take a gamble, betting that the other party's claim of occasionally venturing out was a lie. In essence, he believed he was trapped in the altar, unable to venture anywhere and influence the people around him. If he allowed himself to be intimidated and didn't dare to escape, he would fall into the other party's trap, cheated of his freedom and future. Thud. 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 Bard reached the staircase in a few steps and ran up. The more he ran, the happier he became. The monocle-wearing young man didn't stop him. I made the right bet. He's the core of that altar. There's no way to leave. Thud. 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 Bard witnessed the scene on the first floor illuminated by sunlight. Amidst his ecstasy, his thoughts suddenly shattered. He felt the darkness around him being pierced by the light, shattering into pieces. Bard bolted upright, alarmed to find himself lying in the servant's room at the governor of the sea's residence. He hadn't left. He surveyed his surroundings and heard cheers and crackers from outside. I just had a dream? Did it stem from a spirituality warning, helping me discover a problem with the plan? As Bard pondered these thoughts, he immediately dismissed the corresponding judgment. No, how could I have fallen asleep during the sea prayer ritual? Did I start dreaming after hearing soft footsteps in my room? Bard rolled to his feet, slung his backpack over his shoulders, and tentatively pushed open the door, entering the corridor. No longer smug with the plan that required minimal risks or combat, Bard realized he couldn't share in the distribution of items. He couldn't teleport away directly, nor could he return to his original appearance or disguise himself as someone else. Upon reaching the corridor, Bard noticed the little devils leaving the shadows and performing a strange celebratory dance. He hadn't communicated with these sea spawn and knew their intelligence was roughly equivalent to that of ordinary dogs. They could be tamed and controlled, but direct communication was beyond them. 
However, the amazing thing was that little devils had the ability to record and recreate human words, even if they weren't sure of their meanings. Moreover, they could receive signals from their collaborators within a 100-meter radius. The little devils ignored Bart as well. The sea prayer ritual had succeeded. According to their prior agreement, the fake governor of the sea could leave on his own. Bard left the governor of the sea's residence and realized that the guards at the entrance weren't kneeling to thank the boon like before. The villagers of Milo village at the docks were the same. Apart from a few who sincerely shouted that the sea prayer ritual had succeeded, the rest merely echoed what was happening and expressed their joy, with many preferring to release crackers. Indeed, it was a dream. The villagers' reactions in the dream were too exaggerated. I should know that based on past experiences with sea prayer rituals, only the committee members of the Fisheries Guild and a few people with strong sea bloodlines can sense the arrival of the sea's boon. Others with sea bloodlines wouldn't have a tangible sense. They'd slowly realize they've become stronger, or the changes are too weak to detect. Otherwise, the failure of the sea prayer ritual last year wouldn't have escaped the notice of Port Santa's citizens and would have only circulated within the core circle. Bard used the environment to quickly confirm the essence of his previous encounter. He didn't dare relax, nor did he again head to the docks to admire the villagers being fooled. Instead, he turned to the road leading to Port Santa's city district. Just as he stepped out of the ancient village, Bard spotted a figure ahead. The man stood over 2.4 meters tall, clad in a simple linen robe and a hood, holding a thick staff. Gandalf. Bard's heart tightened as he shouted. With the dream just now, he thought he had been exposed, so he didn't pull off any act. Gandalf, the president of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society, was taken aback and let out a deep chuckle. You're really fake. He, he's not sure of my identity. Bard was taken aback, wishing he could slap himself. Inside the underwater spaceship, in a metallic room reminiscent of a beehive. Having failed to capture Mad Lady twice in a row, Mr. K's body underwent a sudden transformation, expanding to nearly three meters in height. Fortunately, he wasn't adorned in actual clothes. The blood-colored cloak draped over him had morphed from his flesh and blood. Otherwise, even the loose robe would have succumbed to the drastic change. Concurrently, Mr. K's skin darkened, assuming the appearance of thick and formidable armor. Crooked goat horns adorned with sinister patterns sprouted from his head, and a pair of bat-like wings, encircled in crimson and blue flames, emerged from his back. A pungent smell of sulfur hung in the air. Being a Sequence 5 shepherd of the secret suppliant pathway, Mr. K possessed the core ability of grazing. This allowed him to fuse other people's souls with beyonder characteristics or boon powers and utilize them uniquely. It was akin to grazing lambs for a deity. Each shepherd could graze up to seven souls, controlling only one at a time. In this state, shepherds could employ their beyonder abilities and three abilities corresponding to the souls. These were chosen during grazing and remained fixed thereafter. The most formidable aspect of shepherds was their ability to graze demigod-level spirits, enabling them to contend with saints for a limited duration. Presently, Mr. K was using a grazed devil. He had selected Devil Transformation, Sulfur Fireball, and Soar of Lava in the past. Mr. K deliberately chose to forego Devil's most distinctive danger premonition because he believed it to be effective only when commanding the Devil's spirit. Under normal circumstances, he couldn't activate grazing continuously. In any case, if grave danger loomed, a divine revelation would be provided by God. Failure to receive such guidance indicated wrongdoing, warranting divine punishment. As the expansive bat wings on Mr. K's back unfolded, light blue fireballs condensed, numbering almost twenty. They indiscriminately bombarded every corner of the metallic beehive, creating an all-encompassing barrage to counter Mad Lady's elusive flashes throughout the space. Rumble The explosion, a mix of fire and poison, wreaked havoc on the metallic hive tearing apart the incubating baiting's black insect, little devils, and other creatures. Mad Lady abruptly halted as the sulfur fireball condensed. 
cloaked in a blood-colored dress, with grotesque flesh lumps on her face, an illusory, slowly flipping book materialized in her eyes. Faint recitations echoed around her. Drawing a dagger, she genuflected and drove it into the metal floor of the hive. Dawn-like light ascended, forming an almost invisible wall around her. Rumble. The shockwaves from the sulfur fireball's explosion and the poisonous pale blue fireball relentlessly struck the invisible barrier, causing it to sway, yet it stood resilient. This was protection of a warrior sequence 5. Record, the core ability of a sequence 6 scribe of the apprentice pathway, allowed the recording of others' abilities for use, each recording usable only once. Scribes could even record beyond their powers with godhood effects, but the success rate was minimal. After the explosion's aftershocks subsided, Mr. K, donned in a blood-colored cloak and resembling a colossal devil, wielded a broadsword composed of crimson lava and pale blue flames. He surged towards Mad Lady in two steps, slashing down. The nearly invisible wall around Mad Lady couldn't withstand the onslaught and finally shattered. As the illusory book in her eyes flipped, a robust and sharp sword of dawn materialized in her hand. Excitedly, she swung her two-handed light sword. Clang! Mr. K's strike sent Mad Lady, lacking a warrior's physique and strength, flying. Though Mr. K hadn't anticipated her determination to engage in close combat despite her limitations, the battle's tempo remained unaffected. He advanced, wielding the lava broadsword once again. Poof! The mad lady he struck suddenly thinned, transforming into a paper figurine consumed by sulfurous flames. Paper figurine substitutes. Mad lady reappeared beside a demolished metal hive, her illusory book flipping once more. She then stretched her arms, allowing a pure and magnificent blazing pillar of light to descend from the sky and strike Mr. K, who had attacked the paper effigy. Priest of Light's Light of Holiness Chapter 588, Degree of Madness Mr. K shifted instantaneously, tapping into the grazed traveler's soul. His eyes took on an otherworldly glow, as if concealing doors to different realms. His form faded, and in an instant, a luminous white column surrounded by flames emerged, shrouding him within its fiery embrace. In the ensuing moment, Mr. K, stripped of his devil guise, materialized in a corner of the metallic beehive. His form liquefied, his flesh resembling dripping candle wax. The secret suppliant pathway symbolized corruption, its influence curtailed by the sun pathway's capabilities. Half-melted flesh and blood cascaded onto the metal floor, seeping into it in a bizarre manner. Soon, it was absorbed by the spaceship Mad Lady had earlier detailed. Even Mr. K felt the weight of an unseen force, as if an invisible hand pressed him down. His attempts to extricate himself from the metallic floor proved futile, and he continued sinking gradually. Mad Lady, with grayish-green eyes gleaming, teleported near Mr. K. Despite his blood-colored wax-drenched visage, Mr. K faced Mad Lady without a trace of fear. His focus remained fixed on the evil god's aura emanating from the metal hive, his ultimate target. He switched the grazed soul to an arbiter pathway beyond her, with two bolts of lightning gathering in the depths of his darkened eyes. Psychic Piercing Mad Lady refrained from teleporting. The illusory book within her eyes flipped open, revealing the kaleidoscope of colors on Mr. K's body and the shifting hues of light during his grazed soul transitions. Excitement illuminated Mad Lady's face. Raising her right hand, she prepared to delicately twist it clockwise. Steel. This was an ability she had recorded from Bard. A sudden, intriguing notion captivated Mad Lady's thoughts. She yearned to witness the aftermath of stealing the grazing ability from a shepherd. It was crucial to understand that her steel ability was limited to just one from a target, devoid of any connections to the abilities that came with it. In essence, after snatching the grazing ability, the soul, characteristics, and powers under grazing's influence would persist within Mr. K's body. In this state, Mad Lady pondered whether shepherds would grapple with internal conflicts, the fusion of characteristics, or a loss of control akin to the switching between non-adjacent pathways. Excitement bubbled within Mad Lady as she deliberately blinked near Mr. K, 
compelling him to switch grazed souls. She observed keenly, eager to discern which light aligned with grazing. As for Mr. K's reaction, she cared little. You continue your fight, I continue my steel. Whoever dies first loses. Simultaneously, the metal floor, saturated with Mr. K's flesh, quivered unexpectedly. A previously concealed door within the metal hive withdrew, unveiling a passageway that hinted at a silver metallic hall beyond. A formidable suction force emanated from that direction. While her attempt to steal Mr. K's grazing ability was underway, Mad Lady, lacking the strength, was propelled into the air. Dark blonde hair whipped around wildly as she soared toward the origin of the anomaly. Meanwhile, Mr. K remained locked to the metal floor. Though his body swayed precariously, on the verge of being pulled away, he held his ground, unsteady yet resilient. The face of the blood-colored wax-streaked Aurora Order Oracle betrayed an anxious expression. The enemy was on the verge of escape. The source of the evil god corruption had revealed itself. Mr. K swiftly switched back to the corresponding devil spirit, summoning a broadsword forged from crimson lava and pale blue flames. Targeting his body adhered to the metal floor, he executed a slashing motion. Beneath his calf, flesh promptly separated from his main body, the incision undergoing a mesmerizing melding of half-melting and half-reforming. Having relinquished a portion of his flesh, Mr. K allowed pale white, moist, and freshly formed limbs to squirm out from the severed stump. Concurrently, he harnessed the formidable suction force to pursue Mad Lady and draw closer to the source of corruption. In midair, he witnessed Lun Mian, disguised, clutching the door frame in a struggle against the menacing suction. He observed the motionless silver-white full-body armor seamlessly blending with the floor. Mad Lady surged ahead, on the verge of flying past Lun Mian. With a wave of her right hand, she emitted a greeting-like hello, her face radiating excitement and anticipation. Lun Mian's pupils constricted. Disregarding his precarious state, he harumphed. Two beams of white light shot forth from his nostrils, accurately aimed at Mad Lady but influenced by the tangible and enigmatic suction force. They bent and plunged deeper into the tunnel. At that moment, Lumian's grip on the silver metal door frame neared its breaking point, blood seeping from the strain. Faintly, he sensed an abundance of flesh and skin deep within the tunnel, intertwining to shape a colossal structure resembling a pear-shaped bird's nest. Suspended in midair, fleshy ropes, as thick as two or three adult arms and covered in a translucent membrane, extended, linking the distant wall, the ceiling above, and the metal on the ground. Within these flesh and blood tendrils, specks of starlight and a mysterious dark substance flowed into the massive pear-shaped object. The bird's nest-like structure was contracting inward, its various parts deeply sunken, delineating lines that hinted at a substantial disk. The terrifying suction force, capable of manipulating both reality and mystery, emanated from this pear-shaped object composed of skin, flesh, and blood. At that moment, the outlines on the pear-shaped object quivered, and all the indentations bulged and expanded. With this transformation, fragments of starlight spilled from the fleshy bird's nest, rushing into every cabin within the spaceship. This event resembled the prior two releases of the sea's power, yet lacked the grandeur and vastness, lacking the potential to rend apart anyone obstructing its path. Lumian could already envision the repetitive expulsion, understanding that the silver-gray behemoth had amassed a power capable of threatening the seal. Year after year, it required the extraction of this accumulated pressure. As the abundance of starlight scattered, the formidable suction force dissipated. With two thuds, Mad Lady and Mr. K collided with the ground. One found herself in the tunnel leading to the fleshy bird's nest, while the other lay in the silver hall where Lumian and Ultraman had previously battled. Lumian released his grip, landing on the ground. His gaze swiftly fixated on the April Fool's key member, adorned with clumps of flesh and blood on her face. Mad Lady sprang up, exclaiming to him and Mr. K, Did you see that? Did you see that? That's an incubating deity. Yes, it should be a deity. Despite the intense fluctuations in Mad Lady's emotions, Mr. K discerned no sincerity in her tone. Her mention of deity sounded more like powerful and terrifying monster, a mere description. 
In the next instant, Lumian materialized behind Mad Lady, who promptly vanished on the spot, blinking closer to where the starlight had scattered. Lumian, sensing danger instinctively, felt his heart quicken involuntarily. He hesitated to delve too deeply into the tunnel, avoiding proximity to the flesh and blood bird's nest he had vaguely seen before. Unimaginable horrors were certain to unfold. However, Mad Lady sprinted in that direction. Let her venture deeper and potentially meet her end? Lumian's thoughts raced, torn between decisions. Another second passed, and Mr. K teleported in front of Lumian, fervently pursuing Mad Lady. In that moment, Lumian, who had often considered himself a bit eccentric, found himself yearning for a bit more normalcy from the duo ahead of him. While he could comprehend Mr. K's choices and actions, rooted in unwavering faith in God and the pursuit of divine will, coupled with a hint of extremism, Mad Lady's conduct exceeded his expectations. Drawing from I know someone's confession and Mad Lady's previous behavior, Lumian detected no signs of her fanatical devotion to the celestial worthy. Simultaneously, due to the ongoing conflict between the celestial worthy and Mr. Fool, she couldn't always rely on protection. This raised a question for Lumian. If Mad Lady consistently courted danger, how had she managed to survive to this day? April Fools lacked the strict hierarchy and coordination seen in the Aurora Order. Most of the time, members operated independently with minimal interaction. Protecting Mad Lady from the start, allowing her to grow steadily with such a mindset, seemed implausible. Could it be that I know someone had once overseen the treatment of Mad Lady's mental and psychological issues? After his demise, did Mad Lady's problems exacerbate? Lumian quickly formulated a plausible explanation, but considering Mad Lady's conduct on the betrothal ship, her current state struck him as abnormal. On the betrothal ship, faced with the impending release of the sea's power in the energy passageway, Mad Lady, though eager and seeking excitement, had an escape route. As long as she didn't delay until the last moment, she could teleport away, avoiding the actual risk of death. Now, whatever lurked in the depths of the tunnel made Lumian, despite his feigned high level, intuitively uneasy. He believed it represented an almost certain death sentence. Yet, Mad Lady persisted in her attempt to approach. Could there be a reason compelling her to make contact with that object? Lumian wondered. He suspected that Mad Lady's actions might be part of the Celestial Worthy scheme, convincing her that she could confront the provocation head-on and escape in time. I can't let her and that Celestial Worthy succeed. Besides, personally, I look forward to ending her myself rather than witnessing her being swallowed by that dangerous object. Lumian's eyes narrowed, the desire to teleport forward and intercept Mad Lady compelling him. However, preventing a traveler from reaching a specific location in such a manner was clearly impossible. Lumian hesitated, unwilling to genuinely approach the flesh and blood birds nest deep within the tunnel. Suddenly, an idea struck him. The peculiar structure's rejection of outsiders seems to have lifted, and with Lado Giaro, a person possessing a potent sea bloodline, deceased. Could I attempt to gain temporary authority as the governor of the sea to halt Mad Lady's progress? With that in mind, Lumian embarked on his endeavor. Activating the power of the sea within him, he allowed his astral projection to merge and swiftly expand outward. Chapter 589, Object Within the Nest As Lumian's astral projection expanded with the power of the sea, he immediately sensed the presence of the waters. This wasn't a genuine ocean but a fantastical sea created by radiant starlight. At its core lay the projection of the silver-gray behemoth. Empowered by an ample supply of the sea's power, Lumian's astral projection surged forward, merging seamlessly with the phantom. A burning sensation radiated from the left side of his chest, as if some form of acknowledgement had been received. His consciousness extended boundlessly, taking command of the dreamlike illusory sea. In the course of this process, he glimpsed the phantoms of Juan Oro, Ultraman Lado Giaro, and unfamiliar apparitions. Those who have returned to the sea. They seem to have transformed into water droplets in the sea. Lumian withdrew his gaze from the joyful Juan Oro and the pained Lado Giaro, redirecting it toward the depths of the tunnel ahead. 
From a considerable distance, he spotted Mad Lady. The silver-gray behemoth harbored entities nurtured within the flesh and blood bird's nest. With the baiting's black insect, little devils, and other extraterrestrial life forms, it was inevitable that they coexisted in the spirit world. However, this spirit world was entirely severed from the external realm. Consequently, Beyonders skilled in summoning creatures from the spirit world for assistance found themselves bereft of their primary reliance. Teleportation executed through the spirit world, however, retained some semblance of normalcy. Departing directly, however, proved impossible. The only avenues were through the energy passageway at the entrance or by breaching the outer wall to connect the inner and outer spirit worlds. Simultaneously, the closer one approached the flesh and blood bird's nest, the more peculiar the spirit world became. It was as though the air gradually thickened, becoming almost tangible and impeding the approach of birds. In such an environment, coupled with the absence of a flesh and blood bird's nest, Mad Lady found herself unable to teleport directly. Her only recourse was to blink incrementally, expending her spirituality with each maneuver. Having focused on Mad Lady and the space in front of her, Lumian suddenly extended his right hand and clenched it into a fist. The air surrounding Mad Lady immediately grew dense, as if assuming a tangible form. This transformation caused the illusory curtain to bend, compressing the corresponding area into a dark and transparent sphere. Once more, Mad Lady's form disappeared, but a formless force, shaped by the bending area, yanked her out and sent her plummeting. Under the authority of the governor of the sea, the spirit world within the sphere and the spirit world within the silver-gray behemoth were forcibly separated. However, this effect was contingent on the peculiar environment. In the external world, given Lumian's current level and mastery of the power of the sea, completely isolating an area from the expansive and genuine spirit world proved challenging. He could merely employ cosmic void to create an exit path and a door symbolizing an escape route, a tactic vulnerable to counteraction by a traveler's abilities. Mad Lady attempted another blink, yet found herself unable to escape the dark sphere's confines. She halted in place, seriously contemplating her recorded abilities and the items in her possession that might alleviate her current predicament. Observing her struggle, Lumian couldn't suppress his yearning for demigod level powers. As the temporary authority wielding governor of the sea, essentially a faux demigod incapable of withstanding a single spell from the Cinderella demigod, Lumian had ensnared Mad Lady in an inescapable dilemma. She proved challenging even for Mr. K to subdue in a brief time frame. Mad Lady gazed into the depths of the metal tunnel, representing the flesh and blood bird's nest, her face aglow with unrestrained eagerness, anticipation, and excitement. Confined within the dark sphere, she yearned for escape, dissatisfied with her inability to reach the desired destination. Head over there, quick! Head over there, quick! I want to go over! The longing in her heart intensified, nearly manifesting as a tangible desire. The desire surged into her chest, seeking to rupture the restraints and liberate her from this predicament. Mr. K having switched to a traveler's soul, swiftly caught up and saw Mad Lady. Instinctively, an illusory book materialized in his dark eyes. Positioned in front of Mr. K, the book flipped through its pages while chanting in a low voice, I came, I saw, I record. In an instant, Mr. K underwent a transformation, manifesting as a two to three meter tall half-giant donned in cold black armor, brandishing a dark, straight broadsword. Having grazed a traveler, he had selected three beyonder powers, blink, record, and the traveler's door, encompassing teleportation or travel. Additionally, with record, he had acquired an ability capable of influencing godhood from a saint of the Aurora Order. While only half as effective as the original, it proved sufficient to contend with Mad Lady, who had yet to approach the threshold of godhood. Mr. K advanced confidently, wielding the dark, straight broadsword, prepared to strike. At that moment, Mad Lady's chest was overwhelmed by an intense surge of desire. Then, she experienced a sharp, piercing pain. She didn't need to lower her head. From the corner of her eye, she witnessed the flesh on her chest tearing apart inch by inch, the white bones snapping one by one. A grayish-white fog, mingled with fragments of flesh, surged forth, 
coalescing into a humanoid figure resembling her. In an instant, it leaped out of the dark sphere created by Lumian and darted into the depths of the metal tunnel. Don't be in a hurry to leave. Unfazed by the situation, Mad Lady's face reflected excitement and a hint of regret. Pfft. Mr. K's dark broadsword cleaved through the dark sphere, diagonally bisecting Mad Lady. Wearing the ring imbued with flesh and blood magic, Mad Lady didn't succumb immediately. Her two halves of flesh and blood writhed, attempting to reunite, but all endeavors were obliterated by the profound darkness left in the wake of the broadsword. The flesh and blood failed to re-establish a connection. Come on, come on. Mad Lady's relatively intact head sought to aid her body, but she swiftly perceived the annihilation of her soul. Her vision darkened, and her unevenly separated bodies crumpled to the ground. Unperturbed by the fate of the April Fool's key member, Mr. K and Lumian redirected their focus to the grayish-white figure hurtling into the depths of the metal tunnel. Comprising half fog and half flesh, the figure existed in a realm between reality and illusion. The temporary governor of the sea, Lumian, once again honed in on the target and its surroundings, intending to marshal every ounce of sea power at his disposal. At that moment, the grayish-white figure collapsed to the ground. The flesh and blood originally belonging to Mad Lady seeped into the metal floor, and the grayish-white fog was on the verge of being absorbed. Abruptly, the entire tunnel trembled. Lumian once again saw the pear-shaped object fashioned from flesh and skin. The flesh membrane on its surface buckled once more, outlining a disc-shaped contour. A formidable suction force erupted. Whether Lumian, the temporary governor of the sea, or Mr. K, they found themselves irresistibly propelled into the depths of the metal tunnel, as if an invisible hand seized them and drew them toward the core of the silver-gray behemoth. Mad Lady's dismembered corpse and her belongings soared into the air, propelled towards the destination she had fervently yearned for in life. The humanoid form outlined by the grayish-white fog seeped deeper into the metal floor, absorbing a portion. In that moment, Lumian, wielding the temporary authority of the governor of the sea, employed his enhanced perception to see the flesh and blood birds nest deep within the metal tunnel more distinctly than before. The pear-shaped object's flesh and skin caved in, and the starlight and dark matter emanating from the surrounding flesh ropes accelerated their flow. Through the taut skin and flesh, Lumian vaguely sensed the object nurtured within the pear-shaped structure. It resembled a pitch-black vortex capable of devouring all colors and light. While not overly large, it featured a disc-shaped outer edge. W. H. Lumian instinctively recalled scientific concepts and simplified scenes his sister Aurora had once explained. He identified a term that matched his observations, a black hole. Did the Abraham family's ancestors seal a black hole with Amon? A black hole that has yet to fully form and is still nurtured within a mother's body from a mystical standpoint? Lumian found the idea absurd, straddling the line between scientific and mystical. Simultaneously, he sensed a connection between the black hole-like object and another place. A profound, weighty, dense, and terrifying aura loomed over the world. With a buzzing sensation, Lumian teetered on the brink of losing consciousness. Not only was his physical form being drawn towards the flesh and bloodbird's nest, but even his thoughts, spirit body, and destiny converged in that direction. It was the same for Mr. K. One after another, Mad Lady's fragmented remains and a few belongings floated between them. Beyond the silver-gray behemoth, Franca and the others felt an ominous suction emanating from the seabed. It seemed as though a colossal vortex was forming, ready to engulf everything in its vicinity. Splash! The mountainous azure waves and jade-green seawater collapsed, filling the seabed. Abruptly, resplendent starlight descended from the sky. Madam Magician materialized, adorned in a deep black warlock robe embroidered with shimmering silver stars. The wielder of a major arcana card extended her right hand toward the silver-gray behemoth at the seabed. Her figure appeared in a state of overlap, intermittently clear and blurry. Each radiant starlight transformed into an illusory door, seamlessly melding with the suction force, merging into the silver-gray behemoth. Chapter 590 The Truth Behind the Seal
the surface of the massive silver-gray behemoth ignited with illusory doors, casting a star-like brilliance that darkened the sky above the sea. This existing seal, triggered by Madame Magician, no longer resided in a nadir due to celestial shifts. Starlight descended, swiftly repairing the temporary damage inflicted upon the seal. Inside the behemoth, half of the grayish-white fog composing Mad Lady's human form was absorbed by the metal floor, appearing as if it would sink further. In that crucial moment, starlight permeated the walls, floor, and ceiling, materializing resplendent doors of various shapes. These doors manipulated the void, thwarting the menacing suction and expelling the grayish-white fog. Abruptly, Lumian felt the formidable suction force from the metal tunnel's depths dissipate. He saw the dented flesh and bloodbird's nest expanding again, releasing a copious amount of resplendent starlight. The torrent surged through different parts of the silver-gray behemoth like a flood breaching a dam. Lumian, Mr. K, Mad Lady's remains, and the items undulated with the sea's waves. As they were propelled forward, they encountered resistance and erosion from the sea's power. Meanwhile, the fleshless, corporeal grayish-white phantom swayed in the vast starlight, growing fainter before gradually dissipating. Unlike previous instances, the sea's power did not erupt from the ocean depths this time. Madame Magician had severed the energy passageway, successfully resealing and reinforcing the seal. Madame Magician, her form seemingly illusory, raised her right hand and pointed at the betrothal ship and sailboat, her eyes mirroring the corresponding scene. The two ships, along with Gila, Franca, the Cinderella demigod, the humanoid sealed artifact, the maidens of the sea, the remaining deputy hosts, and the sailors, vanished from the underwater cavity, instantly reappearing on the sunny, calm, turquoise sea beyond the seal. Crash! Mountain-like azure waves and jade-green seawater resembling well walls slammed down, filling the underwater cavity. Madame Magician's gaze then shifted to Lumian, Mr. K, Mad Lady's corpse, pride armor, and other items. Just as she was about to relocate them, Lumian, still donning the flawed boxing gloves, suddenly felt a heavy, dense, terrifying, and brilliant aura looking at him from another place connected to the black hole in the flesh and bloodbird's nest. Crack, crack. Lumian heard his bones shattering, his skull caving in, ribs snapping, and flesh compressing layer by layer. After unleashing the ascetic's accumulated strength, he, now taller, was instantly compressed into a short, thin, and dense form. Intense pain flooded his mind, and his brain began to passively contract. After a moment, Lumian broke free from the gaze and floated into the gradually calming air. Before Madame Magician, an illusory book rapidly flipped, emitting a faint glow full of vitality. It bathed Lumian's body in light, reconstructing his broken bones and swiftly enlarging his compressed flesh, rescuing him from his near-death state. Then, Madame Magician tossed Mad Lady's rose-gold ring embedded with the crimson gem to Lumian, allowing him to reassemble his flesh and blood and return to his original appearance. He was no longer a short, thin, and heavy peculiar human. Simultaneously, in Port Santa, Loki's figure faded as he entered the spirit world, preparing to teleport away. However, a dark, formless barrier appeared in front of him, blocking his path. Loki's pupils dilated as he realized that at some point, he had been ensnared in a dark and transparent sphere, seemingly bent from the void, with walls everywhere, and a hidden door. High up in the spirit world, near the seven pure lights, Madame Magician hovered, adorned in a deep black warlock robe adorned with stars. Loki's presence registered in her eyes and an illusory book rapidly flipped before her. She had strategically waited until the last moment to prevent Loki from receiving the Celestial Worthy's warning, providing her an opportunity to capture him alive. Loki's lips curled into an exaggerated smile upon understanding the situation. Rumble. His body erupted from the inside out, as if a self-controlled bomb had been embedded in his flesh beforehand. Loki's bizarre suicide succeeded, flesh and blood splattered, and his aura dissipated. Madame Magician promptly lifted the seal on the area, capturing the information Loki had imprinted in the spirit world. The spirit world served as a repository for all information. 
Divination often entailed revelations from the spirit world, and the matter of resurrection inevitably left corresponding information. As long as she found relevant information in time, Madame Magician could trace Loki to his resurrection spot and pinpoint the ancient castle documented in the secret order records. Soon, Madame Magician obtained something. Her figure vanished from the spirit world's heights, navigating the endless darkness adorned with symbols. In the next moment, a vast grayish-white fog materialized before her eyes. Magician halted, gazing at the seemingly endless expanse of grayish-white fog. Under the silent, dusky sky, above the calm blue sea. Using Mad Lady's ring embedded with a crimson gem, Lumian adjusted his internal organs, flesh, and bones to their original state. Treading on the corporeal wind, Lumian removed the ring that enabled the use of flesh and blood magic and anxiously inquired of Madame Magician, how's the situation on the other two fronts? As he spoke, he sensed a mystical and indiscernible flicker from Madame Magician. Magician smiled. Loki has just been killed by me, but I couldn't prevent his resurrection or seize the opportunity to locate his ancient castle. Bard has been captured by Gandalf, whom you intentionally sent to Milo village. He's alive. Phew. Lumian instinctively heaved a sigh of relief. Though he hadn't captured Loki, wasting one more of Loki's resurrections meant he had achieved his objectives. Furthermore, Ultraman and Mad Lady had been completely eliminated, and Bard had been captured alive. The results were satisfactory. Initially, Lumian hadn't confirmed Bard's identity. He didn't even know if Bard had participated in the Sea Prayer ritual. However, he had a few suspects, including the fake governor of the sea and Juan Oro's grandson, Fernandez. Since most of the suspects were in Milo village, he had Gandalf closely monitor them. Madame Magician continued, I relocated everyone else from these waters. I sent Mr. K of the Aurora Order back to his rented room in Port Santa. Mad Lady's corpse and items are floating here. The major arcana card holder opened her palm, shrouded in darkness, forming a small box. Inside, Mad Lady's dismembered corpse and other items had shrunk to the size of mosquitoes, drifting as if in another world. Lumian was taken aback. He looked at the bottom of the Azure Sea and asked, Is it over? He had anticipated gaining control over the silver-gray behemoth eventually. Otherwise? Back then, even two kings of angels couldn't clean up the mess. How is our tarot club going to handle it, unless Mr. Fool awakens? Madame Magician replied in an amused tone. Lumian recollected the items in the flesh and blood bird's nest and nodded in agreement. He asked in confusion, is it true that sealed at the bottom is a black hole? Ah. Uh, do you know what a black hole is? I do, Madame Magician chuckled and I also know that the silver-gray thing down there is a spaceship. Spaceship. Lumian was taken aback. Upon reflection, he realized that the silver-gray behemoth bore a striking resemblance to the spaceship described in his sister's bedtime stories. Madame Magician not only knew about spaceships but also grasped the concept of a black hole. Never underestimate high-ranking individuals. The time-transcending knowledge possessed by transmigrators might not be foreign to them. Lumian sighed with emotion. At that moment, he noticed that Madame Magician's mystical flickering had vanished. The major arcana card holder gazed at the seabed and explained, it's a black hole, ready to form, personally created by an evil god. Constantly absorbing surrounding matter and energy, it strengthens itself, eventually becoming a true black hole. In the fourth epic, the evil god seized an opportunity to send the embryonic black hole through the spaceship at the bottom of the sea. The plan was for it to rapidly develop, tear apart, and devour our planet, causing the barrier to lose support and disintegrate prematurely. True gods and angels could escape, but without the barrier's protection, who knows what would happen. Fortunately, Mr. Dor and Amon discovered the threat in time and took action. Yet, they couldn't obliterate the already developing black hole. Any attempts to destroy or destabilize it would only make it stronger. The only viable solution was to seal it and patiently wait for it to weaken through repeated radiations until it ultimately evaporates. Alternatively, they could transport it and the spaceship into the cosmos, abandoning it in desolate areas. 
However, this would require Mr. Door to leave the safety of the barrier and shadow the threat continuously to prevent accidents. Moreover, it remained under the vigilant gaze of that entity, which periodically replenished its energy through their connection. The danger was evident. That explains it. Lumian finally grasped why it had been sealed rather than destroyed. Intrigued, he echoed a term, Mr. Door. It bore a striking resemblance to Mr. Fool. Chapter 591 Information Gap Upon hearing Lumian's inquiry, Madame Magician's tone carried a subtle emotion. Mr. Dor is the ancestor of the Abraham family, the top duke among the five great nobles of the Tudor Empire. It was he who sealed this spaceship. Amon, on the other hand, designed the ritual that regularly siphoned power from the black hole to alleviate the pressure caused by the natural decay of the seal and hasten the black hole's demise. Higher in rank than Amon. In the Tudor Empire, Mr. Dor was second only to the Blood Emperor. He listened intently. Madame Magician sighed softly at that moment. In a way, Mr. Dor can be considered my mentor. A mentor? Your mentor is a fourth epic king of angels and the top noble in the Tudor Empire? A figure from almost 2,000 years ago. Lumian hadn't anticipated Madame Magician having such a profound background. No wonder she earned the position of the Angel of Stars beside Mr. Fool's throne. No wonder she held a major arcana card in the Tarot Club. Madame Magician glanced at Lumian, teasingly adding, It's true that Mr. Dor guided and supervised me in advancing along the divine path, but the method wasn't as virtuous as you might imagine. It was far from good. Far from good. Lumian was surprised before connecting the dots. Combining his experiences, he made a guess. Madame Magician had once fallen under the corruptive influence of Mr. Dor but received assistance from Mr. Fool. Did she join the Tarot Club because of this? However, from Madame Magician's words, it seems she reconciled with Mr. Dor. Otherwise, she wouldn't refer to him as her mentor. How intriguing and surreal. Just like how I might say in the future that the Angel of Inevitability, Termoboros, was my mentor, Lumian mused inwardly and probed, is Mr. Dor still active? Is he as lively as his peer, Amon? Madame Magician shook her head. He has perished. I see. Lumian cast his gaze toward the deep, bottomless sea. April Fool's objective is to acquire that spaceship? But it seems they are unaware of the nascent black hole sealed inside. It was a formidable entity that not even a true god could completely neutralize. Once released from its seal and allowed to develop, it would compress and absorb everything in its vicinity. Why did the key members of April Fools, who weren't even at the demigod level, believe they could confront it without fear? Relying on the spaceship to contain it? That seemed improbable. Only the evil god who created the black hole or an entity at Mr. Fool's level could control it. Mad Lady even believed that within the seal was an incubating deity or monster of a comparable magnitude. With these thoughts in mind, Lumian's heart stirred as he inquired in a deep voice, were the key members of April Fools misled? Is the Celestial Worthy's objective to unleash the black hole and trigger an apocalyptic catastrophe ahead of schedule? As long as Beyonders corrupted by him enter the spaceship, he stands a chance of achieving his goal? He really doesn't seem to value the lives of Ultraman, Mad Lady, Bard, and Loki. However, that is also typical of April Fool's modus operandi. They don't take lives other than their own seriously. Lumian suddenly felt like laughing. His satisfaction from finishing off Ultraman and Mad Lady intensified. Madame Magician nodded thoughtfully and remarked, If you hadn't used all your resources and handled this matter with absolute strength, or if I had arrived 10 to 20 seconds later and the grayish-white fog from Mad Lady's body had fully permeated the spaceship, the outcome might have been entirely different. We wouldn't be able to be here and discuss this matter so calmly. Lumian reflected on the events that had transpired and muttered thoughtfully to himself, if I hadn't gained temporary authority as the governor of the sea and restricted Mad Lady's teleportation, she might have approached the flesh and blood bird's nest incubating the black hole before your arrival. She wouldn't have manifested a humanoid form made of grayish-white fog to infiltrate the spacecraft. 
If that had occurred, the situation might have been even more challenging to handle. The reason he obtained temporary authority as the governor of the sea was because he utilized Lai to pilfer a portion of the sea's power. This allowed him to resonate with the sea and possess a counterfeit yet highly elevated status. The ability to use Lai to steal a portion of the sea's power was granted by the Seer Pathway's mystical item, which had been imbued with a high-level power of steel when placed on the Ancestor Honoring Altar in Milo Village. The altar could bestow high-level steel powers on items because it was constructed by Amon. Constructed by Amon. Lumian's thoughts suddenly cleared up. He grasped that it wasn't just him and the others sabotaging April Fools. There were also influential figures in the shadows who didn't want the celestial worthy to succeed. Madam Magician chuckled. Have you figured it out? I recognized what was happening when I saw Lai, now endowed with the power of steel. Some time ago, I spied on the altar beneath Milo Village and confirmed its purpose to gather the spirituality of worshippers and accumulate enough power to trigger the bestowment of the steel ability. Given Milo Village's population and the number of individuals with the sea bloodline, it can only be bestowed once a year. It can't last more than half a month each time, and it can only be used once or twice. Lai's enhanced power far surpasses that. Lumian furrowed his brow and asked, Are you suggesting that the steel on Lai was directly granted by Amon? This hypothesis struck him as absurd, comical, and surreal. In the past few months, Amon had been a source of terror, causing him mental distress. He nearly perished in the Samaritan Women's Spring. Subsequently, he informed the Tarot Club and aided the Angel of Time in eliminating most of the Amons in Trier. He also wrested a substantial debt from Amon's parasitic form. Their relationship? It was one of deep-seated enmity. The sentiment was likely mutual. Yet now, he was being told that Amon had covertly assisted him. While Lumian understood that Amon's aid wasn't driven by benevolence but rather to thwart the celestial worthy's objectives, he couldn't shake the feeling that the world had taken a bizarre turn. Madam Magician chuckled and explained, perhaps, back then, there was an Amon residing within the altar. Truth be told, I didn't anticipate that those who once instilled awe, fear, and vigilance in our discussions would occasionally collaborate with us. Of course, don't become complacent. While we may be teammates when facing the evil gods beyond the barrier, that doesn't extend to all matters. Even when dealing with the evil gods' followers, it depends on the specific circumstances. They might believe they can handle it alone and use the opportunity to set a trap that could harm you. All right. Lumian resisted belief, but he had no choice but to acknowledge the reality before him. The truth was laid bare. Having been briefed, Lumian mentally reconstructed the sea prayer ritual, refining the spiderweb-like thought pattern without any critical deficiencies. The corresponding experiences and lessons surfaced in Lumian's mind, April Fool's biggest failure was not knowing that Franca and I are also members of the Tarot Club, apart from being part of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society. Moreover, the Tarot Club places great importance on matters related to the Celestial Worthy. There's also an information gap between them and the Celestial Worthy, leading to their downfall. Have they not considered that their goals might not align with the Celestial Worthies? Despite me lacking information as well, I wasn't careless. I didn't underestimate any visible or hidden enemies. Even a lion uses its full strength to hunt a rabbit. Of course, the crucial aspect is that those holding key information and concealing it are on my side in this operation. What if they become my enemies next time? How should I deal with them? As these thoughts raced through his mind, Lumian sensed that his digestion of the conspirer potion had significantly advanced, thanks to the successful hunt and the questions he had formulated. Seizing this opportunity, he summarized his third acting principle, one of the keys to a conspiracy is information. A good conspirer must be adept at exploiting information gaps and even take the initiative to create information gaps. Closing his eyes to assess his body's condition, Lumian felt that another major, successful conspiracy in a period of daily accumulation should allow him to completely digest the conspirer potion. And that major conspiracy could be combined with the ritual to advance to sequence 5 Reaper. No further planning was needed. 
the Reaper ritual required a conspiracy to capture a target whose sequence was higher than his, alive. When Lumian opened his eyes, Madame Magician transmitted the darkness in her palm to him. You'll be in charge of distributing these items. This is something a hunter needs to learn and do well to advance to a demigod. All right. Lumian was accustomed to distributing spoils of war. He then added, but before that, I'd like to meet Bard. That, too, was a spoil of war. In the ancient and dilapidated palace in the nation of the Evernight, Lumian, Franca, Gila, and Gandalf materialized one after another. They were adorned in their usual attire for gatherings, with Lumian now assuming the guise of Muggle Aurora. Gandalf unceremoniously tossed Bard to the ground, not bothering to restrain him. Bard surveyed the familiar surroundings, devoid of any notions of escape or resistance. This was the concealed nation of the Evernight, isolated from the outside world. How could he possibly flee? And against two demigods, how could he even attempt resistance? Bard swallowed hard and spoke preemptively, I was also bewitched by Loki. All he could hope for now was that, leveraging his sequence experience as a swindler, he could successfully convince the two demigods. Noticing the silence from Hela and Gandalf, Bard added, I can lead you to Loki's ancient castle. I know a clue, really. At that moment, Lumian Lee, masquerading as Muggle, spoke in a deep voice, just kill him and channel his spirit. Chapter 592, Bluff Kill him and channel his spirit? Bard stared at Lumian Lee, masquerading as a Muggle, a chill running down his spine as his hair stood on end. He sensed the unmistakable killing intent emanating from Lumian, causing fear to grip him. However, a suspicion lingered in Bard's mind, he believed Lumian was trying to manipulate him, deliberately showcasing his anger and hatred to break his psychological defenses. His suspicion arose because spirit channeling wasn't the optimal solution. Celestial worthy possessed a higher level than many evil gods, and the corruption of those evil gods could lead to a failed spirit channeling. What's more someone with the Celestial Worthy's bestowment? Recognizing this, Bard's heart settled. As a swindler, he maintained a terrified expression, stepping back two paces as he looked at Lumian. I'll spill it all, no lies. You can verify it. Don't kill me. Lumian approached him step by step, brandishing a dagger. Bard turned to Gila, Gandalf, and Franca, pleading in a panicked tone, he's lost his mind and you're just going to let him be? Spirit channeling isn't all-powerful. Bard deliberately used him as a pronoun, signaling that he knew Lumian wasn't muggle, as if urging them not to play along. In two steps, Lumian arrived in front of Bard, casting his gaze at the April Fool's key member, who couldn't temporarily change his appearance back. He raised the dagger in his hand. Bard sneered inwardly, growing more convinced that Lumian Lee wouldn't actually end his life for spirit channeling, at least not yet. If his current actions weren't an act, Gandalf and Hela would have intervened no matter what. They wouldn't just stand by. Bard strained his throat and shouted, as if terrorized, I'll genuinely cooperate with you. I'll assist you in locating Loki and his ancient castle. See, I didn't even use my powers to resist in such a situation. As Bard shouted, he fixed his gaze on Lumian and the dagger's tip, attempting to convey evasion and pleading through his eyes. The former conveyed fear, and the latter was a plea for mercy. Throughout this process, Bard's heart was filled with mockery, almost void of panic. Trying to deceive a swindler? What a ludicrous notion. I bet you'll stop after I count to five. Five, four, three. Pfft. Bard's vision suddenly turned blood red as the dagger thrust into his left eye, piercing through the gap in the eye socket and into his brain. Impossible. Absolutely impossible. Is he truly going to kill me? Intense pain overwhelmed Bard's mind, prompting him to instinctively raise his right hand and press it against his face. He fought in the opposite direction, striving to put some distance between himself and the dagger, the source of the agonizing damage. Lumian reached out with his left hand, pinning Bard in place and making his struggles futile. 
Then, Lumian leaned forward slightly and whispered into the ear of the April Fool's key member. Bard glimpsed Muggle's beautiful face, her rosy lips moving as she whispered, a whisper filled with satisfaction and mockery, my godson is not on half of Loki's arm and knows a lot about him. I believe that knowledge surpasses yours. Surpasses mine. If I had known earlier, I would have utilized my powers. Even in the midst of pain and struggle, Bard was momentarily stunned, feeling frustration, despair, and embarrassment. Soon, these emotions dissipated. Lumian gripped the dagger embedded in Bard's eye socket and twisted it a few times, crushing the frontal lobe. Observing Bard, who had now calmed down, Lumian nodded in satisfaction. He withdrew his dagger and earnestly assisted the other party in stemming the bleeding and bandaging the wound, though he skipped the disinfectant. Only then did Franca approach and click her tongue. I thought you were just scaring him. That's why she didn't intervene. She had watched as Lumian advanced toward Bard, dagger in hand, witnessing Bard's pleas for mercy. She believed Hela and Gandalf had similar expectations. When the dagger pierced Bard's eye socket, Franca was taken aback. It was only then that she realized Lumian was serious. No, Lumian didn't truly intend to kill Bard. Instead, he planned to employ the April Fool's created prank to deal with him, recreating the original state of I know someone. Without waiting for Lumian's response, Franca asked curiously, When did you master lobotomy? Lumian wiped the blood off the dagger with a white strap and smirked mockingly. I learned it from watching the doctor perform surgery on I know someone. It's such a simple procedure. As a beyonder skilled in action, if I can't memorize and imitate it after watching it once, it only proves that my brain has been corrupted by the potion. Impersonating Muggle, Lumian deliberately spoke in his sister's voice, as if she were still alive. Franca looked at Aurora's face under the hood and listened to her voice. She wasn't angered by the mockery. She only muttered, the surgery isn't just about inserting and stirring a few times. There are still many key points before and after the procedure. Even during the surgery, if you insert it just a bit deeper, the outcome will be entirely different. So be it. If he really dies, we'll commence the spirit channeling. Lumian casually poured the remaining truth serum into the mouth of the stunned bard, who offered no resistance. After completing this task, he added, Madame Hela mentioned that this place can minimize the influence of evil gods. It's only minimal, not zero. Besides, what if the problem lies in his spirit, and he self-destructs? Franca instinctively retorted. This was why Hela hadn't directly pulled Bard into a dream to extract his true answers. After all, the dream might present scenes that shouldn't be seen. This was even more dangerous than simple verbal descriptions. Only then did Gandalf, draped in a linen robe and a hood, sigh softly. He couldn't bear to witness Bard's suffering, but he didn't discourage the actions taken. He wasn't the one who had been harmed by April Fools. He wasn't in a position to criticize the victim's family for their extreme actions. Before this operation, Hela had briefed Gandalf on Muggle's demise and Lumian Lee's role. The president of the curly-haired baboon's research society sympathized with the sibling's plight, but he also blamed himself. He believed that the curly-haired baboon's research society had been unrestrained. As president, he bore a heavy responsibility. After a moment, Bard, who had undergone a requiem and gradually recovered from his pain, started addressing the queries of the people present. The first to inquire was Gandalf. He peered down at the dream stealer and asked, How did you come to believe in that celestial worthy? Gandalf and Hela had already gathered intel on Celestial Worthy from Franca and Lumian, and they deemed it crucial. Bard responded calmly, from the beginning. I used to be a cultural relic thief and acquired a batch of ancient items. While studying their history to ascertain their value, I deciphered the meaning of some inscriptions. Abruptly, Hela cut Bard's narration short and said coldly, You don't have to explain the full meaning. Just mention a few keywords. Bard had no intention of arguing. He remained as docile as a sheep. Keywords include deception, fooling, door of all doors, lord of mysteries. As Bard finished speaking, the ancient palace they were in suddenly became misty and unclear. 
Simultaneously, Lumian's left chest burned again. In the next moment, the night sky outside the palace darkened even more, and all the mist vanished. Why did I feel like worms were growing in me just now? Franca felt a lingering fear. Merely a few names, incomplete honorific names, made her inexplicably uneasy. Every inch of her flesh seemed to come alive, about to transform into worms crawling out of her skin. One of Bard's initial plans was to answer Lumian and company's questions dishonestly and without reservation. Then, he would take the initiative to reveal all the details regarding Celestial Worthy. He wanted to see if he could secretly corrupt his enemies and shake the nation of the Evernight's concealments to create a door to escape. If I could really use this to corrupt Gandalf and Hela, why would they kill me when we're all Celestial Worthy believers? We would definitely work together to deal with Lumian Lee. Of course, Bard no longer harbored such thoughts. He had obtained an inevitable peace. Descriptions of high-level existences often indicate danger. In this world, ignorance might not be a bad thing. Gandalf sighed and assessed what had just happened. He then inquired about the follow-up. Bard's expression remained unchanged as he said, after deciphering the words, I lost consciousness. When I woke up, I had already transmigrated to this world. After adapting to my new body, I instinctively recalled my previous encounters and the words I had deciphered. Then, I saw a thin gray fog emanating from my surroundings and received a revelation from the Celestial Worthy. In other words, you believed in that Celestial Worthy as soon as you transmigrated, before the establishment of the Research Society? Gandalf probed further. Yes. Bard's emotions lacked any fluctuations. Back then, I thought that if I didn't choose to submit, believe in him, or follow him, I might die on the spot. When that happened, I might not have a chance to transmigrate and revive. Later, I gradually realized his greatness. He could even fool the nation of the Evernight and prevent our problems from being discovered. Gandalf pondered for a moment and asked, How did Loki come to believe in that celestial worthy? Chapter 593, Fooled In response to Gandalf's question, Bard recounted the past with a directness that left little room for ambiguity. I don't know. He didn't tell me. After the founding of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society, I began to notice the guy's actions and demeanor mirroring the influence of the Celestial Worthy. Likewise, he saw the same in me, prompting a mutual inquiry. Eventually, we confirmed each other's intentions, and assembled an April Fool's team. Gandalf and Hela probed about the Celestial Worthy, but with no breakthroughs, Lumian, disguised as a muggle, shifted his gaze to Bard and asked, What was your crew's aim in disrupting the sea prayer ritual? To control the underwater spaceship. It's our ticket to traversing the cosmos and holding our ground against angels to some extent. Bard revealed April Fool's plan. Lumian's lips curved upward. Do you know what's sealed in the depths of that spaceship? At this revelation, Franca suddenly grasped the core issue. Spaceship? The thing at the bottom of Port Santa is a spaceship? Isn't this too sci-fi and not mystical enough? Does this world have everything? To expedite the interrogation of Bard, a key member of April Fools, Lumian and Franca had entered the nation of the Evernight without much communication. Spaceship. Gandalf echoed the term, his tone brimming with unmistakable yearning. Gila maintained a silence akin to the depths of night. Bard responded to Lumian's inquiry, according to our interpretation of the language and the insights from the Celestial Worthy, that spacecraft functions as both a petri dish and an incubation chamber. It's nurturing a high-level creature. Control the spaceship, and you control it. Without that control, the spacecraft alone won't stand a chance against an angel. The smile of Aurora became even more alluring. Ever wondered why the ancient angel who sealed the spaceship didn't take control of it? Why didn't they command the high-level creature or destroy it outright? Bard fell silent momentarily before articulating, it might take a considerable time for the high-level creature to mature. Taking control of the spaceship would halt everything. Patience is required until the recent few years, just before the creature is due, before it can be managed. 
Lumian's smile beneath the hood grew brighter. If that's the case, the ancient angel who sealed the high-level creature will definitely reappear. Did you have the confidence to resist an angel and win the spaceship? Or do you believe the angel either didn't try to decipher or couldn't decipher the true meaning of those commands? It's been so many years, they might have already perished. Bard paused. In his dream, a creature on the altar, potentially the avatar of an ancient angel, hinted that the angel might still be observing Milo Village and those waters. Why didn't we think to confirm it before embarking on the entire plan? Bard voiced his doubts, his emotions showing no apparent shifts. Lumian replied with a smile, I can tell you that the spaceship isn't sealed with a high-level creature. It's an incomplete, nascent black hole. Once unsealed and piloted away, it will absorb the mystical body housing it, suck you guys in, and completely take shape, tearing apart and devouring the current world. Back then, the ancient angels didn't attempt to control it because it was dangerous, idiot. Bard was once again taken aback, as if he had never considered such a possibility. After a moment, he hesitated and said, We. Might have. Been fooled. Though Bard's emotions remained unchanging, the blood-colored liquid that trickled from the simple bandage down the bridge of his nose painted a tragic and mournful picture. Lumian burst into laughter, his back bending slightly. Do you only now realize that you've all been fooled by that celestial worthy? He provided revelations to mislead you. Through your deaths, he could open the seal and destroy this world to achieve his goals. Haha, <laughs> April Fools, indeed an organization of fools. Bard fell into silence once more, then candidly expressed his thoughts. We're fools, truly fools. Meanwhile, Gandalf and the others had varied reactions. Damn it, a black hole? Destroy this world? Franca had thought the news of a spaceship was explosive enough, but she hadn't expected something even more terrifying to follow. And an entity creating a black hole? Franca, lacking direct understanding of top-level powers, realized the magnitude of such a great existence. Previously, she felt she had a sufficient understanding of the world. Now, she admitted frankly, I'm still a fucking elementary school student. Gandalf took a deep breath and said, if I become a god, it would be so convenient for me to conduct research. Black holes. Gila retrieved a metal flask from her black widow clothes and took a sip, her thoughts inscrutable. Lumian's laughter echoed for a moment, providing a brief respite. However, underlying pain still gripped his heart, resonating in the shadows within. It couldn't be eradicated or dismissed. In the presence of the key members of April Fools, memories of his sister Aurora's tragic fate couldn't be ignored. Bard stood there, a silent reminder of a fact deliberately overlooked. Hence, Lumian couldn't help but utter, kill him and channel his spirit, resorting to action in a half-truth manner. Looking at Bard, Lumian inquired, Do you know if Ultraman and Mad Lady have been to Cordu? Yes, replied Bard. Part of our original plan was to find Nolfi's child, the Sea Maid. She lived in Intus's Ristan province. A stopover at Cordu was intended to confirm Muggle's situation and the final outcome of the prank. At the mention of prank, a vein on Lumian's forehead throbbed. How could you be so sure that Muggle was already dead? Hearing Lumian, disguised as a Muggle, pose this question, Gandalf let out another inaudible sigh. Frank sighed inwardly. Bard shook his head. I'm unsure. Mad Lady and Ultraman went. They informed me the village was wiped out. No chance for anyone to make it out alive. They might have even employed divination, spirit channeling, and such to be sure. Impossible for anyone to survive? Lumian smiled. Am I not human? Bard glanced at him and spoke his mind. You might not even pass as human anymore. That's not wrong. I'm now a humanoid sealed artifact with self-awareness and fate. Lumian made a self-deprecating remark before adding, the number of survivors is greater than you can imagine. A certain madam, her husband, butler, and maidservant had fled. Without giving Bart a chance to respond, Lumian inquired further, what was Loki trying to achieve with the muggle incident? I wasn't deeply involved. Just tossed in a few ideas. 
Not much in the loop, Bart admitted honestly. Ultraman might have a clue. He and Loki teamed up in other ventures. In what ventures? Lumian persisted. Bard shook his head slowly. Not entirely sure about the specifics. It's tied to the Eternal Blazing Sun Church. Connected to the Eternal Blazing Sun Church? Ultraman, a sequence 5. Priest of Light on the Sun Pathway. The humanoid sealed artifact lost by the church on the betrothal ship. Lumian's instincts kicked in. Any key April Fool's members that are not transmigrators? They had previously misconstrued April Fool's as a gang of degenerated transmigrators. Yet, as an organization, it naturally expanded. After all these years, April Fool's likely harbored more key members. Bard nodded. Yes. As expected. Lumian shot a glance at Franca, garbed in assassin attire, seeking confirmation from Bard. One of them is a purifier from the Eternal Blazing Sun Church, and he holds a decent status? Yes, Bard confirmed again. Thanks to him, we got wind of a Grade 1 sealed artifact we could utilize when we altered our plan. He even assisted in its escape from the seal. And who might this person be? Franca inquired, stepping in for the absent 007. It's a one-way line to Loki, Bard indicated, revealing his lack of knowledge about the member's true identity. Franca chuckled, saying, if the Eternal Blazing Sun Church launches an inquiry, they might stumble upon some leads. Grade 1 sealed artifacts weren't just lying around. They couldn't be pilfered casually. Lumian, noting Gandalf and Gila had no more queries, turned to Bard. What intel do you have on Loki's ancient castle? It goes by the name Dylan, a charming name, Bard began. Loki once told me it's a concealed ancient castle. Impossible to discover or see under normal circumstances. In simpler terms, you can't pinpoint its location through appearance or history. I've always envied Loki inheriting such a treasure after transmigration, an ancient castle. Later, he relied on the Celestial Worthy's revelation and the corresponding boon to succeed. I once tried to swindle Castle Dillon for myself, but I failed. Chapter 594 Execution Franca almost chuckled in exasperation at Bard's remark. April Fools not only deceived outsiders but also themselves. If they didn't believe in Celestial Worthy, cooperation wouldn't be on the table. Bard delved into his knowledge about Castle Dillon. That ancient castle used to be the domain of a secret organization known as the Secret Order. Loki became a member of the organization when he transmigrated. The story goes that the initial leader of the Secret Order personally constructed the ancient castle and concealed it over a century ago. Curious, Franca inquired, who's leading the Secret Order now? Bard shook his head slowly. Loki is in the dark about that too. Only those who've become Bizarro Sorcerers or Sequence 4 demigods within the Secret Order can meet the leader and establish a connection with him. Others merely follow the orders of their direct superiors. Loki once contemplated murdering his mentor, his immediate superior in the Secret Order, to gain the Bizarro Sorcerer beyond her characteristic and stage a grand performance. Yet, due to his comprehension and fear of Bizarro Sorcerers, he never solidified this idea into a concrete plan. Eventually, he gathered all the Bizarro Sorcerer potion ingredients in Castle Dillon and entirely abandoned his initial scheme. Do you think a hidden place like Castle Dillon, with its long history, would be quiet, cold, and sinister? Contrary to expectations, Loki informed me that it's quite lively, featuring a grand performance every day. A grand performance. Hela recalled the pitch-black ancient castle she had glimpsed in Loki's dream, along with the wax statue-like guests inside. Deep in thought, Lumian asked Bard, how do you suggest we locate Castle Dillon? I'm still missing crucial clues, Bard admitted sincerely. If finding Castle Dillon were that straightforward, the current leader of the Secret Order would have seized it and ousted Loki. No, he would have turned Loki into his puppet. Lumian intended to inquire more thoroughly with Ludwig later, seeking any information he might have gained after consuming half of Loki's arm. What about Ahsoka? What insights do you have on Ahsoka? 
Lumian inquired. Bard seemed to recollect something. That guy doesn't quite fit in. He prefers going solo. The rare instances of collaboration are mostly with Mad Lady. We all sense his emotions are pretty unpredictable, swinging between joy and anger. Mad Lady, however, remarked that he's not pure enough. He's highly dangerous, on par with Loki. His specific path remains a mystery. I've witnessed him using his abilities twice, both times involving mystical items. It's a poker card that can change its face, showcasing the attributes of Frost and Cut respectively. Word has it that Ahsoka sought out an artisan outside the research society to customize it after hunting a Beyonder. Regrettably, Mad Lady is dead, and there's no means to commune with her spirit. She undoubtedly held more information about Ahsoka. Does not being pure enough mean that Ahsoka isn't as unhinged as he appears? Is his occasional madness a deliberate facade? Lumian pondered with a twinge of regret. Even though Lumian had obtained Mad Lady's remains, her spirit had been severely corrupted by Celestial Worthy. Some of it had even been washed away by the power of the sea, completely obliterated. Lumian sighed quietly and shifted the conversation to a different topic. Do you have insights into the sea's power on Ultraman? Indeed. Bard shared his findings candidly. I played a role in deciphering the extraterrestrial language, although the celestial worthy provided crucial revelations. Additionally, the power of the sea is not exclusive to the offspring of Port Santa. I once encountered two heretics in Lenberg with similar abilities, and I managed to extract corresponding knowledge from them. This information greatly aided my decryption efforts, revealing that this pathway is not solely tied to the sea. In fact, only a small portion of it involves the sea. The power primarily emanates from the stars and the land beneath our feet. As you all are aware, our world is, after all, a planet. The corresponding Sequence 9 is known as Astronomy Aficionado. It focuses on acquiring knowledge of the cosmos, related information, and initial perception of reality, and enhancing one's physique. Sequence 8, named Star Worshipper, can decipher the star language or the language of the stars and receive insights into fate. Sequence 7, called Star Sacrificer, gains true powers through sacrificial rituals involving the stars. This encompasses gravity abnormality, weakening ray, electromagnetic attraction, and cosmic void. Sequence 6 is Navigator. They possess a deeper understanding of space and dimensions, allowing them to locate hidden passageways in the void and navigate and adjust routes between the stars. Navigating ships at sea becomes a straightforward task for them. Sequence 5, Tidal Scholar, further masters gravity and can whip up massive waves capable of shattering ships and demolishing docks. As for Sequence 4, it's known as Heavybringer. Unfortunately, I'm not too certain about their specific abilities. Lumian remained silent, taking a couple of steps back and signaling for Franca and the others to continue questioning. His primary concern centered around Loki's connection to Ahsoka, anything else seemed less crucial. Franca studied Bard for a moment before inquiring, have you recruited other members into April Fools? Yes, Bard admitted without hesitation. After detailing what he knew about the April Fool's members outside the curly-haired baboon's research society, Franca asked with curiosity, why did you choose the nickname Bard? Considering your past identity and current class, wouldn't Kaido or Kid be more fitting? Bard responded calmly, my current body was a bard, a wandering artist who often dabbled in thievery and swindling. He met his end when discovered trying to cheat others out of their money, suffering a severe beating. Cheat swindle, and steal, Franca thought. You know everything, it suits you quite well. Franca turned to Gila and Gandalf, stating, I have no further questions. Neither do I, Gandalf acknowledged, recognizing that Bard's life was approaching its end. Muggle's brother wouldn't let him off the hook. Neither do I, Gila added. Lumian raised his right hand, generating a dark green glow at his fingertips. The light transformed into a strange ray, penetrating Bard's chest. Weakening ray! Lumian still had access to a week's worth of sea power, approaching the level of Sequence 5. Bard's face contorted, 
muscles and nerves reacting instinctively. His chest, close to his neck, rapidly melted and peeled, exposing the flesh beneath. Seeing this, Gandalf sighed again. Gandalf sighed, condensing a straight sword with sunrise gleam and driving it towards Bard. The light blade impaled Bard's head, and he crumpled to the ground with a thud, held down by the sword. Bard writhed like a skinned insect, convulsing as life left his body. Lumian observed in silence, refraining from intervening as Gandalf freed Bard. When Bard's breath ceased, and he lay motionless, Lumian turned to Gandalf and Hela. Thank you for your assistance. It's our duty. We're all accountable for the harm April Fools caused to the other members of the research society, Gandalf responded gravely. Lumian didn't contest. Instead, he disclosed, before the operation, I mentioned joining a secret organization before assuming my sister's identity. To seek revenge, I invited members of that secret organization to assist. I believe you all have seen or sensed their presence. He strategically linked the appearance of the Tarot Club to himself, safeguarding Franca's identity as a minor arcana card holder. In which organization is that? Gandalf inquired curiously. As per Hela's account, the secret organization exhibited angel-level power, and the demigod Cinderella who appeared at sea was equally formidable. The Tarot Club, Lumian revealed truthfully. You're one of the minor arcana card holders? Gandalf deduced. He had heard about the Tarot Club. Lumian nodded without denying it. Curiosity piqued, Franca asked, which card represents that Cinderella demigod? And why does her magic have such a dreamy quality? Moreover, it resembles fairy tales from before our transmigration. She maintained her role while genuinely expressing curiosity. Lumian recalled Madame Magician's guidance and grinned. Major Arcana card, the Hermit. Pausing momentarily, he added, I'm uncertain about why she can transform your fairy tales into magic. What I do know is that she's closely tied to Emperor Roselle's descendant. Descendant of Emperor Roselle's eldest daughter, Bernadette? Franca and the others, having read numerous entries from Roselle's diary, immediately speculated. Perhaps, but it's not Bernadette herself, Lumian honestly disclosed. That was the extent of his knowledge. Is that so? Franca, Gandalf, and Gila felt enlightened. So, it was connected to Emperor Roselle's faction. It made sense for the Emperor to create fairy tale magic. After a brief pause, Lumian suggested, you should probably prevent the research society from disseminating those fairy tales. Understood, Gandalf agreed. Lumian pondered for a moment before stating, I've concluded my involvement with the research society and have joined another secret organization. It's no longer suitable for me to participate in the research society's gatherings. You may find an opportunity to reveal the truth to the other members. Gandalf and Hela exchanged glances and proposed, you can continue playing the role of muggle and acquire resources and assistance from the research society. We owe it to your sister. Chapter 595, Spoils of War Lumian wasted no time with pleasantries and accepted Gandalf's invitation without hesitation. Firstly, within the vast expanse of the curly-haired baboon's research society were numerous pathways. Besides the relatively scarce devils, he gained access to a wealth of knowledge and various items. While these might not surpass what he already possessed in strength, they held the potential to unexpectedly shine in specific situations. Secondly, this decision provided him with a pretext to continue assuming the role of Aurora as a muggle. It created the illusion that his sister still existed somewhere in the world. After the quartet concluded their discussion about the events in the peculiar waters, Bard's lifeless body underwent a startling transformation. Ephemeral lights coalesced in the corpse's right hand, causing both flesh and bones to crumble simultaneously. Eventually, the palm resembled that of a baby, small and pallid. The pale hue swiftly shifted, adopting a darker shade reminiscent of the ancient palace's surroundings. It was a dream stealer beyond her characteristic. Lumian focused his attention and detected a faint grayish white fog within the shrunken palm. He approached Bard's corpse, crouching down to search for additional items. 
With this task accomplished, Lumian retrieved the spoils obtained from Mad Lady and Loki from his traveler's bag, placing them on the decrepit stone slabs of the ancient palace. These included, a transparent, almost ethereal crystal, a bracelet with three diamonds flanked by four different colored gems, a rose gold ring adorned with crimson, blood-like gems, a simple silver ring, a dark gold mask capable of concealing the entire face, a featureless small doll bound with white cloth, an intricate but exquisite mechanical music box, and a grayish-white brooch with a metallic gleam resembling lightning. Accompanied by a relatively thin blank painting album and the Dream Stealer Beyonder characteristic, the total count reached ten items. Lumian then looked up and addressed Gila and Gandalf, you can choose, one each. It's our duty, Gandalf asserted, signifying the curly-haired baboon's research society's commitment to rectify past errors. Speaking in Aurora's tone, Lumian, shrouded in his hood, remarked, duty doesn't preclude the choice of spoils. Just because official beyonders must protect citizens doesn't mean they can't receive rewards. Gandalf pondered for a moment before turning to Hela. Seeing her lack of objection, he sighed and conceded, fine. Lumian's lips formed a smile as he pointed to each item, providing a concise introduction. The illusory transparent stone is a traveler beyonder characteristic left behind by Mad Lady, but it's severely corrupted. The thin gray fog emanating from it serves as evidence of this. The Dream Stealer Beyonder characteristic is similarly corrupted by that celestial worthy, but the severity is not extreme. It's slightly less severe than the remains of most heretics after their deaths. That bracelet comes from Loki, known as the Seven Stone Bracelet. Each diamond corresponds to a teleportation, and each colored gem corresponds to a ten second blink. Once used, it's gone. The drawback is that you hear random sounds when you wear it, ranging from a man having an affair to sounds from an unknown creature. This golden ring, named Blood Gold, bears an engraved inner loop with a brief sentence, controlling flesh and blood means controlling everything. Its function enables the wearer to control their flesh and blood like a rose bishop. Additionally, they can employ three flesh and blood magics, flesh bomb, flesh cloak, and flesh blood fusion. The drawback is repeated use may lead to dependence. Ceasing to wear it results in the body collapsing into a pile of flesh and blood, unable to maintain human form. Continual wear may lead to madness and loss of control. That silver ring is a semi-finished ring of the Sea Queen, possessing a high-level steel ability usable only once. The drawback is that an ancient angel will take notice of you. The Dark Gold Mask, a possession of Loki, survived his self-destruction. Its exact function remains unknown. Sensing it, one might feel an intense desire to wear it, believing it would grant abnormal power. Let's call it the Demon Mask. This featureless white cloth doll, a creation of Mad Lady, corresponds to the faceless of the Seer Pathway. When affixed to your shoulder, adjusting its facial features and figure is akin to altering your own appearance. Simultaneously, it empowers the wearer to master the ability to create paper figurine substitutes. However, only the first paper figurine proves effective. Beyond these functions, it allows the wearer to employ flames for a dynamic leap and develop a certain premonition of danger. Be warned, though, carrying it around brings weak bad luck. Moreover, one day, you may realize that its face mirrors yours, and you will cease to be yourself. This mechanical music box, discovered on Loki's corpse, is from an unknown pathway or sequence. It's rumored that the music it plays has the potential to either kill or drive anyone who hears it into madness. However, a prerequisite exists, you must hear the music for at least 10 seconds. I just found this blank painting album from Bard. Its precise effects and drawbacks remain unknown but based on my experience, the depictions on its pages may come to life or exhibit special effects. Notably, only nine pages remain, showing signs of tearing. This brooch, belonging to Mad Lady, appears crafted in anticipation of the loss of the Governor of the Sea's authority and the Sea's berserk state. It grants the wearer fish scales, mitigating damage and enabling underwater breathing and movement akin to a fish. Each strike carries the effect of electric shock, with a near 100% probability of triggering natural lightning strikes and thunderstorms. 
aligned with sequence 6 or 5 of the sailor pathway, the negative consequence is a heightened likelihood of being struck by lightning on rainy days, coupled with increased irritability and anxiety after wearing it. Lumian concluded the introduction of the spoils of war, his knowledge derived from Madame Magician. It was evident that for the success of the sea prayer ritual, April Fools had entrusted most of their mystical items to Mad Lady. Bar had only left behind an ordinary-looking blank painting album. On the other hand, Loki, the leader of April Fools, had seemingly retained his items privately. Whether it was his nature or a deliberate choice to retrieve them for hunting Ludwig remained unknown. Gandalf looked at Hela. Take your pick first. Hela approached Lumian, carefully inspecting the ten items. Before singling out Mad Lady's traveler beyond her characteristic. It's severely corrupted. Whether you decide to keep it or have an artisan craft items, it's quite dangerous. Leave it to me. In other words, she suggested that she had a method to handle it and mitigate potential harm. All right. Lumian didn't object. He respected the wishes of each individual and allowed them to choose whatever they wanted. Of course, the order of selection mattered too. His team would be last, and he would be last. Hela extended her right hand, and the night outside the ancient palace seemed to stir. The illusory crystal shrouded in grayish-white fog vanished. After Hela returned to her spot, Gandalf made his selection. Franca's heart skipped a beat as she observed the president scrutinizing the remaining nine items. She whispered, Don't choose the seven stone bracelet, don't choose the seven stone bracelet. That was the teleportation she had been longing for. The traveler beyond her characteristic was too dangerous. She didn't dare to set her sights on it. Although the seven stone bracelet was an expendable item, its advantage lay in its many uses and its relatively manageable negative effects. Gandalf's intense gaze fixed on the dark gold mask, his mutterings barely audible, I've got a burning desire to delve into its powers and potential. But it's too risky. I'm itching to put it on now. Yes, the blood gold ring aids my experiments into dangerous matters. The blank painting album requires further exploration. The high-level steel ability is also worth studying. But being noticed by an ancient angel is no small matter. After thorough contemplation, Gandalf turned to Hela and spoke, Can I leave the silver ring here? I want to arrive half an hour early to study it before every gathering. All right, Hela agreed to Gandalf's request. Thus, the president of the curly-haired baboons research society opted for the half-finished ring of the Sea Queen. Franca let out a sigh of relief and grinned at Gandalf. President, you really should have gone down the reader pathway. You suit their style perfectly. Why did he have to pick Warrior just to live up to the title of Gandalf? Gandalf, the half-giant in a linen robe, glanced at Franca, smiling without uttering a word. Lumian stowed the remaining items back into his traveler's bag, not affording Franca an opportunity to choose first. At Port Santa, near Salem Hotel, inside Loki's rented room. Lumian received a response from Madame Magician, even I can't decipher the intricate abilities of that dark gold mask, indicating its exceptional nature. Inquire with Mr. K if he desires it. If not, leave it in my care for now. I'll seal it and await the opportune moment. It might prove useful when the time comes. Ma'am Hermit has her eyes on the mechanical music box. Other items hold little significance for her, but this one, at least, is exquisite. Mr. Moon expresses interest in the faceless doll, as for the reason, I remain in the dark. I'll entrust you with distributing the rest. Chapter 596, Lord's Revelation In Mr. K's temporary apartment in Port Santa, Lumian unpacked the remaining spoils of war from his traveler's bag placing them on the coffee table. He shot a glance at Mr. K, who, now adorned in a black robe with a deep hood, spoke first, these are the gains from the operation. Perhaps there's a revelation from the Lord among them. Mr. K nodded subtly, diverting his attention to the items, his gaze fixating on the dark gold mask. In a deep, hoarse voice, he mused, I sense something special about it. This should be a revelation from the Lord. 
With a swift motion, Mr. K extended his right hand, pulling the strange dark gold mask into his grasp amidst a sudden gust of wind. However, the Aurora Order Oracle didn't put the mask on, instead, he discreetly stowed it away in a hidden pocket within his black robe. Witnessing this, Lumian was momentarily taken aback. He had been contemplating how to subtly carry out Madame Magician's instructions, aiming to inquire if Mr. K desired the dark gold mask. Surprisingly, he had spontaneously fabricated a lore-given revelation as an excuse. Before Lumian could specify which item it was, Mr. K had chosen the dark gold mask himself. Could it genuinely be a revelation from the Lord? Hiss. Lumian took a deep breath. Had Madam Magician sent me to ask Mr. K because she foresaw something or glimpsed something? These high-ranking figures always prefer to communicate through hints and revelations. Couldn't they be more direct? Amidst his thoughts, Lumian stowed away the remaining items and earnestly addressed Mr. K. I didn't expect the matter to escalate like this. I initially believed that with you and my sister's friends from her past, it would suffice to seek vengeance. Yet, it spiraled into something of a much higher magnitude. Thankfully, my sister's allies were vigilant and leveraged their connections. The sincerity in the first half of Lumian's statement contrasted with the second half, which explained the influx of demigods, even angel-level forces, this time. He subtly shifted the blame to Franca and Aurora's associates. Lumian sensed a high likelihood that Mr. K might not fully buy into his explanation. Disregarding the possibility of the Aurora Order's oracle grazing a relatively high-sequence spectator, Lumian believed that the intentional arrangements and subtle traces left behind by the entity he believed in were sufficient evidence of constant watching, listening, and awareness. As for Sequence 8 of the Shepherd Pathway, known as listeners, they often received revelations from that figure. Nevertheless, Lumian needed a plausible excuse. He couldn't just tell Mr. K outright, yes, I am a member of the Aurora Order, part of the Tarot Club, and also affiliated with the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society. My major arcana card holder is an angel, and I know countless demigods who can lend a hand. Besides worshipping your lord, I also believe in Mr. Fool. Occasionally, I praise the sun and say by steam. Wasn't this equivalent to provoking him in his face? Unspoken truths didn't always need to be voiced. Mr. K subtly nodded. Good job. Dealing with matters involving evil gods demands all your strength. Then, he added, after learning that your adversary is tied to an ancient evil god, I've already reported it to the higher-ups. At that time, our Aurora Order's angels were likely keeping an eye. If anything truly occurred, one or more would have definitely descended. Dot. Lumian's expression froze. Did the Aurora Order's angel also observe the spaceship back then? Isn't this setup too exaggerated? April Fools isn't even an organization with a single demigod. Is Celestial Worthy such a taboo when it comes to Madame Magician and the Aurora Order? It's understandable for the Tarot Club to give it significance, especially considering its connection to Mr. Fool's awakening. But why does the Aurora Order behave as if they're confronting a formidable adversary? Lumian pushed aside the issue of inviting an angel and four demigods for his revenge. He couldn't help but sigh at the Aurora Order's exaggerated reaction. Mr. K fixed his gaze on his subordinate and delivered a passionate lecture. Just because high-ranking individuals are keeping an eye on us doesn't mean we can be lax and handle things half-heartedly. These individuals have numerous crucial matters to attend to. They might only cast an occasional glance our way. If we don't put in enough effort and work diligently, it could easily lead to complete failure. And in that scenario, death won't be sufficient to atone for our sins. Yes, yes, you're right, Lumian echoed Mr. K without any intention of arguing. Upon returning to Loki's rented apartment, Lumian gathered the remaining five spoils of war and grinned at Franca, Jenna, and Anthony. It's finally our turn to choose. Not wanting to tease the eager Franca any further, Lumian pointed to the dining table where the items were laid out. Take your pick first. He. Franca smiled sheepishly, shamelessly picking up the seven stone bracelet. She exclaimed excitedly, I can teleport too. Aren't you afraid of overhearing something you shouldn't? 
Lumian teased. Franca had already considered this issue. It's not like I'll wear it forever. I'll only use it when I need it. And teleportation takes only a short time. If I really hear an unknown voice, the impact will be minimal. I should be fine if I remove it in time. Don't worry. The negative effects of Beyonder items similar to charms aren't strong. They can even be considered weak. Lumian scoffed dismissively. Have you forgotten what you have on you? Primordial Demonus figurine. Mirror World Fragment. What if she heard the Primordial Demonus ravings? Franca cleared her throat and said, I'm now a member of the Demonus sect and a believer in the Primordial Demonus. What's wrong with listening to the voice of God? At most, it'll make me excited. When the time comes, ha <laughs> ha. She glanced at Lumian and Jenna, keeping her thoughts to herself. I'll get your help. Franca immediately added, Furthermore, my primordial demonus figurine and the mirror world fragment are stored in the traveler's bag. They won't be taken out unless absolutely necessary. It's as if they're sealed. Lumian remained silent. He turned to Jenna and Anthony, asking, which one of you wants to go first? Anthony. He played a more significant role than me this time, Jenna replied politely. Anthony smiled. Are you disregarding me as an intision man? I still believe in ladies first. Considering Jenna's usual showy diva demeanor, she might have typically responded with something like, those intision men who claim ladies first only want to get them in bed. Are you having such thoughts about me too? Jenna despite her lack of overt actions, had a knack for teasing in a crude manner. However, at this moment, after exchanging glances with Lumian and Franca, she turned to Anthony with sincerity. I'm in a dilemma. I want you to help me eliminate an option. Anthony didn't decline and assessed the remaining four items. The blood gold ring enhances my survivability and strengthens my direct attacks. However, whether it's dependency or madness, it's something a psychiatrist should avoid. Furthermore, I'm now a hypnotist. I can use psychological invisibility and have the protection of dragon scales. Apart from underwater mobility, this brooch can only be used in close combat. Why would a hypnotist like me engage in close combat? The Dream Stealer Beyonder characteristics and blank painting album aren't bad. If the former is crafted into a mystical item with weak negative effects, it should be very useful. However, that's not a certainty for the moment unless I find a very good artisan. Anthony decided on the blank painting album. As an information broker, I'm adept at sketching. Such an item that can create different effects is very suitable for a hypnotist to observe first before taking action. Without needing Madame Magician's explanation, Franca had already used magic mirror divination to confirm the function of the blank painting album, the objects drawn on it might become alive and stay so for a short period of time. They might also have different effects. The painting paper will lose its mystical effects after being used once. The negative effect is never to respond to the knocks coming from the painting paper. Lumian and Jenna agreed that it was very similar to the abilities of Pixies. After Anthony stored the painting paper, Jenna seized the Dream Stealer beyond her characteristic without hesitation. Why? Lumian inquired with amusement. Jenna looked at him and grinned happily. It's the most valuable. Among the remaining three items, only it corresponds to a sequence five. Even if it fails to become a mystical item, it can be sold for a large sum of money. I still owe Frank a 45,000 Verldor. In the future, I might even purchase the Demoness of Pleasure Potion formula from her. An excellent reason. Lumian casually glanced at the remaining two items and placed the grayish-white lightning-shaped brooch on his chest. I want this. In the future, call it the Fury of the Sea. He chose the brooch over blood gold because, as an ascetic, he could bear impatience and other emotions. Pure madness was too dangerous for him, given the darkness in his heart. Lumian tossed the blood gold ring to Franca. Put it in your traveler's bag. Anyone can use it whenever needed. It shouldn't be used often. You won't give it to Madame Magician? Franca asked in puzzlement. Do you think she'll take a fancy to it? 
Lumian stuffed the fury of the sea into his traveler's bag and chuckled. Her spoils of war are naturally the humanoid sealed artifact, but she might return it to the eternal blazing sun church. With that, Lumian turned to Franca, Jenna, and Anthony, next, I'm going to do something unsuitable for others to see. Do you want to watch? Chapter 597, Too Dirty Franca's curiosity was piqued by Lumian's words. Is there anything we can't see? Are you sure you want to watch? I'm afraid it will deal a strong blow to your mind, Lumian asked in a teasing tone. Amused, Franca pointed at herself and retorted, Me? I'm not a minor. My mind is very mature. Why wouldn't I dare to look? Heh, I'm much more knowledgeable than you, boy. Jenna nodded in agreement, silently endorsing Franca's claim. Without further persuasion, Lumian left the apartment and headed to the room he had rented with a fake ID to monitor himself. Lugano was staying there with Ludwig. Franca followed with Jenna and Anthony, muttering, I thought it was something major. Isn't it just going to your godson? What impact on the mind? Lumian signaled for Lugano to retreat temporarily. Then, he retrieved two gruesome items from his traveler's bag, forming a humanoid figure with them. Maintaining an unchanged expression, Lumian looked at Ludwig and pointed at the two parts of Mad Lady's corpse. Is it edible? Edible. Franca was taken aback. Her gaze shifted between the repulsive corpse parts and Ludwig's boyish appearance. Suddenly, she felt a wave of nausea, as if her mind had been corrupted by the imagined scene. Indeed, Lumian's godson gained knowledge or abilities by consuming specific creatures, including humans. Memory, after all, was a form of knowledge. Franca couldn't suppress her urge to retch, regretting her decision to witness the cannibalistic act. To make matters worse, she knew the person who had been consumed, Mad Lady. She had interacted with her before. Jenna's face contorted, clearly struggling to contain her churning stomach acid. Anthony, a seasoned veteran accustomed to witnessing scenes of gore, subconsciously frowned. Ludwig scrutinized the two bloody corpse parts in Lumian's hands for a moment before slowly shaking his head. It's too dirty. Dirty? Could it be a reference to the severe corruption of the celestial worthy? Even you won't dare to swallow it for fear of something happening? Lumian threw Mad Lady's two corpse parts to the ground with regret, summoning a crimson fireball that was nearly white. Rather than exploding, the fireball adhered to Mad Lady's corpse, burning and compressing it into charred dust. Amidst the dancing flames and the burning fragrance, Franca and Jenna breathed a sigh of relief. Lumian pulled up a chair and sat down, addressing Ludwig, who was nonchalantly nibbling on a cupcake, wasn't that person's arm dirty? He was referring to Loki. Just a little. The dirtiest part isn't on the arm, Ludwig commented casually, as if discussing which fish were poisonous and how they should be consumed. Only then did Lumian get to the point. What did you gain from that person's arm? Some knowledge, Ludwig replied nonchalantly nibbling on a sponge cake covered in light cream, as if he preferred not to be disturbed while eating. Lumian, feigning indifference, asked bluntly, What are they? Ludwig's voice alternated between clarity and muffled tones as he replied, sequence knowledge about his pathway. There are two other terms. One is Dylan. And the other is Orville. Dylan? Is that the name of Loki's ancient castle? And what's Orville? Lumian's curiosity peaked, prompting him to interrupt Ludwig. Apart from the name itself, is there any relevant knowledge? Ludwig seized the opportunity to take another bite of cake. After chewing and swallowing, he said, No, but. These two terms seem to be connected. Orville should be the name of a place, and Dylan is the castle's name. Connected. Name of a place. Castle Dylan is in Orville? Where is Orville? Lumian turned to Franca, Jenna, and Anthony, realizing they were clueless, shaking their heads in ignorance. After a moment of contemplation, Lumian spoke in a deep voice. Our next priority is to find information about Orville and Dylan through our respective channels. 
Getting nods of agreement from Franca and the others, Lumian asked Ludwig again, anything else? His spirituality is quite abundant, and his quality isn't bad. He doesn't like hard liquor or drinking freely. He only drinks champagne and occasionally has coffee. He's a loyal advocate of tea leaves. He's healthy, has good bowel movement, and urinates normally. He hates the smell of the washroom. Ludwig shared the information obtained from the half-arm. Franca listened with keen interest, and just as Lumian was about to interject, Ludwig divulged another piece of valuable information. He owns Castle Dillon, but he doesn't reside there. He only returns occasionally. He's not the sole proprietor yet. Many areas there aren't accessible to him. Recently, he unlocked a room and acquired a dark gold mask. That mask will grant him immense power, but once he wears it, he'll face terrifying matters. Could that dark gold mask be a relic from the original owner of Castle Dillon? Perhaps a memento from the previous leader of the Secret Order? Lumian nodded thoughtfully. To him, this information wasn't particularly crucial as the dark gold mask had already been handed over to Mr. K. Thus, he had no reason to be concerned about it. Franca, Jenna, and Anthony prepared to return to Trier after the Q&A session with Ludwig, having confirmed that they had gleaned all they could. Of course, Lumian took responsibility for their return journey. Franca couldn't bring herself to use one of the seven stone bracelets at the moment. By the way, Lumian looked at Franca, pondering for a moment. Contact the Eternal Blazing Sun Church and see if they're willing to exchange information about the humanoid sealed artifact and its corresponding story. We'll make efforts to facilitate this transaction. Upon Bard's mention that he was uncertain about his human status, Lumian realized his resemblance to the humanoid sealed artifact. However, Bard retained his rationality and clarity, possessing a relatively independent fate. Otherwise, he could be deemed a walking grade zero humanoid sealed artifact. This sparked Lumian's curiosity about the humanoid sealed artifact, wanting to uncover what had happened to her and why she had transformed in such a manner. Franca nodded and instinctively said, but, uh, that lady only mentioned the possibility of returning it, nothing definite. We're merely striving to facilitate the transaction. It's not guaranteed either. Lumian chuckled. He quickly sent Franca, Jenna, and Anthony back to Trier Cartier de la Cathedral commemorative before entering Aquina Street. Strolling among the citizens still immersed in the afterglow of the celebration, he made his way towards Salo Motel. Half of the motel's fifth floor had collapsed, and the fourth floor was severely damaged. Ada, the owner, observed the scene with sorrow and helplessness. He wanted to cry, but the tears wouldn't come. At a certain point, Noelia of the Fertility Order approached Louis Berry, the adventurer overseeing Salo Motel. She spoke in a formal tone, your partner said you'd be responsible for the compensation. Lumian retrieved 10,000 gold rizit from his traveler's bag and handed it to Noelia. Noelia glanced at his black coin bag and sighed with emotion. That's good stuff. The combat nun then counted the compensation. 10,000 rizit? That's enough to build two motels like this. How generous. Just as expected from an adventurer who recently bagged a bounty of 300,000 gold rizit. Lumian brushed off Noelia's teasing and continued, this is the reward from the Paco family's commission. The Paco family. Noelia fell silent. The Paco family's matriarch, the current family head, and his wife, all perished in this conflict. Lumian pressed on, weaving through the crowd as if on a leisurely stroll. In the dusk's afterglow, he heard singing, seabirds chirping, and citizens animatedly discussing the past few days. Did you see that? In the morning, seabirds came to pay their respects to the governor of the sea. Is this year's sea prayer ritual that successful? That's right. Back then, many vines grew crazily. Many people fainted from joy. This is Earth Mother's recognition of the sea prayer ritual. No, that's not right. It represents a bumper harvest. It means this year's fish harvest will fill ship after ship. Praise the Earth, praise the Mother of all things. Praise the Governor of the Sea. Dot. 
Though Lumian wasn't privy to the Church of Earth Mother's method to make citizens view the morning mysticism roundup as a miracle, he sensed joy and delight in everyone's hearts. Leisurely, he thought, I wonder if the remaining committee members of the Fisheries Guild have finalized the choice for the fake governor of the sea. Sure, the real Simon Diaro is the top contender. However, it doesn't matter who takes the role this year. The power leaked by the spaceship is now in my possession. In the next year or even two, there won't be frequent catastrophes in these waters. The sea creatures will reproduce faster thanks to the watering. Heh <laughs> from a certain perspective, I'm the true governor of the sea, for just a week. In the midst of the lively parade and numerous street vendors, Lumian casually located a bar and ordered an undiluted manzan and a large cup of locally brewed dark gold malt beer. Placing the manzan glass across from the small round table, he lifted his beer, clinking it. Then, he muttered with a smile, Did you see that? Did you hear that? Their dance, their singing, and the sound of fish multiplying. Isn't this the future you desire? With that said, Lumian downed a mouthful of dark gold beer. Chapter 598 Confrontation and Reconciliation the night draped the land in darkness, and stars adorned the sky above Port Santa. The festive crowd had dispersed, leaving behind the remnants of celebration, discarded litter, and the lingering scent of alcohol. With the official end of the holiday, the city would soon buzz with work again. Lumian lingered at the bar until closing time. As he stepped out, the deserted streets welcomed him, illuminated only by sporadic gas lamps. The late night air hinted at the approaching winter's chill. Lumian breathed it in, feeling the crisp freshness entering his lungs. The rhythmic crash of waves against the shore added to the night's serenity. In seemingly high spirits, Lumian, slightly tipsy, walked past the aftermath of the celebration with hands in his pockets, unnoticed in the silent surroundings. He made his way back to the room rented under a false identity. Upon opening the door, he found Lugano pacing anxiously in the living room. Still up? Lumian raised an eyebrow. Lugano, looking like he'd recovered from a serious injury, spoke with a complex expression, an hour ago, Captain Noelia of the Combat Nuns paid you a visit. Not in armor, but a stunning dress. She is quite the figure. And then? Lumian inquired, a smirk on his face. Lugano replied with envy, she left disappointed when I told her you weren't around. Lumian chuckled, what's it got to do with you? Why are you still awake after an hour? Lugano coughed awkwardly, I had a sudden contemplation about my future. Should I return to Trier and pursue a medical career, or should I opt for a different path? Ignoring the doctor's musings, Lumian, with a smile, washed up briefly and retired to his room, succumbing to sleep. In his dreams, recent events blended into a chaotic tapestry, weaving stranger and more bizarre stories. At precisely 6 a.m., Lumian awoke and promptly sat up. His thoughts sharpened as he recalled the dream. Suddenly, a detail struck him, disregarding the possibility of the Aurora Order having covertly observed the situation. The crucial aspect of the sea prayer ritual was Amon's utilization of the altar in Milo Village to discreetly imbue Lai with a steel ability. Without this intervention, the opening of the spaceship's energy passageway would have led to a reversal. Deprived of the sea's power, he couldn't have ensnared Mad Lady with the authority of the governor of the sea, delaying her until Madame Magician's arrival. However, Celestial Worthy, positioned at the pinnacle of the seer, apprentice, and marauder pathways, should possess an in-depth understanding of marauder abilities. It seemed unlikely that he hadn't considered the possibility of an Amon hiding at the altar granting steel powers. It made sense that he hadn't shared this knowledge with April Fools, they were expendable tools, and excessive information might weaken their resolve during the operation. But the overall plan shouldn't have crumbled due to this. Were Celestial Worthy's intentions more intricate than they seemed? Had he secretly achieved a goal, or did Amon and his unseen ally orchestrate events in advance? Had Amon truly kept watch over the altar in Milo Village without pause? last year's sea prayer ritual might not have failed. There remains the prospect that he wanted to derive amusement from April Fool's antics. 
the chaos wrought by April Fools last year was perhaps understandable. Shouldn't the most straightforward approach this year involve discreetly allowing the completion of the Ring of the Sea Queen during the ancestor honoring ritual? Subsequently, events could unfold with Ultraman assuming the guise of the incoming governor of the sea, only to be dumbfounded when the sea sacrifice ritual succeeded. Why the convoluted path? What was the purpose behind these seemingly unnecessary steps? There must be something I'm missing. Lumian massaged his temples and rose from the bed. The revelation didn't surprise him. It would be abnormal if he quickly unraveled the true motives of every participant in such complex scenarios involving high-level entities. Regardless, his goal was accomplished, and the perilous black hole in the spaceship remained sealed. The rest was not his concern. If he could decipher it, great. If not, he could always write to Madame Magician to provide a timely reminder. After a jog around the still slumbering Port Santa, Lumian penned a letter to Madame Magician, detailing his reflections. As Lumian finished, Lugano, who had been out gathering breakfast for Ludwig, returned to his quarters. Taking a moment to contemplate, Lumian handed over 1,000 gold rizit to Lugano. With a composed tone, he stated, I'll be away for a few days. Take care of Ludwig. When I return, this commission will be completely over. When the time came, Lumian planned on taking a boat to the southern continent. Lumian intended to conspire and make preparations along the way. His aim was to be ready for the final conspiracy and advance to Sequence 5 upon reaching his destination in the southern continent. Without prying into his employer's destination, Lugano nervously asked, W. Will there be any danger in the next few days? It's done, Lumian replied with a smile. If any other danger arises, go to the fertility order and seek protection. Isn't that what you've been anticipating? Lugano grinned sheepishly, reassured by Lumian's demeanor. Under the shining sun of Port Santa, with delicious food and passionate women, staying a few more days seemed like a pleasant prospect. A two-story relay carriage raced through the village towns scattered across turquoise pastures, making its way towards the base of the Pyrees mountain range. Maintaining his disguise as the adventurer Louis Berry, Lumian occupied a window seat in the carriage, silently observing the passing scenery. Each turquoise pasture was adorned with flocks of sheep, resembling scattered clouds. Shepherds, clad in practical and mobile robes, strolled amidst the grazing animals. Some had their own shacks, while others utilized small, wheeled shepherds' huts for mobility. Occasionally, local villagers attempted to drive away the incoming shepherds, only to be met with sly smiles or placated with money and supplies. Faced with determined locals, the shepherds, arriving from the mountain pass, reluctantly moved to more desolate areas, contending with the watchful eyes of wild wolves and other creatures. The scenes spoken of by the quarter shepherds presented themselves vividly to Lumian, searing a memory in his mind. Two days later, the relay carriage halted at the foot of the Pyrees mountain range, pausing in a small town outside the mountain pass. Lumian changed into a black tweed coat, preparing to venture into the mountain alone. As he ascended the mountain ridge, the cold wind intensified, rendering the wilderness almost devoid of life. Navigating the sparsely vegetated mountainous terrain, Lumian followed the trails left by shepherds and merchants. Under the birdless gray sky, the desolate landscape featured withered trees and a meager stream. Winter's solitude permeated the air. In the cold solitude, it took him nearly three days to traverse the Dirige mountain range and reach the river outside Cordu. Circling the towering forest, Lumian promptly spotted the blood-colored pillar, emanating the aura of a mountain peak despite its modest height. As Lumian gazed, footsteps approached from ahead. A middle-aged man, clad in a leather coat and clasping his hands together, appeared. Trembling in the cold wind, the forest ranger shouted, Don't go any further. That village is gone. Lumian's eyes moved beyond the ranger to the collapsed and burned structures in the distance. After a brief pause, he inquired in a deep voice, What happened to that village? The forest ranger glanced around and lowered his voice, they said they believed in demons. The villagers went crazy, burned down their houses, and walked into the abyss. Look, would a normal village be like this? 
Lumian fell silent for a long time. Seeing this, the forest ranger sincerely said, In any case, those old men instructed me to prevent anyone from entering this village. They said that it's bad luck, it would provoke the demons. Lumian remained silent, refraining from further inquiry. Staring at the unfamiliar yet oddly familiar ruins, he turned away from the village entrance. Step by step, he approached the nearest alpine pasture, the wind howling around him. The grass here had completely withered, blown away by the wind, leaving behind barren patches of brown soil. Lumian surveyed the ruins of Kordu, then located a shack abandoned by the shepherds. Inside, he lay down, closing his eyes and remaining motionless. If only everything that had transpired before could be dismissed as a dream. When he woke, the alpine pasture was vibrant green once more, birds returned to the sky, an old tavern bustled with farmers and herdsmen. His sister persistently urged him to study, while Raimund, Ava, and the others pondered uncertain futures, unaware of the life awaiting them. The sun shone brightly, yet the air in Port Santa had begun to carry a chill. Abruptly, Lumian stood before Lugano and Ludwig. You're finally back. Lugano exclaimed, relief evident in his voice, as if he had encountered a savior. Ludwig's appetite had surged once more, and the 1,000 Rizit had disappeared faster than anticipated. Another week, and Lugano would have to contemplate using his own funds. He couldn't allow the child to go hungry, he might resort to eating him. Lumian chuckled in response, saying, the commission is over. I'll pay the balance now. Do you want my help to teleport back to Trier, or do you prefer taking a boat yourself or crossing the Dirige mountain range? Lugano fell silent, seemingly grappling with a decision. Chapter 599 If you have power, use it. Lumian didn't hurry Lugano. He preferred to observe the doctor's decision making. After a pause, Lugano gathered his courage and inquired. Will you be bringing Ludwig along in the future? Of course, Lumian replied, glancing sideways at Ludwig, who was devouring a roasted octopus. Had he not received the 0-01 information from the Church of Knowledge, he wouldn't have considered keeping such a child around. However, Ludwig had proven his usefulness. In the future, he might serve as another Loki trap. Lugano swallowed and offered. I can assist you in caring for Ludwig, so you won't need to factor him in when dealing with matters, unlike how you could simply leave whenever you pleased in the past. As anticipated. Lumian wasn't taken aback by Lugano's proposal. He raised his chin slightly and inquired, Reason? Lugano smiled sheepishly and explained, During this journey, I've witnessed much and faced attacks. It made me realize that sequence eights are still insignificant in the mysticism world they're ill-equipped to handle risks. Yes, if I return to Trier and discreetly wield my doctor powers, I'll undoubtedly attain middle-class status. It's not inconceivable to ascend a high society, but I fear that garnering too much fame will draw the attention of official beyonders. Trier isn't as lenient as Port Santa, which is more accommodating to wild beyonders. Furthermore, those dangerous beyonders are always lurking around us. I refuse to be defenseless the next time I'm targeted. If you refrain from participating in mysticism gatherings and solely run a clinic as a doctor, you wouldn't be entangled in dangerous affairs. You could easily handle ordinary thieves and bandits, Lumi encountered nonchalantly. Lugano shook his head. The Beyonder who left me is relics, enabling me to become a planter, once warned me that once I enter the mysticism world, escape is impossible. Beyonder incidents will always surround us. If I'm fortunate, I might survive until natural death, but if I'm unlucky, I'll end up like him. At first, I didn't fully believe it, but the events of the past six months have increasingly convinced me of its truth. I did nothing, yet Rue Anarchy collapsed, and a peculiar tree sprouted. Before you hired me, I dreamed of becoming a figure in a painting, unable to return to reality. Upon waking up, I found myself wanted. This time, all I did was care for Ludwig, staying clear of any involvement, yet I was still senselessly attacked. Mumulumian's expression grew more peculiar as he listened. I seem to be the common denominator in all your tales. Yet, 
you persist in following me. Is this another instance of Beyonders encountering mysticism incidents? You didn't encounter those incidents, but me. Lugano continued, I've also witnessed Beyonder powers like teleportation and tsunamis. Being just a sequence 8 no longer satisfies me. I believe I'll find more opportunities by following you. Lumian gazed at Lugano, unsure if someone had influenced him to insist on following or if Ludwig had somehow tamed him to be his nanny. Initially, Lumian thought Lugano, as a beyonder of the planter pathway, had ties to the Church of Earth Mother. However, despite paying close attention, he hadn't observed any additional communication between his guide and the Fertility Order or the Church of Earth Mother's clergyman. Furthermore, Lugano seemed like a stranger. Seeing Lumian stay silent, Lugano smiled ingratiatingly and proposed, I have a gift for languages. I can self-learn Dutnese from the southern continent. As long as you pay me 300 Verldor a month and promise me a share of the spoils, I can continue to be your guide, private doctor, child caregiver, and be half a fighter. Sure. Lumian handed over a total of 10,000 Verldor. This is the final 5,000 Verldor from before. Additionally, you were attacked. As per our agreement, I'll pay you an extra 5,000 Verldor, making it a total of 10,000. Lugano gladly accepted the payment and began packing. Lumian seized the moment to count his cash, confirming he still possessed 1,000 Verldor in gold, 76,000 Verldor in gold coins, along with other coins, banknotes, and the remaining 2,000 gold rizit yet to be spent. As long as he refrained from acquiring beyonder characteristics, potion formulas, mystical items, or high-end mysticism knowledge, the money he carried could sustain him for a considerable time. The following morning, Lumian boarded the ship bound for Faina Potter, adopting the guise of the adventurer Lewis Berry. Approaching the first-class suite, he turned to Ludwig, posing a thoughtful question, in your memories, or rather, Loki's memories, are there any peculiar creatures? They resemble lizards but are quite small. They can crawl into a human's mouth, appearing transparent and blurry, suspected to be spirit body. They have brownish-green scales and dark green eyes. This description deviated significantly from the starlight lizards transformed by the children of the sea. Ludwig shook his head. No, it's not in the baiting's black insect's memories either. Lumian fell silent, observing Lugano as he opened the sweet door with the mannerisms of a servant. Another hour passed, and amidst a whistle, the ship departed Port Santa. After nearly two hours of sailing, the weather gradually worsened. The waves surged, and the strong winds compelled passengers on the deck to retreat to their cabins. Observing the dusky sky, the dark clouds stirred by the wind, and the rising waves, Many passengers, sailing for the first time, felt a sense of anxiety. Noticing the confidence of the sailors beside them, they sought reassurance, this is a common occurrence at sea. It's not dangerous, right? A Port Santa native, working as a sailor, replied with a smile, it's relatively common, but it can be a bit dangerous. If the storm intensifies, we might need to seek shelter in a nearby port. But don't worry. This year's sea prayer ritual was a success. The current governor of the sea will protect us and prevent any shipwrecks. Governor of the sea. The passengers became even more uneasy upon hearing the sailors' response. They had taken part in various sea prayer rituals and celebrations in Port Santa. While enjoyable, they didn't truly believe that the governor of the sea could exert any significant influence on the waves. Amidst their unease, they were astonished to find that the rising waves suddenly subsided. Despite the dark clouds and strong winds, the seawater seemed to be pressed down by an invisible force, showing no noticeable fluctuations. The Port Santa natives erupted in cheers. Long live the governor! Praise the governor of the sea! Witnessing this, the passengers exchanged glances, momentarily speechless. In the first-class suite, Lumian relaxed in a recliner, sipping undiluted manzan. On his lap lay a southern continent Dutnese introductory textbook. Clenching his right hand into a fist, he pulled it downward. A section of the dark clouds in the sky descended, forming a formidable funnel. Sunlight penetrated the massive hole, 
brightening the cabin and highlighting Lumian's book. Retracting his right hand, Lumian flipped through a page of the book. He found the governor of the sea's abilities truly advantageous at sea. Unfortunately, he could only use it for one more day. Late at night in Trier, Angulin returned to his residence and habitually switched on the radio transceiver. Before long, a telegram arrived. Upon seeing Hidden Blade, Angulin frowned. Two bits of good news and a spot of bad news. Which one do you want first? I know. You must want to hear the good news first. I'll get straight to it. The first piece of good news is that the humanoid sealed artifact has been located and secured. You don't have to worry about the business trip to Faina Potter. You can focus on investigating the Mirror People matter in peace. The second piece of good news is that after communication, we've confirmed that the faction controlling the humanoid sealed artifact might return it to you. We're willing to facilitate the matter, but you'll need to provide all the information about the humanoid sealed artifact in exchange. Of course, it's just a possibility, nothing set in stone. You won't need to make a substantial payment until we reach an agreement. Bad news. Haha, <laughs> there's a traitor in your church. The humanoid sealed artifact was lost because of a mole. We're certain of this. Go, 007. Your chance to render meritorious service has arrived. After reading it in one go, Angulin felt a sense of relief. This was because after the humanoid sealed artifact was lost, the church's upper echelons suspected a traitor and conducted an investigation, but to no avail. There was indeed an issue with the case leading to the loss of the humanoid sealed artifact, but the five purifiers in charge of that case had been cleared of any wrongdoing during the investigation. They hadn't performed well back then and had merely encountered an accident. It seems that the mole has concealed himself well. Anguli muttered to himself. Cartier de la Cathedral Commemorative, Apartment 702, 9 Rue Orosai. Franca sat by the bed and chatted in the telegram group, waiting for Jenna to return. Her female companion would visit the Cartier de la Maison d'Opera once a week to watch a theater performance and only return at midnight. However, the exact day she went was uncertain. Furthermore, she would disguise herself to prevent others from noticing her travel patterns. Anthony, who lived nearby, had been busy infiltrating a circle of psychology enthusiasts, hoping to come into contact with a true psychiatrist. I seem to be the only one with time on my hands. I haven't received any feedback about mirror people. Franca wasn't the kind of person who insisted on having something on her hands. She excelled in finding joy in life. While Franca thought about Jenna, Jenna, who had just finished watching the last play, put on a hat with a black veil and stood up to leave the theater, where many spectators were still lingering. At the exit, she patiently queued up and moved out. Suddenly, Jenna sensed a slight tremor from one of the items on her. Instinctively, she reached in and realized that it was the mirror world fragment from the Tamara family's tomb. Chapter 600 – Correct Reaction has something happened to the mirror world fragment? Jenna was taken aback for a moment before she tensed up. This was unprecedented. The mirror world fragment had never exhibited such behavior before, leaving Jenna puzzled as to its sudden activity. Her mind raced, attempting to decipher its significance. Could there be a disturbance in the special mirror world itself? Or perhaps someone in close proximity to me is closely involved with the special mirror world? Could this be a lead in Franca's mirror people investigations? Jenna's instincts urged her to scan her surroundings, searching for the source of the mirror world fragment's disturbance. Jenna controlled herself just in time as a realization hit her. If this phenomenon was caused by someone closely tied to the special mirror world, there was a high chance that the sensation was mutual. In simpler terms, while the fragment trembled slightly, there should be some anomaly on the person's body detectable only by themselves. They, too, were searching for the source of the problem. Under such circumstances, hastily surveying her surroundings might lead to discovery by the other party. A thunderous strike might follow. Maintaining her composure, Jenna slowly moved out the door, her eyes fixed on the road ahead. 
During this process, like many spectators, she turned her head slightly and glanced at the wall clock in the theater's foyer to confirm the time, 11.05 p.m. After noting the time, Jenna returned to the foyer through the exit. The spectators around her dispersed, and the place gradually became less crowded. Jenna's mirror world fragment fell silent, no longer trembling abnormally. Just now, there was no one in the foyer, and the mirror world fragment didn't tremble when I watched the theater performance. This means that for the abnormality to happen, both parties need to be close to each other, no more than five meters apart, like when we were squeezing for the exit in the foyer. Now, is everything back to normal because the distance between them has widened again? Jenna's thoughts raced as she fully displayed her theatrical acting skills. Like ordinary spectators, she left the foyer and arrived on the street. She boarded a rental carriage belonging to the Imperial Carriage Company and paid 2.5 Verldor in advance, her heart aching. If the subway and public carriages were still running at this hour, she wouldn't have taken a rental carriage back to Cartier de la Cathedral commemorative from Cartier de la Maison d'Opera. Cartier de la Cathedral commemorative, apartment 702, 9 Rue Orosai. Jenna recounted her encounter to Franca and asked, Did the mirror world fragment on you tremble slightly around 11.05? No, Franca replied with unusual certainty. Without waiting for Jenna to make a judgment, she smiled awkwardly and quickly added, I don't think so. As you know, my mirror world fragment is stored in my traveler's bag. Even if there's a tremor, I can't sense it. As Jenna couldn't help but roll her eyes, Franca tersely acknowledged and said, do you suspect that the abnormality in the special mirror world caused a general change? If that's the case, even if the item is in the traveler's bag, I should be able to sense it spiritually. It's impossible to completely ignore it. Besides, when we put these two fragments together, there's never been a tremor. The probability of me encountering a mirror people is very high. Or is it a member of a specific branch of the Tamara family? Jenna said as she walked to the full-body mirror in the living room. She stroked the surface and whispered the secret subject she wanted to inquire about. The full-body mirror's surface quickly darkened, surging with illusory water waves. Jenna began magic mirror divination. At approximately 23.05 last night, the area within a 10-meter radius of me. At approximately 23.05 last night, the area within a 10-meter radius of me. Dot. After repeating it three times, the deep, dark mirror lit up. In the light, Jenna saw herself in a bonnet, the theater exit connected to the theater foyer, and the audience and attendants standing within ten meters of her. The spirit world faithfully recorded all this information. The reflection in the mirror held a dynamic quality, not static or rigid. Jenna swiftly observed a woman standing a few meters ahead abruptly turning to survey the people around her. Donned in a black-veiled hat, the lady, seemingly in her thirties, sported light eyebrows, bright yellowish eyes, and a white complexion from makeup. While not conventionally beautiful, she exuded elegance through her well-chosen attire. Despite her refined appearance, the lady appeared to lose her composure, scanning the surroundings as if searching for a lost lover. There's something off about her. She reacted to the mirror world fragment, Franca remarked as she joined Jenna, analyzing the image in the full-body mirror. But it's been over an hour, and she hasn't initiated any counter-divination. Is she careless or utterly unfamiliar with the process? Jenna nodded. Can you discern anything else? Nothing more. Franca suddenly slapped her forehead. Gosh, we should have asked Anthony to take a look. A spectator would surely glean more information. You're right. Jenna was caught off guard. They still weren't used to seeking Anthony's assistance. Jenna suggested, let's get Anthony tomorrow morning. Calling him over this late might lead to misunderstandings. Besides, it's not an urgent matter. Yes, he might get the wrong idea, Franca quickly realized. The next morning, after observing the scene through the magic mirror divination, Anthony pondered and commented, her clothes were custom-made, suggesting a well-off family background. Despite looking a bit lost after surveying the surroundings, she may lack knowledge about the mirror world and its corresponding fragments. 
this contradicts her ability to make the mirror world fragment tremble. The answer often lies in the point of contradiction. Her walking style indicates good etiquette training, but her status at home isn't particularly high. Franca couldn't help but twitch her lips as she listened to the newly advanced hypnotist dissect the target layer by layer. It felt like she had no secrets left from him. Spectators are truly terrifying. On the other hand, Jenna listened attentively, finding similarities with character analysis and drama acting class but more concrete and detailed. In a daze, she felt transported back to Theodore Delancey and Kaja Pigeons, listening to her teacher's lecture. These characteristics won't help us locate her directly. They can only offer certain clues, Anthony concluded. Understood. Character profiling, Franca replied in a professional tone. Anthony took out a piece of paper, picked up a pencil, and began sketching based on his impressions, intending to track her through various channels. Casually, Franca asked, how did you deduce that the ladies' clothes were custom-made? Having once been a man and transformed into a woman with a potion, she remained fixated on the beauty of clothing and dresses. She didn't care about the store or tailor. Jenna couldn't tell either, as before becoming a witch, she hadn't reached the level to customize her clothes. Anthony looked up at the two demonesses. After becoming a spectator, especially as an information broker, I've deliberately honed my observation skills. I recognize the materials and characteristics of most of Trier's ready-to-wear shops and the styles of many famous tailors. The lady's dress clearly doesn't come from any ready-to-wear shops. Franca and Jenna revealed somewhat embarrassed expressions. Fortunately, Anthony was engrossed in his sketch and hadn't noticed their reactions. Port Santa Nolfi, clad in a blouse and a light-colored jacket, escorted Batna to the dock. Batna, sporting a half-top hat, adjusted his rapier and cautiously inquired, Are you really planning to stay here? Nolfi calmly responded, I'm already a combat nun of the fertility order. It's just now dawning on me that the sea prayer ritual isn't about gaining power and making a pact with an evil god. It's about protection. It's an act of self-sacrifice. In the past, members of the fisheries guild used their influence and wealth to entice others into becoming the governor of the sea and maidens of the sea. Now, they've pledged to the Earth Mother's Church and the Fertility Order. Going forward, they'll inform potential candidates of the possible challenges and consequences beforehand, allowing them to make their own choices. I want to stay here and oversee this. That's good too. Batna sighed. Unfortunately, my destiny lies in sea adventures, and I can't remain in one place. The lovely and endearing Nolfi nodded. I understand. She asked sincerely, do you wish to have a child here? No, nah, never mind, Batna stammered. I'm not mentally prepared to be someone else's father. He didn't want his child to turn into a humanoid lizard in the future. Nolfi expressed regretfully, all right. Waving her hand, she turned around and walked away from the dock. After a few steps, she abruptly turned back, revealing a bright and beautiful smile. Regardless, I'm grateful that you could accompany me out to sea. Without waiting for Batna's response, Nolfi redirected her gaze and hastened her pace, leaving the dock. Batna stood there, Nolfi's final smile lingering in his mind. Her words of joy echoed in his ears, and he suddenly felt a sense of loss. After Nolfi's figure vanished from the dock, the adventurer slowly boarded the ship returning to Port Ferrum. In the evening, inside the ship's bar, Lumian raised a glass of amber sugar wine and addressed the patrons at the bar counter, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm actually a magician. I can showcase an illusionary magic trick for you right now. He gestured towards the window. Look outside. Instinctively, the patrons glanced out the window and noticed that the surrounding waves had surged to a height of more than 10 meters at some point, resembling a mountain. Just as they blinked, the terror-inspiring scene disappeared once again. Clap! 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 The patrons applauded Lumian's brilliant magic trick.